This morning we drove in yesterday from Santa Rosa where babysitting our grandkid. <laughs> so. Well, since I'm jealous that you have a grandkid and I don't, maybe I won't let you do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a wonderful excuse, Rabbi. And if you would, I will ask everyone to uh, please rise and join um, Rabbi with another invocation. This is a real one. Before the invocation, I want to share a public thank you. Because last week, and I think it's an important lesson for the community too, I got a very polite, formal letter appointing me to this commission. And, of course, the chair of the board signed the letter as part of her duties as chair of the board. But then you did something you didn't have to do. And here's where the thank you comes in. You took your pen, you changed the salutation, and you personalized the letter. And you brought a big smile to my face. Now, I thank you. It's also a lesson for everyone here. Because anyone who has been to X number of meetings knows that very often... You and I don't agree on some public <laughs> issues. This is true, sir. And we have disagreed very strongly on issues. But look at us. You change your salutation. We look at each other, we smile. Everyone should know, and it's important, that when one is part of this community that we work for, whether professionally or as volunteers, is because we love this community. And we are friends who sometimes disagree, however strongly. We are friends who love this county. And so everyone who is here, whether you are debating or whether you are debating, no matter what the issue, we are friends who love this county. And that's important. Exactly. So again, thank you for the personalization and thank you for the opportunity to do a bit of teaching on how things should be done in a community. Eternal source of all existence. As every one of us approaches you, we see you differently. We are, as the old story says, a group of blind people who go to describe an elephant. As one touches a tail and says, it's like a rope. And one touches a leg and says, it's like a tree. And one touches a side and says, it's like a building. And so on and so forth. What teaches us an important element of the human condition. It's called humility. The finite cannot comprehend the infinite. And no one of us can fully comprehend all there is in this world. So eternal source, let us come together and celebrate our differences. And say thank you for our individuality, out of which we can, if we are spiritual and loving and honorable, we can create a truly beautiful community. Thank you for that gift. Let us be worthy of it. And let us together say, Amen. Thank you very much. And as I say frequently, disagreement does not mean dislike, nor does it mean disrespect. It's merely a disagreement. So thank you very much for coming down. We always are happy to have you here. And now, do we have any cards on the consent? Okay. Then uh, we can take the consent items, um, if I might, so we don't have to do any amendment on the calendar. Um, my, my question pertains to both. And it's a discomfort that I have frequently when we're not doing RFP processes on some of these contracts, or it's been a long time. Uh, in the board letter um, on the, I believe it was item 16, it says that at one time there was an RFP process, uh, and that's how this one company was selected, and they have performed very well. Um, and that's all well and good, but I think that it's a very dangerous um, slope that we slide down when we don't um, take the time every few years to reevaluate vendors and to redistribute bids uh, because we don't know what's out there now. It may not have been there a few years ago, and um, I've 
said this off and on since I've been on the board, that I just think it's good um, management and good due diligence to go back out. And I, someday maybe the board wants to come up with some sort of a policy, which I hate to do. I hate to be totally inflexible. Um, but I, I do encourage uh, more frequent uh, use of the bidding process for county um, contracts, especially large contracts. So that's my only comment. I'm not opposed to um, either of these items, but um, as I go through the consent calendar often, I find um, renewals and increasing contracts and that type of thing without more information or, or looking to see if there's another vendor out there. So um, I guess that's my comment to the people who bring these forward, that um, I, do, I do watch them, and I may end up at times pulling them and requesting that they go out to, our, um, to bid. So with that, uh, is there, are there any other comments on the consent? Yes, ma'am? And you had also uh, wanted to comment on item 18, which I did also. Okay, go right ahead. Actually, my comments were for, for both of those, oh, okay. um, but go right ahead. Um, I guess I had some questions on it regarding the, the, the disparity between the original budgeted amount, which was about 226000 and what we ended up with, which was about 712000 So it's a, it's a large gap there. And while I, I understand um, for office furniture and labor and design, the, we're trying, the GSA would like to be able to get a, is looking at getting a better handle on better estimating the costs at the beginning so you don't have such a large disparity from what's budgeted and what it ends up being. But my, my question is, what is the, is there a major um, reason why there is such a large uh, increase? You know, did one department all of a sudden move and require a lot of furniture? Is there, is there one specific reason why it's three times um, higher than what was anticipated? Uh, Mr. Johnston, can you answer that? Ah, oh, there he is. Mr. Ruffin, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Johnston. On uh, Tri-County, we did a little bit of research on like what had been the dollar amounts requested in previous years. And we found that for the fiscal year that ended in 01 and 02, we came to the board and asked for um, funding amounts of $750,000. So the one for this past fiscal year where we only asked for 226000 was a, a huge reduction. We were thinking there might be some occasions where there would be less need for things to happen in the furniture realm, the design and install. But once departments realized they had targets and they had to live within, within their targets, they had some flexibility on what things they wanted to get done. So for this current fiscal year, we've asked for $530,000 for that annual service agreement. So the point I'm trying to make is like last year, we underestimated how much we should have asked for originally. Additionally, the comment about doing RFPs, we agree with that. And two years ago, we were using BKM as the contractor for furniture. This is the third year with Tri-County, and we hear loud and clear that we need to look at frequent uh, need to go out and see what the best price and best con contracts are. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Any other questions on the consent agenda? Is there a motion? I have a motion and a second. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. Okay, that brings us to public comments. Thank you. Lee Quaintance. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm Lee Quaintance. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Beacon Foundation, which is a nonprofit environmental organization focused on coastal Ventura County. Uh, late last, yesterday afternoon, I, uh, we sent you a letter, and I don't know whether uh, it was timely for you to receive it before this meeting, so I provided additional copies um, for distribution here. Um, our letter concerns what is for us an unhappy um, decision that we have made uh, to withdraw from the Kitty Beach Task Force. 
the problem of kitty beach has been something that has been a primary concern of the beacon foundation for more than five years in one thousand nine hundred eight when you began ocean water testing of beaches we came to you and asked you to do kitty beach and got very glad that you did although the results have been quite shocking the chronic pollution of this beach is of course well known to everyone the we also generated from the outside campaign of public awareness about this problem that resulted in some five hundred postcards directed to this board and to the Oxnard City Council we think that that was significant in getting you to fund along with the city of Oxnard the first study the Walker report which was finished in two thousand and one when that report was released we came to you again and asked that the process be opened up as you continue to work on this problem and that public members be added to the process and supervisor Flynn and thank you for that was the one who did make the motion which was adopted by your board to add two public members to the task force structure the Beacon Foundation and the Ventura Coast Keeper subsequent to that there have been twenty meetings of this body we have a number of reasons for dissatisfaction with what has gone on but the immediate precipitating cause for our resigning from this was the appearance on your consent agenda not your consent agenda on your information agenda as item on the sixteenth page the final report a lengthy report done at a cost of one hundred thirty five thousand dollars by an outside consultant on circulation issues we this frankly this was the last straw for us this report that was done on this a two page report by county staff was not even shown to the task force nor even to the consultant who had prepared the report and it looked like looking for very cold ground for a hot potato by sticking it on your information agenda without taking this opportunity for the board to review as the contract contemplated with the consultant this important stage of where we are or where we aren't in doing something about pollution of Kitty Beach in the letter that we sent you the only specific request we made was that you not accept the report in this form but that you defer the matter and have the hearing that was contemplated by the contract on the circulation study I'm very pleased that this morning you did elect to do that and although we will no longer be a member of the task force we will certainly actively consider continue our involvement in the process and our pressing of the process frankly we have concluded that we can do more from the outside than we can within the present present Kitty Beach task force structure I think John Wooten kind of summed up where we are right now when he said do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do so we will continue to work on this process but not as a member of the task force we have shared our concerns with the other public member the Ventura Coast Keeper I they will speak for themselves I think that their approach will be somewhat different from our own which is not to show any disagreement we have none but I think that the concern is so great shared by so many that perhaps a variety of approaches will yield some result from this task force which frankly at the moment is dead in the water thank you thank you for your comments somehow the cards got buried Damon wing good morning chair Michaels members of the board I'm Damon wing from Ventura Coast Keeper Ventura Coast Keeper has participated on the Kitty Beach task force for the last two years and while there has been movement to address the bacteria contamination problems at Kitty Beach and Hobie Beach we believe that there still remain numerous actions that should have been undertaken but still may be undertaken by the task force and the board both time and funding limitations necessitate that an immediate comprehensive approach be utilized to address the bacteria concerns there there needs to be a more serious look at source identification and remediation our recommendations include allocating the appropriate funds from the 1.5 million dollar grant 
uh, to county departments, the Watershed Protection District, and the Channel Islands Beach Community Services District uh, to complete the following. Uh, conduct a smoke test of local sewer lines, conduct dye testing beyond the, that of the force main, divert the storm drain away from Hobie Beach, deliver a report on the efficacy of dye tablets on liveaboard boats, require that dye tablets be placed in all boats with heads, cease jet spraying bird feces into the harbor when cleaning the docks, and increase education and enforcement of illegal dumping. Uh, Coastkeeper is encouraged that uh, there's a decision to pursue DNA testing um, for source identification of bacteria. Uh, we do recognize, however, that uh, DNA testing is nascent science. We may or may not yield data that can be useful. Um, therefore, we believe that it's important to work at, at a comprehensive approach and look at all ways to identify sources. Those that we've uh, mentioned here are less expensive than DNA testing, are less expensive than a circulation test. Um, and the time and the funds are going to be running short. We have uh, about a year before we need a contract uh, to basically remediate and alleviate the, uh, the bacteria problems. Um, it's been a lengthy process. It's been lengthy to get the circulation study, um, which is not entirely conclusive. We believe the DNA testing will also take a significant amount of time. Rather than incrementally trying one study and then going on to the next study, there are several types of tests that can be uh, performed and conducted to determine source of bacteria. Um, we we share the same frustrations and concerns that the Beacon Foundation does. It's, this has been a, very, a difficult process to, to get through this, and uh, we're glad that it will be taken up at a public hearing in September. Thank you. Yes, sir. May I just ask a question? Certainly. Uh, are you suggesting that a DNA study be done? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, Peter Colwell. Uh, my name is Peter Colwell, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, I'm, this is concerning an illegal lot that I used to own in Fillmore. Um, many years ago, a Fillmore family owned farm acreage on the outskirts of Fillmore, and in approximately 1926, the family split a portion of the ranch into five lots. And under the ownership of a partnership called the Five Brothers, each one of the Burson brothers built their personal residences on these lots. Uh, the, the, this lot in question, the residence was built in 1927. Since then, these lots have been through many sales and many escrows, and no question was ever brought up about the illegality of the lot. I happened to purchase this lot a few years ago, and then I sold the lot again in, in last year, in, in the year 2002. In 2002, the new owners of, of this property wanted to buy, I uh, wanted to build a, a, a building on the lot, and the county then said to me that this lot is illegal, and you cannot do anything on it unless you legalize the lot. My, es my, my property was in escrow. I agreed to pay all charges uh, for, for the legalization of the lot, and, um, and the escrow closed. This was back in, 19, in, in March, in last year. In March 2002, I engaged the services of the engineering company Benner and Carpenter for $3,300 to survey and, and, and reintroduce a map for the lot. Since March to this date, July, uh, July 29th, I have paid the county in excess of $10,000 on various fees for services, and the, and the lot has not yet been legalized. I, on, on July the 19th, I addressed a letter to the chair of the board and to all the board of supervisors, and I mailed it in to you. Since then, I have received no acknowledgment and no response. I wonder if you've even read the letter. And, and, and I request you, there are many, many people in this county, taxpayers, property owners, 
who were faced with similar circumstances where old families, not aware of the fact that their lots were illegal, continue to live on it and sell it. And you have now, uh, your county has now uh, determined that these are illegal and we are going through lengthy, lengthy process, processes and expensive processes to close, the, to, to make the legality of the lot effective. And it is still not yet done in my case, which was uh, where the map was filed in March of last year. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Supervisor yeah, Long. Um, Mr. Colwell, sir? Um, hi. Um, I, I certainly did receive your letter, and I have my staff working on the um, points that you raised in your letter. And if you'd like to go up to the fourth floor and see Martin Hernandez, he has um, been working on that, and I'm sure we can work through, see what we can do to help you. Yes, I met Martin this morning, and he says nothing's done yet. Well, he's working on it, though. Yes. It's, not, it's not done yet because it's, it well, is, as you noted, very complex. But, uh, again, if you would... Um, Madam, excuse me. I talked to Martin over a year ago. Nothing was done then. Nothing has been done now. I'm still stuck in a legal lot that's over one year now and $10,000 in expenses. And some, someone, the administrative right. officer, maybe should, should do something to, to close the issue. I'm not asking for a refund of my, my money. I'm just asking for you to close the issue and legalize the lot. It's, everything has been done. To, to, to add insult to injury, in, in March of last year, the Benner and Carpenter issued a map and for $3,300 re-identified the monuments of the four corners of this lot. I recently received a letter from the county saying they want another $180 because they want to see these monuments. Well, a year and a half later with farm operations, the monuments have all been covered. My wife and I went and we've located one. So we're well, going to have to wrap up your comments. All right. We call the county and they want to personally see it. We, we will, uh, Supervisor um, Long and her office will make sure that this item gets attention and the CEO will help as well as probably Mr. Berg. <laughs> but, okay, thank you for your comments. I have one card, one other card, Christy Madden. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Johnston, Christy Madden, County Executive Office. Um, I'd just like to, to take a moment to provide some additional information to your board about the activities ongoing um, at Kitty Beach. Um, the report that you see on your informational agenda was put there um, with the intent of getting the document out to the public and to the policymakers before you uh, went on your long six-week break. Um, we will be happy to come back to your board in September at your next meeting and make a full presentation about the findings and conclusions. We did not receive that final of that report until Tuesday prior to board filing, so we really didn't have time. We had emailed out the final corrections to all members of the task force, and so they did have that information, and um, I do apologize. They did not see that board letter. That was a very last minute. Let's get it to your board and give you a brief description of the findings of the report. Um, we are with the advice and recommendations of the task force pursuing um, a source identification contract, which is DNA sampling. The cost of that, of that study and analysis will be about $100,000. It will require modification to the current Kitty Beach contract to move money around to pay for that work. Um, in the context of consulting with the state board about that modification, um, I did get some new information that I have not yet had an opportunity to share with the task force, and that is that I had expected that the full $1.5 million that we have under this grant would have to be spent by 2004. As you may recall, this grant was awarded in two pieces. We have um, a $705,000 contract amount and a $795,000 contract amount. It's, it's divided into two pieces. The intent was the second half of the grant was to pay for the installation of circulation improvements in the harbor, and we couldn't get environmental clearance on that until we had done a CEQA review, which would require our doing the design and engineering first. What I was told by the State Board is that the second part, the $795,000, only has to be under contract 
by 2004, and at that point we will have an additional two years to spend those funds. So we do have a little bit more time. It does relieve some of the pressure of having to get all of this work done. Um, at present, it is expected that the results of the source identification DNA testing um, will be available in December or January, provided that we can get purchasing and get things executed and moving online. It'll be about a six-month process. Um, a couple of, of comments were raised earlier about things that need to be done um, about dye tablets in the harbor. We do have a dye tablet ordinance. We have dye tablets in all liveaboards in the harbor, and that program has been ongoing, and from what I hear at Harbor, has been very successful. There was, um, I am told, smoke testing done in the sewers at the harbor. That's something that's already been accomplished. Um, there are lots of activities ongoing at Kitty, at Kitty Beach. We have uh, posted many signs. We have information available on the Environmental Health website to report illnesses, and to the best of my knowledge, we've never had anybody report an illness after contacting the water at Kitty Beach. So we are moving forward. This, um, I would not disagree, has been a very complex process. Um, the fact that the Beacon Foundation has apparently resigned from the task force will certainly in no way impede their ability to participate because, as you know, we are a Brown Act committee, so it is open to the public, and we do get quite a bit of public participation at our meetings. So that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions you might have on this project. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, that's all the blue cards I have, but um, I've been informed by um, Lynn Krieger that there is a representative here from Westbrook, uh, and if you are in the room, could you come forward and comment on any delay that would be incurred by moving these leases to September? Madam Chair and Supervisors, my name is Steve Walton. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for a company called Channel Islands Properties, which is the parent of all of the entities that own various assets down in the harbor. Uh, Channel Islands Properties is a wholly owned subsidiary of Westbrook Partners, uh, which is based back east. Um, this has been a very long and, and complicated process. Um, I think when the county decided to try and approach this in a very comprehensive way, um, it, it took on an incredibly complicated task, um, one that I think was the better of the choices. To try and piecemeal this would have been an absolute nightmare. Um, it's taken two years now to try and document that which you approved about two and a half years ago in terms of a, a business outline. Um, that business outline was arrived at over the course of five or six years, frankly, of discussing what needed to happen in the harbor to meet both your goals as well as ours in the redevelopment of various assets. So th this is something that's been going on literally for seven years, the, the seven years that we've owned the assets. Um, while I would not say that we got everything we wanted, I don't think the county would say that either. Um, this is definitely a compromise. Um, there's no question that there are a lot of things in there that we would still love to change, but I think the structure that has been put together now between our house, so to speak, and yours, um, is going to give the county the ability to approach the redevelopment of these assets um, now in a very comprehensive fashion. And stressing the timing today um, is really twofold. One, we've been sitting on a couple of million dollars in cash waiting to spend the money on the apartments. Um, I literally have contractors waiting to begin next week um, to further the renovation of the apartments. Uh, number two, I do have one offer sitting on the table now on the hotel. I've got a meeting with another one next week. Um, and the big holdup, frankly, is this issue. Um, those folks are very, very apprehensive about signing a contract, getting committed to this project, not knowing what the ground lease is going to look like. Um, the comprehensive fashion in which we approach this, this is all encompassing. I mean, we now have finality on the apartments, on Fisherman's Wharf, on the marinas, on the hotel, so that we can go out into the marketplace, hire the contractors, find a potential buyer for the hotel, 
turn over Fisherman's Wharf to you so that you can further your redevelopment efforts on that corner that, that everyone, I think, agrees is a pivotal portion of that harbor. Um, it's the window into the harbor, and this is going to allow you to get off on the right foot. So I would stress that while I can appreciate Ms. Park's frustration with having been handed what I know is an enormous stack of paper, I, I apologize, we would really like to have this done and not postponed until September. Until September. So I apologize, Ms. Parks. Um, there's so much that is, is riding on getting this done today, um, and so much has led up to this that I would respectfully suggest that it happens today and not be postponed. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, I, I appreciate that you're saying you would like to get this done today. What my question is: Are there are the are the things that have to happen? Is there a reason why this has to happen today? Versus your preference would be you would like to have it happen today. That's that's the fundamental question. That the distinction I'm trying to make here. Yes. Um, the, the way the deal is structured, it can't be done piecemeal. Um, the pieces fit together and there are contingencies so that when one happens, it triggers the rest. So unfortunately, we can't take a lease or two leases out of the deal and do it today because the rest of the deal falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain triggers that the county wanted us or milestones the county wanted us to meet in order to essentially earn the rest of the deal. Um, and without those in place, there isn't a deal. The whole thing falls apart. In terms of, of why today and not next month, um, the party who has expressed thus far the greatest interest in the hotel and thus far has been willing to pay the highest price and therefore the county's fee gets the highest number, um, has said that they're very concerned about committing the capital immediately. Um, they need to go and spend a great deal of money in their due diligence process just to get to the point where we can put them before you and evaluate their project, um, it, whether it be civil engineers and architects and, and financial planning. They need to spend a great deal of money before they even get in front of Lynn Krieger. Um, we don't want those folks to walk in the door having not been prepared. Um, they're prepared to spend that money today. Um, hotel assets in the marketplace today um, are fairly numerous. Um, and I can say that this one, this one is not the kind of a, of a deal where people are looking at it to buy as an ongoing concern. It's operating extraordinarily well. The physical plant's in great shape. Um, pick up any newspaper and you can see what 9-11 has done to the hotel industry nationwide. It's, it's relatively easy to find a decent hotel to purchase. So finding potential buyers for this hotel, given the amount of capital that they have to commit to redevelop this hotel, has been a monumental task. Um, if I've got somebody on the hook or a couple of people on the hook, I don't want to lose them. Um, this is something that they're looking at as a long-term investment. They've committed the kind of time and capital necessary to, to evaluate this and, and take it forward. I don't want to lose them. I mean, we have literally been through well in excess of 400 hotel operators um, and have canvassed the country looking for potential investors of this. And frankly, the opportunities elsewhere in the country and frankly all over the globe are much more appealing to them. Um, so when we've got this party on the hook, waiting to move forward, wanting to spend the capital and the time, I'm just afraid, frankly, they're going to run away. Yes, sir? May I ask a question? Certainly. Um, I know the negotiations have gone on for a long time. My concern is, uh, number one, that county council, county council is the board's attorney, and county council, I hope, is going to comment on this issue, whether or not county council has reviewed these leases. But just on one part of it, let me just ask this question. Sure. Um, you're talking with a uh, firm now about the hotel. Is that right? Yes. And, Two firms, actually. And I, I know this is getting down into the pieces, but let me right. just ask the question. What... Uh, what rank of hotel 
will be put there. A one star, two star, three star, four star, five star. It really it, it depends on what franchise, if at all, they attempt to place on the hotel. Um, I, I don't know what the board knows or how much the board knows about the hotel industry, but the vast majority of the hotels that you see up and down any freeway in any community are not actually owned by the name that sits on the hotel. Most of the Hilton hotels, the, the residence inns, the Marriott's and so forth, are not actually owned by that company. It's almost like a McDonald's franchise. That there is an underlying ownership or investor group that owns it, and they flag what's called flagging in the industry. They franchise the hotel. So it's up to the investor owner to decide which of those flags he would like to pursue. Each of those flags has a, a, a huge volume of data um, that they hand you that you are supposed to uh, commit to in order to, to gain their flag. Um, and depending on which one you pick, um, we generally refer to it as a per room basis. Um, the cost per room to achieve a Hilton flag or to achieve a Marriott flag or a Hampton Inn flag vary wildly. Um, could be as little as $20,000 per room, could be as much as $150,000 a room, sort of depends. Um, that's frankly going to be part of the investor's process. Um, he's going to look at the asset, what he's obligated to spend, and what he thinks he can realistically achieve. Because frankly, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense for the gentleman to spend one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 a room on the hotel if when he's done, given the way this marketplace behaves, he'll have a hotel that's worth you know, less than half that. Um, so it's really going to be a function of what kind of room rates does he think he can achieve, how much money will he be willing to spend to get to that point. And this investor group hasn't made that decision yet. So d do I think that it will be, um, <coughs> well, let me put it this way. I think it'll be competitive with the Mandalay. Do I think that the physical plant will exceed that of the Mandalay Beach Hotel, the, the embassy suites that's there? Most likely not. It's going to be roughly comparable. Um, those are the two primary competing hotels in this marketplace once the, the Casa Serena gets renovated. So um, is it likely? that they're going to spend $150,000 per room to renovate it? No, but that's not what the expectation of the county was. Um, the county's expectations is about $9 million for the hotel, which translates to roughly $30,000 to $35,000 per room, plus a great deal more money spent in the banquet space and restaurant space and so forth. So I, I'm confident that whoever buys this hotel is going to be able to achieve a, a very high-level franchise. At, at one point, we actually had a commitment from Hilton Hotels um, to renovate at least half of the hotel and convert it into a Hampton Inn and flag it as such, um, which I think would have been a fantastic fit in that marketplace. Um, Hilton has since changed their focus, and we ended up dropping the franchise because we then decided to approach this in a much more comprehensive fashion with all the assets. But I, I think the marketplace has seen this asset. They understand that its location is extremely desirable. Um, you know, I, I can't commit to a specific star level at this point, only because I, I'm not quite sure what the investor is going to, to come forward with. And that's part of his process. He needs to go out and canvas those potential flags. He needs to sit down with his architects and come to you with a comprehensive plan saying, here's what, I need to, here's what I'd like to do. And you're going to have the ability to, to approve or disapprove of that when he presents it to you. Um, my signing him up, so to speak, is not a done deal. I still have to become, I still have to come before you with him and say, here's his plan, here are the pictures, here's what he'd like to do, here's how much money he's going to spend. Does this work for you? And if it does, terrific. If it doesn't, he's got to go back to the drawing board. If he walks away, I then need to go find somebody else or you know, that's the way we anticipate the process to work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others? Yes, Supervisor Parks. Um, this is a very long-term lease, 50 years. True. And um, I, to get the 50 years, they need to invest $2 million in the uh, hotel. Is that correct? Or the hotel the, and the lobster trap? No. Well, the, the $2 million is to be spent in the apartments. The apartments. Um, that, well, and I wouldn't necessarily say that the $2 million is the sole payment to get to the 
to get to the 50 years. There are a bunch of things that need to happen. Um, we compensate the county, frankly, by handing you the keys to Fisherman's Wharf and of $150,000. I, I understand it's all very complex and everything's connected together. Okay. And I, the question I was looking, well. Then it's $9 million, frankly. Okay. That well, I guess this, this discussion is just whether we're going to um, continue this for a month or, or move on it today. So I won't get into the details about it okay. until we decide whether we're going to hear it. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> okay, but um, I think we need to resolve the issue before we move on, and we do have a 9.30 time certain. Mr. C., do you have a comment? In response to Supervisor Flynn's inquiry, uh, our office has looked at each of these leases. I would point out that each of these leases is a, a product of the new lease that has been designed for the harbor by outside council and into which uh, the harbor director has placed significant resources. I reviewed the board letter for conformity with what my understanding of the business plan that the board approved, that is separation of the waterside improvements from the apartments and so forth. And in my judgment, the uh, proposed contracts reflect the direction that the board gave. Uh, Mr. Walter Wall in my office uh, has reviewed each of the contracts if there are any specific questions of him concerning those documents. What, Madam Chair, yes, what sir? sparked my, my question is that we have, uh, we've had difficulty with uh, leases, plenty of difficulty with leases. And I just hope that in developing these leases, that there was some kind of a checklist people would go through to make sure that we're not going to get ourselves in another bind as we were put into the bind 40 years ago on some of these properties. And uh, I hope we've learned something. That's my concern. I hope we don't go down the road and say, God, didn't you guys review this after all the trouble you've had with leases in the Channel Islands Harbor? That's my concern. Speaking rather bluntly, clearly there was considerable discussion concerning end of lease provisions, disposition <laughs> of improvements, and so forth. Um, however, that being said, a lease of this length of time is very difficult to predict uh, the course of events. For example, even with the lease that was in place for the current marinas, it was not contemplated by the parties at the time that there would be all of this coastal regulation and a number of other regulatory uh, acts okay. superimposed on the lease. So long leases are just difficult to predict. But I think that all due care has been taken to anticipate end of lease problems at least. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess since I'm supposed to be the, the lion tamer here, um, I would offer to the board that perhaps we should take the item um, with Supervisor Park's concerns clearly stated. Uh, when we get the staff report, when we hear everything, um, that doesn't mean that we have to take an action on it. Um, but I would suggest since everyone is here and it's been on the agenda and there, there appears to be some sort of a time situation, um, and still respecting Supervisor Parks' um, desire to read all of those. Um, I think we'd be wise to at least hear the staff report and at that time then make a decision on whether we're comfortable moving forward um, or and we feel we should or whether um, some of these questions that have been asked haven't been answered. So that would be my suggestion, and um, I would look to the rest of the board for comment. <laughs> Madam Chair, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think that we already have the, uh, as outlined in the um, board letter, the history of this, and it, it has been very long and <coughs> lengthy, and the board has been engaged um, throughout all of this, uh, I think that the county council has already uh, noted, and I expect that our 
director will speak to the lessons learned um, uh, pieces that are now in in the leases that I would hope protect the taxpayers. But as we also look at the investment that is being proposed in this harbor and the frustration we've had for the last few years that there hasn't been that investment or commitment, that time is money, and I think we should at least hear and have the discussion. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Supervisor Parks, would you like to? It's not only uh, my desire to be able to review the leases. And I, they did not come with the packet. I had to request them separately. So I, I have not had the, the, not even the four days <laughs> to look at them. But it's not just me. I think the public should have the opportunity to look at them if they desire. And I have had requests um, to copy them. So it's, to me, it's just it's something that uh, I think both the public as well as myself would like to have the opportunity. And what I've read in, this, in the staff report, I think it, 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 it's some really good concepts, and I, I really like the, what I see in here. But I do want to look through the leases, and I can't make a decision unless I do. Okay. Okay. Um, it looks like the most of the board wants to at least hear the staff report and have the discussion. So. Um, it was moved, uh, accidentally put on the consent calendar, and it was moved off, so we will move it into the regular agenda. Um, Madam Chair. Let me think about this a minute while he talks. <laughs> yes, if sir. I could, just, just so, so staff can be prepared, I, I think we have two, two issues that are uh, – uh, Two issues that are sort of in competition when we ha when we hear this thing uh, when we hear item 21, and that is a uh, request uh, for more time to review a complex series of leases, um, and that's an important request. And then uh, a suggestion that um, there that there will be a cost. There's a problem with taking that time. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to make sure that that's what that we hear some clear comments about that because I, I take seriously as as we all do, sort of request for adequate time for a proper process and so um, I need to, I need to hear those compelling reasons why um, why that that uh, shouldn't happen so if that'll help staff in terms of being prepared for uh, those uh, that issue when when it comes back to us thank you okay. Uh, Mr. County Council? That's okay. Um, can can I put this item anywhere I wish to since we removed it from the <laughs> – I don't want any smart remarks or giggles out there. I haven't said where I want to put it. No, I'm not going to be set up for that one. <laughs> yes, you may. Uh, okay. Uh, then it would be um, – My recommendation that we take it, given that there's going to be some discussion and there is some discomfort, uh, that we take it as the first regular agenda item that we come to uh, after the time certains are in between. And if the board will allow, I'll judge how much time we have. I don't want to start it if we only have five minutes till the next time certain. But we'll, since everyone's here, um, I'll try to get it done this morning as soon as possible. Okay, that was a rather lengthy operation. Board comments. Uh, you know what, it's 9.30. Let's go ahead and I see that some of the people are here. Let's go ahead and take... Okay. I have to get to it first. I'm getting my weightlifting exercises this morning. Okay. And this is on item 51. Okay, we're going to um, take item 52 first before uh, we do item 51 because we have lots of representatives here. And this is a fun thing as soon as I find it. And we have Mr. John Stone with us, who is the area director for the Special Olympics Ventura County, and he is here, we hope, with lots of supporters to receive uh, the resolution. And this is honoring the law enforcement volunteers uh, who give so much to the Ventura County Special Olympics. And I'd like to take a moment to um, 
to read the resolution because I believe there's information in here that's not generally known by the public. Uh, and then I will bring it down and um, allow Mr. Stone to um, speak or have someone speak and introduce those who are here in support. Uh, whereas the Special Olympics define sports in the truest sense, where the goal is not just to win but to try, to experience, and to co compete on a level playing field for the athlete's personal best. And whereas Special Olympic activities are unique in that they accommodate competitors at all skill levels and skill and ability levels, assigning the athletes to quote unquote competition divisions, which are based on both age and actual performance. Therefore, no time is too slow, no distance is too small. Everyone gets to participate and everyone earns an award. And whereas the Ventura County Special Olympics has enjoyed the support of many people who volunteer as trainers, coaches, chaperones, fundraisers, and donors so that the benefits of competition are available to even more of the county's developmentally disabled athletes. And whereas law enforcement agencies throughout Ventura County, including Ventura County Probation Department, District Attorney's Office, Sheriff's Department, California Highway Patrol, officers from the local police departments, including Simi Valley, the City of Ventura, Santa Paula, Port Wanimi, and rangers from the State Parks Department, team up with more than a dozen local restaurants for the Tipicop fundraiser, which is always great fun, when they raise enough money so that 700 developmentally disabled athletes are able to take part at no charge in the Special Olympics athletic training programs and competition. And whereas law enforcement representatives from more than 11 Ventura County agencies join more than 200 law enforcement representatives across the state who proudly carry the torch in relays from San Luis Obispo through 79 miles of Ventura County to the county seat in Ventura for the Special Olympics Summer Games. And whereas law enforcement has literally carried the torch for Special Olympics throughout the nation and for the last 15 years in Ventura County, not only as participants in the torch relay, but also in raising funds necessary to allow every special athlete to participate. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors wishes to honor all of the volunteers for the Ventura County Special Olympics, and most importantly, all of the volunteers from the county's law enforcement agencies who make it a priority to take care of the very special athletes who participate in the Special Olympics training and competition, passed and adopted this day by the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Stone, would you like to take the mic, and I'll bring this down. Thank you, Supervisor Michaels. Um, as uh, Supervisor Michaels stated, we're here today to, to thank and honor those local law enforcement agencies that have supported us over the past, oh, many, many years, um, not only in, 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 in supporting our athletes, but in fundraising and every other type of activity we possibly, you possibly can think of. And we have a few plaques we'd like to present, but um, I've asked Special Olympic athlete uh, Vincent Peterson to help me with the presentation. Vince, would you come up? Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Hi, I'm, I'm Special Olympic Global Messenger for Ventura County Special Olympics, and I give speeches to organizations like this. And John um, asked me to speak to you today, so here I go. <laughs> Hello, I'm Vincent Peterson, Special Olympic athlete and Global Messenger for Ventura. For Ventura, thank you for inviting me here to share with you what Special Olympics and what Special Olympics means to me. Special Olympics is the largest year-round sports training and competition organization in the world. It is bigger than the NFL, NHL, and NBA all together. There are more than 200 countries in the world which offer Special Olympic sports programs to the mentally disabled athletes. Athletes. Special Olympic um, International offers 30 sports programs. Ventura offers 17 sports programs. Special Olympics is now in its 35th year of sports programs. Ventura has had a Special Olympics 
sports program for all 35 of those years. Special Olympics is a very important part of my life. It has given me confidence in myself and in what I can do. I have been a Special Olympic athlete since I was 8 years old. I participate in aquatics, equestrian, athletics, Nordic skiing, and softball. I am the first Ventura Special Olympic athlete trained as a coach for softball. I have received, I was the second Special Olympic athlete to receive the Richard L. Van Kirk Outstanding Achievement Award. I have received the J.C. Penny Golden Rule Award for Community Service. I am the athlete representative for the Ventura County Special Olympics Management Team. I am also an alternate athlete representative on the Board of Directors, Special Olympics of Southern California. I do volunteer work for Ventura, Special Olympic Area Director. I do respite care for Special Olympic athletes so their mothers have some free time. I also do house sitting for friends, watering their plants and feeding their pets. I have traveled to many foreign countries and have visited many Special Olympic Directors directors and programs when they have been available. I am very proud to be a Special Olympic athlete. On behalf of all Special Olympic athletes of Ventura County, I want to say, say thank you to all the local info, law enforcement agencies for their support in the Tippecop fundraisers, the probation Department, the California Highway Patrol, the State Department, the Sheriff's Department, and the District Attorneys. It is your continued support that makes Special Olympics sports programs possible to help to make all the Special Olympic athletes winners. Thank you for your help to helping inspire greatness. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Um, Jeff, would you come up here too? Um, this is another Special Olympic athlete, Jeff Watlington. Can you help me here make some presentations? I sure would. Okay. I'd like to ask uh, representatives from the Sheriff's Department and the, the um, California Highway Patrol and the District Attorney's Office and the State Parks Department and the CHP to come on down, if you will. And, and Don't forget we, Michael Bradbury. Um, and Michael Bradbury. Um, <laughs> Come on down, we'll have Jeff here and, and Vince here. Uh, here, here. Hand you your plaque. Okay, I think you know. Did this, we hand this to Sharon. Thank you. Mr. Bob Brooks. Okay, this is Nancy. Yes, this is Nancy. Yes, this is Nancy. Yes, this is Nancy. She's the one that's on. Nancy, I'm in this room from your office. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Well, well, apparently the state park, anybody, no representative from the state parks made it today? We'll, we'll be sure and get it to him some other time. Can I say something? Sure. You know, it's something like, let me win. But I, if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. Because I, I have a brother who's working at the Sheriff's Department. And, you know, I give my heart to all the sheriffs of Ventura County. Bob Brooks, the under-sheriff, Craig Husband and my brother Bruce Watlington, and my mom and dad, this gave to my heart because I was a Down syndrome. And now, I'm, I, I want to say this, thank you for all my heart to give and to receive. Because um, I love everybody because Special Olympics comes from the heart. 
My first, I went to the hospital, and somebody, but now I'm better. I can run with my brother or with Bob Brooks or with the undersheriff. He's our champion runner. I mean, he runs everywhere. <laughs> yes, I do. In fact, the sheriffs and you and my brother, they're all together, and they're saying, let's Uh, Mom, this comes from the heart. No budget cuts, please. <laughs> you can stay here. I'm going to need to get a minute. <laughs> you stay here, guys. I'm going to need you one more time. But... <laughs> I didn't tell him to say <laughs> No, it's from my, uh, my workshop. From your workshop? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so Special Olympics really wants to thank you for all your support, not only with regard to our athletic, athletic competitions, but you've also helped all our athletes. You gain confidence and self-respect, and, and, and that's what it's really all about, and you, and you really made a difference in our lives, so thank you. Um, um, we have one last item here, um, and, and Vinny and Jeff will help me. Um, we sure. have a, a, a Special Olympic gold medal for each of the Board of Supervisor members to, to thank you for allowing us time to, to give our thanks to the law enforcement agency. You guys, uh, you forgot the um, special impact. Oh, well, I think you did that pretty well for me. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you guys, your hand is out. out for me to the to the um to the right. Yeah, over here. To the what? <laughs> oh <here>. yeah. <laughs> oh. If, if I could, um, it was really a pleasure to see Vince here today. Uh, Vince was a uh, graduate of Nordoff High School when I was there, a student of mine uh, at Nordoff, graduated in 1991. And I, he, he listed a number of accomplishments that he's had since 1991. What he did not point out is that Vince was, uh, I think, easily the most respected and inspired, inspiring student at Nordoff High School uh, when he was a student there. But for everybody that's touched Special Olympics, uh, I think even all of us knowing uh, all the things that all the talents that Vince had in 1991 would be really pleased to know that Special Olympics has allowed Vince to visit a lot of other countries to get to the to the point where he is so fired up about Special Olympics at this point in time so everybody that's touched the program there are uh, just so many Vince Peterson's out there and he's a great personification of that so Vince it's great to see you again thank you Thank you all, and a special thanks to um, Jackie Richardson from my office who uh, wrote the rezo and made all of the arrangements uh, with Mr. Stone. So thank you all. It's always fun to do those special types of things. And with that, we will go back to item 51, the downer report for the morning, given by our CEO, Johnny Johnston. <laughs> You know, the chief downer. The uh, chief downer. <laughs>
Well, I wrote down in my notes here what the rabbi said to us this morning. We are all friends who love our community. We have to keep that in mind uh, during these difficult budget times. Uh, on Sunday night, the uh, state senate, uh, with the support of the governor, came up with a proposed budget. Uh, my understanding is as of 6 o'clock this morning, the assembly had still not bought into the proposal. Um, it's hard to... Uh, project whether this is as good as it's going to get or is as bad as it's going to get, but the uh, proposal that was adopted by the Senate uh, in effect takes one quarter of the year's vehicle license fee and uh, sort of owes it to us at some point in the future. That's a $12 million uh, hit for the county. So this morning I just wanted to kind of get, hit some high points. Uh, I'm glad the rabbi came this morning and also the Special Olympics. Uh, I kind of got up this morning uh, after the Sunday's paper a little bit cranky, uh, <laughs> thinking, you know, the hardest thing to do to come to an intelligent decision is to understand what the facts are. Uh, my role in this is to try to ascertain the facts and lay them out on the table and then allow the community and your board to decide what to do with them. One of the facts is is that your reserves, available reserves in this county, uh, which are some of the smallest in the state, about $38 million. Of that $38 million, $15 million, maybe $16 million of it, is tobacco settlement money, monies that have been dedicated to uh, public health. So you take those out and you have $23 million. If the Senate's version of the budget passes, you have to subtract $12 million from that, and you're now down to an $11 million fund balance or a reserve. The uh, $11 million doesn't even cover the uh, requirements that the district attorney and the sheriff's office are asking for under 4088. Um, we cannot control what the state is doing to us. We are a creature of the state, uh, but there is a real in my view, a danger here locally of mixing uh, the politics with the finance, and so I'm going to go ahead and just review a few numbers for you and the public this morning, or at least some percentages, to try to bring a, a bit of what I consider to be clarity. Uh, in the Sunday's paper, the uh, district attorney's article suggested that uh, the he first he narrowed the subject to just the uh, sheriff's office and his office, but we must remember that public safety, even under the definition of 4088, which is fairly narrow, does include your fire service, it does include your probation department, and it does include your public defender. Uh, to look at only the uh, sheriff and the district attorney's expense and then to compare it to your total budget, which is what the article did, it said it only represented 15%. The point that was being made is that uh, there are some folks, folks I guess, uh, and I want to be sure that everybody understands, I am probably the chief amongst those some people who have suggested a bankruptcy scenario for this county if we're not very, very careful in how we react to the situation that we have with both the state budget and with how we handle our own budget. 15% uh, of the county's budget, the county's budget is 1.2 billion dollars, which is a lot of money, but the reality is, is that that money is not available for public safety. For example, no one would expect to take Medi-Cal payments from the federal government and use it to fund the district attorney's office. No one would suggest that gas tax money from the road department would be used for public safety. So in order for us all to remember what the real situation is, we must compare like for like, and that is public safety is funded out of our general fund. If you look at the percentage of the public safety departments, that's not just sheriff and district attorney, that is all those included in the ordinance, uh, they are 55% of the general fund, which is a sizable percentage. That is our problem. Further, we have to remember that this year, the growth in those departments if they had been fully funded to what they could justify their needs, would be a 24% increase in one year. That clearly is not a sustainable situation, and there is no way we can fund that. We also need to remember that we have been growing at about 12% a year in our spending for our public safety for the last 10 years. That's a 120% increase. 120% increase compared to the consumer price index during that period, which was 
So I'm not here to suggest that anybody is not spending the money on the proper things or that that's not the proper priority. We just have to be realistic. You cannot continue to fund at the ever-increasing rate that we have been, and that is what this big debate is all about. So when we read this in the paper and people want to diminish the significance of the threat of bankruptcy to local government, this is not an idle threat. It is a real possibility if we do not act responsibly. And we in this county have acted very responsibly, more so maybe than up and down the state, because in addition to all the pressures that are currently on the community, when you add in such things as guaranteed parity increases, which will require the district attorney's office to, you know, and it's a real problem, they are going to have to increase their salaries by 10.5% at a time when we are receiving no new money from any place. The same thing is true in our sheriff's office. It is also true in our fire service. Money that is well worth spending in those areas, but money that we do not have. So my message to us this morning is, is to be very careful that we do not turn on each other here locally uh, and constantly think that the only danger is from the state of California because the state of California's part in this is beyond your control basically and will be defined probably in the next week or two. What we will do to ourselves is much more serious and that it needs to have very serious conversation and not political spin right now. Uh, I know those are sort of harsh words, but if we do not look at finance and facts, and that means we should also not criticize public safety for filing their lawsuit, I think it is in everyone's best interest to have the courts rule on this issue, and we should not bang each other on the head over the fact that it had to go to court. But after it goes to court and a decision is made, if that decision says that you have to fund things that you have no money for, that presents a whole new set of problems that we will all have to discuss with the community. So for what that's worth, that is the situation, and we continue to be in limbo as far as the state of California is concerned. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Go to your room. <laughs> You're no fun. I know. I'm a real <laughs> downer. <laughs> oh, we go through this every week. It's just awful. Um, are there any other comments or questions by board members? Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. Probably just a, a, a timeline question as to um, in the crystal ball that you have, Mr. Johnston, are we looking then at about mid-September we're going to be revisiting all of this? Um, typically in October we'll have a, a revisit, but as this looks to be certainly more critical than it has been in the past. If the uh, Senate version of the budget's adopted, um, it's one of those magic tricks that they pull up there. They're going to owe it to us rather than beat us out of it. <laughs> but if they give us a date, uh, the counties are getting together and are talking about financing that uh, shortfall from the state on the basis that the state has promised to pay. If the state does promise to pay on a given date, and if we are able to borrow that money to fill the gap, what we have done is, is we've created more of the state debt has now been transferred to the local government, but it will take some pressure off you as to the immediacy of the uh, actions that you'll have to take. But for the next five weeks, uh, my office will be running through a variety of scenarios trying to figure out what it all means and then give you some choices in September. Uh, it may or may not require that you reopen your budget hearings, but uh, if we do not get the $12 million, uh, there is no question that a layoff scenario needs to be seriously considered. Okay, any other questions? Um, we met yesterday with a group um, called Local, and we met with the editorial board of the Star, and there, there was some agreement or consensus on the group that obviously the budget crisis is so bad in California, we all had to be part of the solution, but we didn't want to be all of the solution, and the percentage of what the state was taking from local government in comparison to our, interestingly enough, our position in the state's general fund uh, was disproportionate. And, you know, one of my comments when asked about, you know, the state just deferring the payment and promising to pay us in three years or whatever it was, I just looked at the editor and said, well, 
if you believe that story, that they're going to pay us back, I have a bridge for sale that I'd love to sell to you. Uh, I don't believe that uh, it's a safe bet that the state will pay us back. Interestingly enough, there will be an election between now and when all of this we should get paid back. There's going to be a whole bunch of new faces in Sacramento who will look us square in the eyes as local government and say, I didn't make that promise to you. I wasn't here, and I don't believe that money ought to come back. It's happened before, and it will probably happen again. So um, I'm very concerned about what the state um, has and quite frankly has not done. They could have stemmed some of the bleeding if they would have acted a lot sooner. Um, but I think that during our hiatus, I would hope that the CEO gives us several contingency options because I'm not very hopeful that we're going to get the money back. And as far as our ability to borrow at a low percentage rate and not cost the county, the taxpayers so much to procure funds is going to be harmed by what's going on. So um, I, I think that that will be a long discussion whether we have to actually open the budget up again or not. But I do believe there, there's got to be some very serious planning for the future um, given what's going on in the state. And when you throw in a governor's recall and a potential new governor and a third of the of the state legislature being brand new doesn't sound very encouraging to me. I don't know about anybody else. But uh, I, I believe we made our point yesterday that local government has uh, given it the office. Thank you very much. And we don't have much left to give. Certainly. How was the reception? Mm -hmm the editorial board? Uh, hard for me to gauge. Um, there were some good, some good questions, but, you know, given the editorial uh, in the Star in recent times, you know, I think they clearly understand. But the, the, the critical question is, um, you know, like talking about the car tax, you know, they said, well, given the fact that most of the constituents don't want the tax back. Um, what do you suggest? You know, and I said, well, I think that's the situation we're in right now that is critically important as public policy and as members of this community called the County of Ventura. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our constituents are asking for more and more services. Uh, there is um, a tendency to have less and less uh, sense of self-responsibility. And then they say they don't want their taxes raised. And so um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon us as boring and lethally tiring as the question of government finance is. I think it's going to be incumbent upon this board and all elected officials to somehow um, get through to the public on, on exactly how their tax dollars are spent and by whom and all of those things. The problem is you start talking about government finance and it only takes 30 seconds. Like, look at you guys. You're all glazed over. You know, this is not an exciting subject. And when you start talking nickels, dimes, and process, everybody just goes to sleep. They forget glaze. They go to sleep. So, you know, that's why this is such a very difficult subject for us with our constituents because they hear 30-second sound bites and think that all government is, you know, worthless, et cetera. Maybe true, maybe not true, but um, we have a major public policy problem in the state of California, and I think, quite frankly, nationally. So uh, I think that, that it was very well understood what we were saying. Uh, whether it was received well or not, um, you know, read the paper in the next few days and see what they come, you know, what their comments are um, and how they reacted to it. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Crying, sobbing, whining, um, all of which 
may have to may have to be allowed. Okay, we're on our 10 o'clock time. Certain we're going to go back to. Oh, I had a card on the budget. I apologize. I buried it. I'm so sorry, <coughs> Diana Lancar. Good morning, everyone. I'm speaking today because I'm worried about the new juvenile justice complex that is scheduled to open in just 45 days. In probation's budget report, they state that they are opting for a family-focused approach in correction. However, I haven't read how they intend on doing this and worry that they can't because on page 159, our CEO comments that they stand to have a $12 million shortfall due to budget constraints and changes in legislation. This is especially worrisome to me because on page 151 in our DA's budget report, he states that crime victim cases are up 53% and domestic violence is up 82%. Due to the fact that 50% of homeless women and children are so as a result of fleeing domestic violence, we will have a corresponding off the chart skyrocketing in social service utilization. Additionally, because domestic violence and violence are learned behaviors, these adult behaviors directly lead to increases in juvenile delinquency. Our crime problems are compounded by multiple generations mimicking their, mimicking their parents' unlawful behavior, which includes the white-collar crimes like IRS and paper fraud. Gangs and drugs have become substitutes for family attachments because their parents either can't or won't make time for them. We are stuck in a cycle of parents who can't teach their kids what they themselves either don't know or flat out reject as right. Even grandparents are often just as wayward. Ask probation, the DA, or the sheriff how often they encounter a kid who is unlikely to benefit from intervention because the, peop the apple isn't falling far from the tree and actually has parental support for wrong behavior. Probation's right. We need a family-focused approach in our correction system, and the JJC could play a bigger role in reducing our crime problems if it's organized not only as a house of correction but as a family resource center. Without correction at home, we're just throwing money around without any meaningful muscle. Speaking of muscle and money, with probation's $12 million problem, it seems that the way they might be able to fund operating the facility is to resort to massive hook 'em and book 'em and turn the JJC into Hotel California. You remember the song, You Can Check Out But Never Leave? This would be a huge injustice to juvenile justice. To counter that, this worried mother is working to secure funds and volunteer manpower to be, to be a new created village foundation, and I want to center it around the JJC. The JJC can be both a house of correction and healing for kids and families. The JJC can be the hub that has satellite resources out in our communities to impact the juvenile populations, which include their parents. That's where the situation gets sticky. Juvenile court has jurisdiction over the juvenile, not the parents, unless there's a family court activity in which the judge can trump family court to order the parents to participate in the correction needed. This gets us back to the cog in the wheel, namely that parents can't teach what they themselves don't know or flat out reject as right. So unless the court intervenes in comprehensive co correction, we grow more and more lawless generations, thus fighting a losing battle. We need a unified juvenile family court to address this in the often overlooked contributing factor in juvenile delinquency, which is the role family court plays in inadvertently aiding the make their own laws people. Since a large percentage of juvenile delinquents come from divorced parents, this factor is extremely relevant. Family court's tolerance of disregard for authority encourages them to treat court orders as toothless paper tigers. In family court, my kid is 602 and his dad are disobeying court orders and probation is effectively stripped of any teeth in correction. These make their own laws parents can avoid responsibility and sanctions until the other parent is literally starved out by attorney's fees, job loss from stress of litigation, and forced into homelessness. When an attorney for the child is appointed, it turns into a three-ring circus where the lawbreakers have free reign to invent false claims to retaliate against the parent who doesn't indulge the child with a restriction-free environment. This is not what a juvenile delinquent needs and actually teaches them to be adult perpetrators because nothing happened to dad. 
In conclusion, we need one judge per family to curtail the chaos and streamline the correction process to keep the system of users from clogging up family courts and adding burdens to the social services. Fortunately, we only use two or three juvenile courtrooms now, but we will have six in the new JJC. It seems we have the room. The question is, are we committed to taking an effective stand for populations clearly in need of intervention? Well, I'm out of time, but I will be back. May God bless you all. I remain a mother on a mission of miracles. Thank you for your comments. Okay, that's all I have on that item. Uh, we will move to the 10 a.m. time certain. Item 53 is presentation of a resolution to the Agora Youth Basketball Association. Supervisor Park. Thank you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of going to the grand opening of the cage in Oak Park. Uh, this is a what I consider the best outdoor basketball facility in the county. I challenge any of the other supervisors if they have uh, such nice courts, courts as we do here in Oak Park. Um, we had a wonderful grand opening, included uh, the school district as well as the Agoura Youth Basketball Association, but also some former great basketball players, including uh, Jamal Wilkes. So it was very neat, particularly when he picked up one of the, uh, I guess, Eileen Kahn and lifted her up must be in her 60s so that she could make the first basket. That was very thrilling. <laughs> um, I have a, a presentation, a resolution, and I'd like to read it, and then I'll come down. Um, Michael uh, Polly's here today to accept it with the Agoura Youth Basketball Association. The resolution reads that the, the County of Ventura uh, congratulates the Agoura Youth Basketball Association and in conjunction with the Oak Park Unified School District for their cage at Oak Park. It reads, whereas the Gurr Youth Basketball Association in conjunction with Oak Park Unified School District have partnered to build a state-of-the-art outdoor basketball facility to serve the needs of the youth of the community, named the Cage at Oak Park, providing three basketball courts, high-intensity outdoor lighting, a 10-foot high perimeter fence, acrylic backboards, and a modular resin-style court surface. And whereas this is truly a community-based partnership between AYBA and Oak Park Schools, Oak Park High School provided the land and AYBA provided $250,000 in funding and construction of the new basketball facility. That's a lot of bake sales. The <laughs> Cage at Oak Park will be a place for scheduled practices, clinics, and games for thousands of area youth who attend Oak Park and Las Virginas schools. Whereas over 2,100 youth play in AYBA winter and summer leagues, the new facility fulfills the dream of the many volunteers and players to build a lighted facility that would provide the league with quality court time for scheduled practices. For over 20 years, AYBA has provided second grade through high school students a high quality recreational basketball program. And hearing from these professional basketball players when they saw this wonderful uh, resin floor on the on the courts, just to say what what a benefit that is for their for the knees. They wish that they had that when they were young. <laughs> but now, therefore, it be resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors commends AYBA and their officers for their ability to collaborate with the Oak Park School District for their hard work to raise the funds necessary to make this happen for the youth of our community. And uh, I'll present this to Michael. If you'd like to come up to the microphone, maybe make some comments while I come on down. Thank you, Supervisor Parks. Um, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Board of Directors and many, many volunteers of uh, AYBA who have um, painstakingly raised money and, and uh, ran a successful program over the last number of years in order to make uh, this, these courts possible. And I especially want to thank uh, Supervisor Parks for coming out and participating in our dedication ceremony. Uh, we had some 500 people uh, there to celebrate the opening of these courts. Uh, the reason that we built these courts is that although we have beautiful open space in, in Oak Park and Agoura, we have many more players that want to play team sports than we have facilities to accommodate them, particularly in the winter time when it gets dark earlier and we just do not have many lighted facilities. So AYBA has been putting away money over the past number of years in hopes of building a facility, facilities hopefully, that will allow uh, the teams to be able to find practice time rather than competing for the limited amount of courts that are available and be able to encourage more volunteers to come out to coach the kids 
and uh, provide a great experience for the youth of the community. So we, uh, uh, we appreciate the, the honor and uh, we're excited about these new courts. A lot of people have been using them and, and uh, uh, thanks again for your support. Thank you. You know, it really takes this kind of public-private partnership to get these kind of facilities, and they are looking at now building one uh, at Agura High School, too. So really appreciate your effort. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> Next we have uh, perhaps... An unsung hero, <coughs> excuse me, but we have a resolution um, to recognize and appreciate Dr. Michael Bowers, DDS, JD, for his dedication to forensic dental ontology, ontology I can't say it, forget it, and, <laughs> and his uh, invaluable service to the county of Ventura. I'd like to read this, I can say that if I'm not in a hurry, um, because... I don't know how many people um, know of the service, uh, not only paid, but paid minimally, and all of the hundreds of hours of time volunteered um, by Dr. Bowers. And it was brought to our attention by our own wonderful Dr. O'Halloran, our favorite coroner in the whole state of California, <laughs> and with whom I am have enjoyed time in the, the cooler and other places, so uh, we've be, tried to become friends here. Um, anyway, the, re the um, certificate reads, whereas Dr. Michael Bowers has been a dentist in Ventura County since 1983 and has provided forensic dental consultation services to Ventura County through the medical examiner's office, and whereas Dr. Lovell deputized Dr. Bowers back in 83, making him the longest serving deputy medical examiner in Ventura County's history. And even though Dr. Bowers works on a fee-for-service contract with the County of Ventura, his fee is completely insignificant in light of the amount of time, service, and expertise he has dedicated to the residents of Ventura County, and for which he can always be counted on to provide. Whereas Dr. Michael Bowers has helped identify many human remains for the medical examiner over the years, including the high-profile homicides, the lost hikers, our society's homeless and forgotten, as well as some who've been identified as ancient, quote-unquote, Native American remains. And whereas Dr. Bowers has helped analyze bite marks and homicides with um, suspected sexual assault as um, aspects and in child abuse cases, and because of his extensive experience in the field of bite mark analysis, is recognized nationally and internationally for bringing scientific objectivity to an area of forensic science that was once woefully dependent on subjective opinion. And whereas Dr. Bowers spent much of his own time developing expertise in the field of forensic anthropology and forensic DNA recognition technology while also obtaining his law degree, attending evening classes in Ventura College of Law, becoming a leading consultant and forensic dental expert testifying both in Ventura County for RDA and elsewhere in the United States, as well as contributing his expertise to the California Department of Justice to help make their registry registry system for identifying John and Jane Doe's through dental records more effective. And whereas during Alaska 261 airliner crash three years ago, Dr. Bowers oversaw the dental identification of the 88 victim victims' remains, calling together a coalition of regional dentists that he personally trained and worked with the federal um, DMORT staff to effect prompt and accurate identifications for the families of those victims. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors wishes to recognize Dr. Bowers for his dedication to forensic dental technology that has been invaluable service to the County of Ventura, to law enforcement, and to the loved ones and families of those unidentified deceased. In addition, we wish to express our profound appreciation for all of the volunteer hours and the extra efforts he made on behalf of the 88 victims of Alaska Airlines Flight 261, passed and adopted today. And I would ask that you come forward, and Dr. O'Halloran, I would think you might have a word to say, and I'll bring this down. 
Well, thank you very much, Judy, and the rest of the board. Uh, I've known Mike since I came to Ventura in 1985, and he was already in place as the forensic dentist for the medical examiner's office. Um, I've learned a lot from him over the years, and I really do admire his dedication to forensics, despite running full-time his own dental practice. So he's, he's contributed a lot. He's been a good friend, and um, if he weren't a dentist, he'd probably make a better medical examiner than I am. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you. Oh, it's been an honor. The, uh, I'll be very brief. The, uh, my first experience in Ventura County was in 1973 as a dental student at the University of Southern California. School of Dentistry at E.P. Foster, my first patient I ever treated, was there dealing with the mobile clinic program. And later on, I moved to Ventura and uh, started my practice. And thanks to Michael D. Bradbury writing me a letter of recommendation and Warren F. Lovell for accepting it, my experience with the coroner's department started, and it's been an honor working with those individuals and Dr. O'Halloran. Uh, I think you, I really am impressed that you appreciate his work. He's an excellent medical examiner. So, again, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Others. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue on my quest to find people who um, have greatly helped and quietly helped the citizens of our county um, because I think it's important to recognize them. Okay. Item 55 is a public hearing before the Watershed Protection District. Change hats, everyone, regarding the South Branch Arroyo Caneo Debris Basin, blah, blah, blah. Good morning, Chair Michaels, board members, Mr. Johnson. For the record, my name is Jeff Pratt, and I work for the Watershed Protection District. I'm here to answer any questions or provide you with a brief presentation, should you so desire. Uh, presentation or are questions only? Okay, questions only. Um, are there questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Flood control projects, basins have, are real sensitive items in Thousand Oaks, particularly when they move oaks. <laughs> and I'm noting in this project that uh, the removal of oaks are also going to occur, I guess, two coast live oaks to allow construction equipment clearance um, at the northwest corner of the project and comply with uh, line of sight requirements. I'm wondering if there are some alternatives that can be looked at. I know also you're going to remove some black walnuts, but particularly oak trees, it's a really nice area there, what's left of it. So I was wondering. Uh, there are some alternatives that we're looking at. We've been conservative in our estimates. Uh, one of those trees has to go for certain. The one on the bank where the slope stabilization will occur. The other one near the entrance, uh, near the access road that we're trying to save, and it will be trimmed back in order to provide the clearance we need. However, in the event that it doesn't survive, we will have already mitigated for its removal. Does that answer your question? Um, well, the, the report reads that the ones that have to be removed for slope stabilization are the black walnuts, but the oak trees are going for line of sight requirements and um, one of to, the oak trees. to stage for construction equipment. I think one of the oak trees is for slope stabilization. Mm -hmm. The other one's for line of sight. Okay. Well, I would just request, I know we uh, back in the old days when uh, Alex Shady was here, he had pointed out that um, that wasn't something that they looked at first, and that's understandable with flood control. But it, if it can be done, I would appreciate efforts to be made to preserve them. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Do I have any cards on this item? Okay. Having no cards, it, it is a public hearing. Uh, no one spe wishes to address the board on the item, so I will close the public comment period and ask the board's pleasure. Move the recommended action. Second. I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Opposition seeing none. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next item is item 56, also a public hearing before the redevelopment agency, switch hats again, uh, of the County of Ventura regarding approval of a lease agreement for Piru Depot commercial space. 
Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Monica Nolan with CEO's office. Before you is a lease agreement for the commercial space within the new Piru Town Square Depot. The prospective tenants propose to operate a retail establishment. Items for sale will include antiques, local crafts, souvenir, coffee, and snack items. The tenants have agreed to dedicate a portion of the space to the Piru Neighborhood Council so that they could establish a small community museum. Rental rates are comparable to that of the agency's other property, which is the old bank building that is leased and operated as an ice cream parlor. The Piru Neighborhood Council has endorsed this business operation and looks forward to working with its future tenants. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Are there any questions? I have one card. Okay, thank you for the staff report. Uh, Janet Bergamo. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I'll be brief. I'm Janet Bergamo. I reside at 3838 Camulo Street. I'm currently serving as president of the Piru Neighborhood Council. We recently at a general meeting had a presentation from George Gonzalez and Lindy Riley concerning the depot museum slash visitor center slash uh, events coordination with a little coffee shop on the side. And um, <laughs> we, to be, to be brief, we support this 100 percent enthusiastically. I was pleased to notice after our general meeting that the proposed operators were visiting with community members and uh, discussing opportunities and taking suggestions. I think that we'll be able to work with them well and uh, I'm, some of you may be aware that our downtown is essentially right now a movie set. Um, we have uh, some some properties that were fixed up with um, historic preservation monies and then just used for movie sets. And since no one has opened anything in Piru except the ice cream store, we'll have passed, uh, well, since 1994, we are delighted with the idea that that beautiful new depot building that we have could actually become the center of our community. I think it was, is going to do a lot to revitalize our area. So I uh, hope that you can do everything possible to expedite this one because we were really eager to see it happen. Any questions? Questions? Thank you very much for your comments. And then I'm wondering, is it possible for me to squeeze in a brief remark about the proposal, the work proposal for the redevelopment agency? It's actually later on in your agenda. And I could just leave you a letter in support of that. It, it just concerns that the, the, uh, the, the, you have a list that, before that's you. That's perfectly OK. And so let me just save you some time as well. And, and thank you for your support. OK. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. If I might comment on this. Um, uh, certainly is one of those um, small but could be mighty things that really starts to kick off the revitalization of the business community in Piru. Um, this this town square is, as many of you have seen pictures or have been out there, I hope, um, has already uh, generated just enthusiasm and, and, and great support for this little community and investment. And, I, and it's one of these things like when your neighbor fixes up their front yard, the rest follow, and that's what we hope happens here. I think staff has done a good job in putting together a lease, and certainly the town um, neighborhood council has been very engaged in everything that happens in that town square, so I'd like to move the recommended action. Okay, I have a motion and a second. I have closed the public hearing since I had no other cards. Is there further discussion? Any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. The board is going to take a five-minute break since we've... Oh not been able to move all morning, uh, and we will be back for the 10.30. Okay. Besides, if I don't give them a break, they're going to start throwing things at me. <clears throat>
one moving part and I'm snowed. I didn't have my mic on. What can I say? I'd like to call the meeting back to order, please. If I could. Oh. What a major crash there. Could have lost two supervisors simultaneously. I think we had crashed. Two, but one. I, my, bet's on, my bet's on you, John. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm lagging one here who just made a mad dash out to get something. Um, but uh, we can hear back there, and so in an effort to stay reasonably on time this morning with a very long agenda, I would like to uh, begin our 10.30 a.m. time certain, which is item 58, presentation by County Clerk and Information Systems Department, of the ca ca campaign finance reform electronic filing. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Johnston. Uh, I'm very happy to be here this morning, and I was really happy to hear about the Oak Park cages because I need the names of the people that did the bake sales so we can fund the uh, unscheduled election that we're going to have. <laughs> On March 11th, your board approved the Ventura County Campaign Finance Reform Ordinance and asked the county clerk to evaluate electronic filing per Section 1278 of the ordinance. At that time, only two options existed. The program that was being used in the city and county of San Francisco, uh, which was undergoing a major revision at that time and wouldn't be available until at least September, and development of a custom system by our own IS department. After consultation with ISD and assurance that even with the severe time constraints we were faced with, the program could be developed at a cost less than the San Francisco model. On April 22nd, we recommended to your board and received approval to proceed with the ISD development of a program to automate existing FPPC forms. Due to these severe time constraints, the initial phase meets only the minimum requirements of the ordinance for filing Form 460 electronically. There are a couple of critical dates that need to be adhered to. A hard copy of Form 460 is due to the Elections Division no later than July 31, 2003. The Internet application will be available next Monday, August 4th and the electronic filed Form 460 is due September 8, 2003 for the filing period of January to June 2003. The ordinance filing instructions, frequently asked questions and forms will be available online. There is data download capability for the media and the public and PDF viewing for filed forms. Currently, filing is limited to controlled committees and candidates for county offices. Future phases will include additional forms and enhanced application functionality and controls. I'd like to thank Rick Young and Mary Lintz from ISD, Steve Taniguchi from the County Clerk and Recorder's Office, Eugene Browning and Virginia Bloom from the Elections Division, and Cheryl Monzone from the CEO's Office. With them, we were able to fast track the development and are prepared to demonstrate the finished product for you at this time. So I'd like to turn it over to Rick Young from ISD, and after the demonstration, we can open it up to discussions and questions. Rick? Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, first thank Mr. Schmidt and Mr. Bradley and your board for giving us the opportunity to pursue this project in-house. Uh, again, I'm Rick Young. I'm here representing my team of web designers and developers, as well as our, our colleagues in the elections division that we work very close with, closely with on this project. Excuse me, Madam Chair. With the, I know a lot of people are listening. That, would you mind just turning that speak? Yeah, that, I'm, I'm having, yeah, just pull that on up. You're, I don't want to say you're taller than Mr. Schmidt, but... Uh, Is that better? <laughs> okay. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to jump right into uh, a, a brief live demonstration of the application that it's, it's in its final stages of testing right now and as Mr. Schmidt stated will be available on the internet um, next Monday. Uh, this site will be available from 
the Elections Division homepage, as well as the County of Ventura online services, Clerk of the Board, and eventually the uh, Ethics Commission websites. So with that, I'm going to jump in here. Okay, the, uh, the campaign finance homepage welcomes both committee uh, and general public to the services that are being provided here. The, the uh, services that are available to the general public are the ability to research and view candidate filings, to view, print, or save the blank uh, state forms that we have available, and also to download or, or export file, detailed filing information for further analysis. First, we're going to look at the application from the candidate and committee perspective. Uh, candidates and committees will log in to a secure area for filing of their information. There's detailed instructions available here on how best to proceed. A uh, password support feature allows you to email your username and password uh, should, should those get misplaced. So I'm going to go ahead and log into my fictitious committee. Once logged in, I have visibility to any forms that I've successfully uh, submitted electronically as well as any form that I may have in process. I can, I'm limited to one, one form in process for simplicity's sake, one form and its attendance schedules. The, uh, the input screens for these forms look almost identical to the uh, state forms that the candidates are already familiar with. Any fields that are calculated uh, are automatically updated to reduce input and minimize errors. There's also online instructions for all the schedules that are available from each schedule in a PDF format. New, uh, the possible schedules can be added or removed from this uh, saving your work as you go, potentially over multiple sessions before, until you're ready to finally submit the form for electronic submittal. Once it's submitted, uh, any additions or corrections to the form must be done through uh, amending a f one of the submitted forms. Can I ask you a question sure. while you're at that spot then? You had talked about for simplicity's sake, there's only some forms available at this point in time. Uh, are the is the ability to amend those forms available from almost the get-go? Yes. If somebody makes a mistake. And um, you had said that you can only be working on one form at a time. Does that mean you can only be working on 460 or you can only be working on Schedule A of 460? Uh, 460 and all of its schedules. And all of its schedules. Great. Okay. Including the summary page. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Once your form is electronically submitted, uh, then it must be printed, signed, and turned into the electronics divisions with a wet signature. You also it, I'm sorry. Does it take the uh, um, totals at the bottom of each of the page and cum do the cumulative total in the right column on the uh, summary page? I don't believe so at this time. That, that would be nifty, too. <laughs> You also receive an email confirmation of, of each form that gets submitted. Okay, you'll see now that that's been submitted, I, I have the ability to add new forms, which could be an, an amendment to an existing form or, uh, or just a new filing. How, how long does a candidate have to submit the wet signature hard copy after they do this? 24 hours, according to my expert witness here. One working day, if it's obviously the weekend. Thanks. Uh, 
And you can print this out after you do it, so you just take that, sign it, and bring it in, huh? Exactly. You can you can come directly to this completed form, click on this, bring it up, print it. Let me expand that so we can see a little better. So this is this is how all your information filled out. Also has a county clerk watermark there, so that uh, the elections division will know that this was printed. And the date electronically submitted is also printed on the form. You can also select which form you'd like to amend. Can I ask a question? Um, when you say you have to submit the the, hard, the wet signature. Do you have to mail it within 24 hours, or do you have to hand deliver it to elections within 24 hours? It can be mailed. Okay. Thank you. And does the 410 is, does the 410 also need to be submitted electronically? The the the, uh, the 410 is is filed in person, and the elections division enters the enters that 410 electronically. You're doing that for you. Okay. You're doing it for the. Just Once, one, one with your certainly. permission. One more question. Uh, we have. We have a submittal that's due in a two or three days. Does it have to be done electronically? No, the, the original submittal is, is a paper filing, uh, but must be filed electronically by September 8th. Right. So okay. the still due on the 31st, the hard copy, and electronically by the 8th of September. Okay. <laughs> you got to do it twice this time. Mm -hmm. Twice must be better than once. I have a, a, another question. Yes. Um, you said that uh, controlled committees and, and um, candidate committees, um, what about independent expenditure committees? Are they, I would hope that they would be required to file and that that would be available online. Yes, it will be. It wasn't at the time that we put this together, but we've, that was, it was not in our original scope to deal with general committees, but we have added that, and that will be available next Monday. Oh, great. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from I, I have another question. Okay. I'm sorry. It just popped into my mind, and unfortunately, it's been long enough since we looked at this. <laughs> um, these, the electronic filing requirement is only for active candidates. Is that correct? Or is it for all electeds who are elected in the county who have to file, you know, the annual forms? This is just strictly for candidates. Because there's going to be a little bit of confusion because all of us who are elected, even though we're not running in this cycle, have to... What did the ordinance call I for? Think, I think our ordinance just called for um, the county elected office holders to file electronically. So that's the 11 elected office holders to file electronically. I don't know that um, our ordinance can wrap. Um, I think, in fact, we said we would encourage others to join us electronically. But I think Supervisor Michael's question, though, does it just apply to the three of us up for election, or does it apply to the two supervisors who are not up for election? For every, yeah, no. for everything yeah. that we have to file, because we're and, filing and, uh, at the end of the month as well. I guess I have to defer to the attorneys to look at the ordinance to be 100 percent certain. I, I think our intention... I mean, I think we were, I don't think we were even thinking about the supervisors that weren't running. Right. They had to do that. So it just depends on how it was worded. Well, and, and I wasn't thinking, I was with everybody else. I was yeah. thinking about current candidates yeah. that would be running, actively running for office because of all the other restrictions. Right. And so I, I'm just sitting here thinking, well, you know, I'm getting ready to file a report. Right. I wonder if I have to file electronic. The, the reality is be, because the ordinance does restrict those candidates, they can't raise money for their election until 12 months before their election. There shouldn't be a lot to file, but there still is something to file, you know, your summary and what mm -hmm. you've done up to this point in time. So we'll, def we'll defer to the but legal scholars. if you're an incumbent, you have stuff to file. Right, exactly. That's well, not you, necessarily you related to activity to this specific campaign, but you still have to file your appropriate forms. The uh, <laughs> ordinance requires that any can county candidate Candidates Control Committee or Independent Expenditure Committee that raises or spends at least $10,000 in any county election 
um, in, support of, in support of or opposition to a county candidate must file electronically. So if you haven't raised or spent that amount in a particular election, there's no electronic filing requirement for the county's purposes. Hmm. So I, would I think we better look at that. I want to make sure we're, we're okay. Um. So if just <laughs> I could just do a hypothetical. Um, uh, Supervisor Michaels and Parks, they're not going to be raising or spending any money in this coming election cycle. And so they're not going to be required to file electronically? That is my reading That's of your the order. Okay. King's X, if somebody gets mad. <laughs> I got I got official stuff right from the, you know it's just something we didn't we didn't really talk about sure. so I guess the key is to is anybody who's going to raise money and use it for this election cycle they're the ones that have to file electronically if you're going to raise money and going to use it in this election you got to file if you're saying I'm definitely not using it in this election then you're free till the next election cycle okay and then we'll be all hmm. Then we'll get to see it. What about like officeholder accounts that were, we did not eliminate those? So someone could have a lot of money in an officeholder account. Wouldn't that, even though they raised it in a given year, would it still require it to be posted? And would it be posted two years from now if they still had that fund? The devil is always in the details. Uh, in, in case of an officeholder account, since it's not being used for election purposes, or as long as it's not being used for election purposes, I don't believe the ordinance requires any electronic filing. <clears throat> but but the minute that officer account is used for the for the current election cycle, then they would have to file. Correct. Right. Is that clear? <laughs> okay, continue on. Sorry. Okay, thank you. You'll be interrupted many more times, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they still have to file by paper. Everybody has to file. Okay, also available here to, to the public as well as uh, candidate committees are the blank forms that can be printed uh, and filled out as well as a, a link to the Fair Political Practices Commission website where other state forms can be accessed. Uh, once, once forms are electronically submitted, they're available to the public for viewing under the View Filings option. These can be searched by candidate name, by committee name, uh, or by election. These also, these, all three of these paths uh, get you to basically the same place where you are viewing the forms that have been filed for a committee. The committee names uh, are organized beneath uh, candidate that they're associated with. <laughs> a selecting, selecting a committee will show any forms that have been filed electronically <laughs> and these can be uh, these are PDF uh, versions of, of the forms which can be printed or viewed online uh, finally the data export capability uh, allows all all forms that have been filed all the information relating to those in two separate files one is uh, all 460 financial transactions that across all schedules and one is uh, all 460 summary pages. These are available in a, in a comma separated value file which for easy loading into Excel or Access or any other database. But addresses will not be... But addresses are, are, not, do not, are not included in those. Right. Okay. Uh, also on the, on the PDF version of the forms that are available to the public, uh, addresses are not included in those, but you can see those within your committee areas that you're in your secure login. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Um, you know, we're going to be doing our hard copy filing here for the 31st, so some committees will be typing in, uh, under Schedule A, they'll be typing in the name, address, all of that stuff uh, already in there. Will they be able to simply copy that? If they already have that in a, you know, in the acceptable, will they be able to copy that and simply go to this and paste it, or are they going to have to retype every letter? That's a good question. <laughs> any suggestions? Stump who, the who I, any suggestions? Who I might ask? Uh, Stump the expert. Wow. I believe so, but let me let me uh, verify that and. Uh, 
Okay. Could you just verify it and get back to sure, we'll back do. to us? Because because we're all going to be typing this stuff up once. If we could save, if people only had to cut and paste. Now I know they won't be able to cut and paste the whole page, but right. if they could cut and paste each individual name and address, it'd still save uh, save a lot. The other thing is, we'd be less likely to have errors because if they retype it. You know, inevitably, if you got you know, a lot of entries there, you're gonna. If you have to retype a second time, you're more likely to make errors. So, if that capability is there or can be added before everybody gets going, that would be great. Okay. Uh, this can al alternatively just be uh, viewed immediately, assuming you have uh, Excel or Excel Viewer, which is a, the Excel Viewer is a free product. Bring up the in a spreadsheet the financial transaction detail here. Okay. There's also an administrative module used by the elections division for maintaining elections, candidates, committees, and, and users of the system. But I won't go into that. <laughs> uh, I wasn't real clear what that last database was that you had on the screen. That was just an Excel spreadsheet right. showing the uh, downloadable information. In the, in the data oh. export option. Okay. I'd like to thank you again, and with that, I'll, I'll conclude with any other questions you might have. Uh, yes, questions, Supervisor Bennett. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, the um, I, I know we're, we're just getting into this and stuff. Do we are we setting this up because with the anticipation that we may be able to sell it if other uh, uh, entities decide they want to start to do electronic filing. Yeah, I think I think that there are there is additional functionality that we'd like to build into that before getting to that stage to make it more marketable. But we certainly have developed it with that in mind. So yeah. we could rec we could recover our cost here if we're able to sell this to others, right? Great. Um, the uh, would is your analysis that this is a um, more sophisticated, more user-friendly, whatever product than the other products that are out on the market at this point in time? Well, I'm a little biased, but I think so. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So that, that could help us in marketing, uh, the marketing aspect of this also. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Supervisor Pratt? I just want to comment. I think it's very impressive. I think you've done a great job. I think it would be great if you could get the cumulative totals from each page and put them onto the summary sheet. I think that would be great, too. It just makes it more user-friendly. Miss Parks good wasn't job. good in math when she was in school. <laughs> <laughs> Love. Okay, Supervisor yeah, Long. Chair, too, to thank you. Um, it, it looks very user-friendly. Um, having looked at the San Francisco one, and, and I see that Mr. Carroll's been taking notes on some of the other uh, opportunities. So I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Bennett? Since we're into the comments side, I just, that, that, this is a cool day for Ventura County. I mean, people are going to, it's going to be a lot easier for people to figure out where the money's coming from in, in elections. And hopefully this will spread to all, all the other cities in Ventura mm -hmm. County, uh, so for everybody in Ventura County, and then to any, any other entities that uh, want to do that. But for a fair fee, exactly. But uh, uh, but my compliments, and I, quite frankly, I was concerned when when ISD and the clerk said we want to do this ourselves and not buy it. Uh, but uh, in reality, we're in much better shape now mm -hmm. uh, that you've you've set that up. So uh, my compliments to everybody involved in this. This is a this is a great you know one of the other key elements in in campaign finance reform. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much for the demonstration and, and for all of the expertise. There was never a doubt in my mind that ISD could handle it and that our election. Exactly. Um, and we, we look forward to, I noticed there's some Ethics Commission members out there and looking on with interest as well as, you know, spent, yes, treasures with beads of sweat running down the side of their head, all concerned about having this electronic filing. Um, the only thing that I would like to add is just be grateful that you didn't have to file under the state system when it was brand new. And it is a nightmare even today. And so my hat's off to our county for doing an excellent job that the state couldn't do. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to remind the board that uh, the first meeting of the ca uh, Campaign Ethics Commission is this evening here in this board chamber at 730. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> okay.
With that, the board is going to go into closed session uh, for one item uh, for which we have um, people here on special call, um, and that's that would be the uh, the labor item. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I have to figure out if people are still here and waiting uh, to hear the harbor issue. They're outside. Okay. It would be my intent that we do the one labor item in closed session and then come back into open session so we can get that item dealt with since um, it's been dragging all morning. Uh, and if it ends up behind the the ones this afternoon, it'll be 6 o'clock tonight before we hear it. So with that, we'll go into closed session and return hopefully 15, 20 minutes at the max.
work here. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting back to order, please. And we will, do we have, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, do we have anybody to give a staff report? I think we got it in bits and pieces somehow this time. Um, but this item is listed on, erroneously on the consent calendar as item 21. Uh, we have moved it to the regular agenda, and it is the approval of lease transactions for parcel LM1 etc. as listed on the agenda, and I'm not reading the whole thing. And uh, if we could have the staff report, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm Lynn Krieger from the Harbor Department. And I apologize first for the, the confusion on the agenda. The two items somehow probably in my office got reversed where the City of Oxnard agreement got put on regular agenda and this was placed on consent and the intent was just the opposite. <laughs> um, we are here this morning to report back on an assignment that was given to us last year, June 18th, 2002. And I'm going to do just a quick review of the overall transaction and then where we are today. Um, last year on June 18th, uh, the board approved an amended and restated lease for the Bahia Cabrillo contract, uh, the Bahia Cabrillo apartments and the new hotel and restaurant lease and an agreement that was called the Reorganization and Restructuring Agreement that laid out the entire deal between the county and Westbrook partners, which by any count holds something over 30 percent uh, of the properties in the harbor. Um, the county was uh, desirous, the board was desirous to have new lessees for the bulk of those properties, and so an arrangement was made to try and negotiate a deal that would accomplish that. Uh, where we will end up, assuming that this transaction goes ahead, whether today or in September, is there will be a new lease on the hotel, um, which was approved last year, but is part of this overall transaction that would be part of a single close of escrow. The new lease on the hotel would be placed up for sale with a required minimum investment by an investor of $9 million. Uh, whatever proceeds that Westbrook receives on the hotel sale, 20% of that comes to the county. And there is an entirely new form lease, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, addresses a number of Supervisor Flynn's concern. Fisherman's Wharf, which would be returned to the county for the purpose of putting it back into the market and bidding it out, would also be subject to a new lease. Uh, an entirely new form lease, which would look a great deal like the lease uh, on the hotel. That's what would be used to market it. On the apartments, we had a slightly different situation because those leases are, are still of long duration, in excess of 20 years, some uh, over 30. Um, the real desire there was to do two things. One is to split the marina from the apartments. When those uh, leases were originally done, they were done as 70-year leases. That's very unusual because marinas, generally speaking, don't last 70 years. Uh, marina leases are generally more in the 35 to 40 year range because by that time, the assets need to be replaced. So what we have is a 40 year old lease with extremely depreciated marina assets, but no requirement for their replacement. There are a number of years left on the lease. The apartments, on the other hand, um, financing entities like banks, often require very long-term leases in order to finance the buildings because they have a long life, certainly a longer life than marinas. So the idea was to split those two parcels apart, the land side and the water side. Uh, Westbrook indicated they were not as interested in the marina operation. That's not something they do on a national or international basis, which would give the county an opportunity for a new lessee um, probably either significant renovation or replacement of the slips in exchange for a new lease, which would also be to the county's benefit. Um, another piece of the transaction was to, in exchange for the term, I'm trying to think how to make this straightforward. Right now, the apartments don't have, I just mentioned banks require a certain term length to lend on the apartments. Right now, the apartments do not have enough term left to either be financeable or sellable because most buyers are going to want bank financing. Um, the carrot that the county has here is to provide extra term. In exchange, we're getting the hotel deal, Fisherman's Wharf, back. 
um, but also a $2 million capital investment. This is not repairs and maintenance, but a capital investment in the apartments, which should help to upgrade them. Without that investment uh, and without the sale of the hotel, except for Bahia Cabrillo, the lease term on the apartments does not extend. Both of those elements are required. Uh, in the apartment leases, which are not new leases because they had a long term left, what we tried to do is go in and fix known problems and anticipated problems with these old 40 year leases. Uh, for example, we dealt with lender issues, lenders rights, foreclosure rights. We dealt with the end of the lease where it's clear what happens with the improvements and that they revert to the county. Um, and we provided for the capital improvements and put more teeth in that have to do with the condition of the properties. Uh, the public over the long term uh, will still have input on the selection of the hotel operator, which must be done by the board. Um, obviously, we would do staff work to tell you what we found out about the people, but in the end, only the board can elect whether or not an operator is, meets the requirements of the lease. Uh, a boat slip operator would come back to the board for approval, and the developer for Fisherman's Wharf uh, would come back to the board for approval. Uh, the agreements that you have in front of you today, just as we said last year, <clears throat> the Bahia Cabrillo apartment lease that was adopted last year provided pretty much the form for what we did with the rest of the apartment leases. Uh, the marina lease is a little newer, but as you know, we've had a lot of experience with marina leases recently. <laughs> and the hotel and restaurant, as I mentioned, uh, came here last year. So we tried to pattern the leases after what was already approved um, a year ago. Um, I just want to remind the board that the, the reason we got into this position is that the properties that were held by Westbrook were felt for whatever reason to have fallen into disrepair. Some of them like Fisherman's Wharf are very dated properties. The occupancy went down, the income went down to them and to us. Uh, they were unwilling with the term left to reinvest and the county was unwilling to let those properties sit. The old leases did not give us very good teeth to go after improvements to the properties and so this overall transaction was our kind of middle line, a way to get out of the bad situation uh, and into something better. Uh, that's where we are today. Uh, the transaction, you'll note in your board letter, is exempt under CEQA because it's merely a lease change. Uh, what has taken the most time in the last year since we did this is the split between the apartments and the boat slips. Because the boaters have to cross the apartment properties to get access to their slips, because they need access to the restrooms and the laundry rooms and so forth, the easements that had to be granted back and forth between the boat slip leases and the apartment leases were, I can only think of the word gnarly, they were very complicated. <laughs> it took surveyors and hours and hours and hours of discussion and walking the property and can a boater get here from there. Setting aside parking uh, was another major issue that took a couple of months to resolve. So the bulk of the time in the last year has been spent on the splitting of those two parcels. And the easement agreements are also in this whole thing. <coughs> That's the end of the staff report, in case, unless you have questions, which I'm sure you do. Um, yeah, one question that I have, um, and maybe it was in here and just in reading it, I glazed over. Um, how substantial are the changes coming forth today from what the board approved a year ago the, in those leases that we approved? Well, every, with the caveat that every lease change to us is substantial because it protect, well, protects the county's rights right. and interests, and so there, we, we fight for them for a reason. The changes that you're seeing today are far less substantial than what was approved last year because these are merely amendments to existing leases. We did not, were not able to do new leases on these because they could just let them run out another 20 years, which the county didn't want. Okay. Uh, are, are there other questions for staff? Yes, sir. Just, <coughs> just a question that I, I asked at the beginning of this. We heard from a um, uh, gentleman, um, Mr. Walton. Already, yeah. yeah. But uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what are the compelling reasons why we need to do this today in light of the fact that we have a request for time to study leases that were not available until Thursday? Right. 
Um, well, the leases were available but not requested, but I, I understand your point. Uh, we place these on the agenda today only because of the hiatus that's coming in the board's activity. And since we were ready and since the lessee is, has some transactions that they're wishing to pursue, we put them on the agenda knowing that the board could always hear the report and elect to carry forward. Um, I, I can't judge. I mean, we've spent a lot of time. They have spent a significant amount of attorney's fees, as have we, and a lot of people have looked at it. But the board certainly has the right to take more time and look at it. I would hate to see a transaction go away, but I can't tell you whether or not that's going to happen in this time period. For, for us as staff personally, we will close escrow when the board is ready to execute documents and close escrow. At one time, didn't this board um, more or less direct that this get hurried up and, and get done so that these assets could start performing and we could start moving ahead, especially in terms of the hotel and the lobster trap in the fisherman's village? I think it was a few more times than one time. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, and I think you're right. I was trying to be <laughs> diplomatic, which is not like me. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm struggling with with six weeks of after, well, since years, since I've been on this board, this has been a topic of constant discussion, the revitalization of the harbor. Um, so perhaps we can get Mr. Walton back up here at, an, at a later time, uh, but wait until we see all the technical harbor questions are answered. Yes. Supervisor Flynn. Yes. Can you go into lend some detail on the hotel issue the nine million dollar uh, sure. issue the for sale the sale issue and uh, also the restaurant how that all ties in together okay. and and what you see is a uh, you see it as a difficult uh, part of the decision to be made is it a difficult one or is it fairly clean um, the, the hotel lease yeah uh, what we've done is taken, right now the hotel is split into three parcels. Uh, the extension, which is toward Elmar Marina on the other side of the park, those of you who are familiar, the hotel itself and the lobster trap. We are combining that with this. Um, in the end, they, they're grouped as, they're still in three parcels, but it's grouped under a single lease. Um, the new hotel treats it as a single entity, the new hotel lease. Um, what it requires is that a new investor coming in, and I don't have it right in front of me, but has to have a significant number of years of experience, has to have assets in hand that are enough to complete the renovation of the hotel, has to have a plan before they can receive the lease that the county board of supervisors accepts, um, and must keep in liquid assets, it's either two or three million dollars throughout the renovation in addition to the nine million to make sure that rent can be paid and so forth. On top of that, of course, the, the Westbrook properties uh, exacts a selling price for their interest in what remains of the lease after all these requirements are met. And 20% of that sales price also comes back to the county. Um, the new lease on the hotel was written to be uh, exceedingly stringent because of some of the requirements that we've had. It's been reviewed, however, by several attorneys now who don't express a great deal of concern about it. It has uh, the county's right to do maintenance inspections in the hotel, including the back, back office areas, the utilities and furnace and cooling systems and all that. It has the right to notice the hotel of, of areas that are lacking there and to re-enter and do the work and charge them for it if, in fact, it deteriorates. Um, it has provisions. Most of the leases have some change, but there are provisions in there that um, if rent reports are late, if percentage rent reports are late, if any documentation we request are late, there are fees for that which are converted to additional rent which allow for a default proceeding so that we don't have to wait until we have years and years of poor operation before we can do a default. There are simple financial penalties that can lead uh, directly to default. Uh, the end of the lease is extremely clear. Um, their performance requirements are laid out in many pages. It's about a 125-page lease, if I remember right. So it, it has gone into a great deal of detail reviewing the 
last several years, even prior to my arrival, of issues that have come up with old leases uh, and things we anticipate coming up in the next five to ten years. And we did have a checklist of those things we wanted to make sure were solved. Let me just ask one further. <clears throat> in what res uh, the, the hotel can be an anchor, one of the anchors for the harbor. Right. In what way will this be an anchor for the harbor, do you think, from your best judgment? Of it? Well, it's the, it is the key visitor draw. I mean, every, every lessee, even marine operators. I know, but is this test. going to do it, though? Well, it, That's what some, I mean. some of that will depend on the market. You know, the market for hotels has been better. Financing market for hotels has been better. On the other hand, there are very few waterfront parcels for hotels in the state of California. And we've had many phone calls with interest from you know, legitimate companies about about the hotel itself. The fact that it needs to be rebuilt and that it's on a ground lease is an, you know, is an extra hurdle some places don't have, but we also have a pretty nice waterfront. As you, as you look at the uh, uh, the terms of the of the change here that's being offered, um, what 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 do you see as a harbor manager? Is what is your vision of this hotel? What's it going to look like? Uh, what what kind of a uh, a star is it in your view is it a is it a motel six or is it a what what is it yeah i would hope it's at least an intermediate hotel like a like a hilton or a sheraton at the very least it should be a greener and more resort like environment particularly on the water right now it's heavily paved with cars parking on the water uh, and should offer amenities that are useful you know to to guests it doesn't have very many amenities now and a big business, frankly, in um, in local meetings and weddings and other businesses that hotels draw. That's it's that visitor draw that the hotel provides in the harbor. Many people want to stay at the hotel, but not the way it is now. Mm. I mean, I could tell you stories that curl your hair. Sure. We don't need and we don't to do that it. right at the moment. <laughs> no. um, are the in the lease? Is there? Um, all I can think of is the word reopener. But with these long-term leases, right. is there a way, because part of the discussion on these long-term leases is things change. And we've made the comments, you know, that, well, 40 years ago they didn't do this or there wasn't a coastal commission or there, da 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 da, da. So how do we renegotiate a, a lease if something significant changes in our world yeah if there is not as I recall we're pulling up the lease as I recall there is not a reopen it, reopener for change in state and federal law although generally if it's something that's onerous on the lessee they'll come to us and ask for help with that they'll reopen themselves mm -hmm. there are reopeners that are related to rent and um, how much rent is paid when it's paid um, there are I think it's at 10 years after redevelopment that I on the hotel. Okay, 20 years on the initial term because the first five to seven years will be construction and then 10 years thereafter. Then a 50 year lease. Okay. Well, that was that was kind of what I was looking for because, um, you know, oftentimes what we think is good today, <laughs> 30 years from now, is. Not so good. Yeah. So I just I, I want to make sure we can get back into that. And of course, the critical thing in my mind for the years I've been on the board is the ability to get performance mm -hmm. and to not let these assets deteriorate, take all the money out of them and walk away and and leave the public asset looking like something the public doesn't want to look at. Um, this is not a good thing. So may I say, Madam Chair, that that is the key issue. You just described it. She. The, the chair just described, in my view, the key issue here. Right. And it's in there, so I'm, you know, it was before as well. Because well, no, not these, the existing leases had no reopeners. That was one of the concerns. For example, the. No, what came to us a year ago? Yes, didn't have reopeners. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. We have a problem. We we approved this a year ago. We're sort of amending it, but the old leases, so which lease are we talking about? We're going to have to figure out a code here so we know which one yeah, we're talking on, about. Just to clarify, on today's agenda, you do not have um, the Bahia Cabrillo landside lease. That's what you approved Correct. last year. 
um, and you only have the existing term of the hotel lease, the Brujia Cabrillo landside lease, the apartments, and the Casa Serena Hotel and Lobster Trap leases are already approved. Okay. So we did not bring those back. Okay. Cool. Now we understand. Um, are there any further questions of, of Lynn before I go to the card? Have you? Oh, I'm sorry. Supervisor Parks. I was wondering. Okay. Uh, oh, that's right. I, I understand you're seeing that it would be beneficial to move on this now um, and that you've been waiting for a while, a couple of years. Why couldn't we have gotten these uh, two weeks ago? I mean, why, why get them on Friday? Uh, they, they were posted, I think, with the clerk on Wednesday. We probably erred in not delivering them to every board office. I mean, generally we do just place them with the clerk. Um, we had hoped, as you probably know, we had hoped to have this entire issue on in June or even the end of May for the board's consideration, but other events in the harbor sort of slowed us down. Defocused yeah. us. We don't, yeah. I mean, I, my office doesn't get our packet until Thursday, oh, so I we see. don't know really what's what's happening until Thursday and then um, not getting an opportunity to get these till the next day. But uh, there it wasn't, these were complete and ready and available a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if we... Were there you know, the questions we I were would, making changes mm -hmm. up pretty close to the and that, end. And that, to me, is something I, I really, you know, if I had the time, would want to look at our what ha, what changes have been made because it, things aren't highlighted and I don't. It's not in the report about what what are the differences. Um, I just I have very fundamental <laughs> questions. Things like the Casa Serena is the that's the hotel, right? And yet, that they're paying 121,000 a year, whereas the restaurant, the lobster traps, paying 200,000 a year. I mean, to me, that I would just think naturally a hotel would bring in a far greater rent. And you, the you comment, your response to me is, well, the hotel is in really bad shape. Well, they're going to invest money into it. It will be in better shape. How long is this 121,000? Does it go to 2022? Is that what I'm seeing? So for they're going to essentially get rock bottom rent for this for the next 20 years. Is that correct? The minimum no, rent is readjusted in the new lease uh, as the proposal for construction and the pro forma. So that's negotiated at the start of the new lease. This is just the existing rent in the existing lease. That's. 40 years old or 37 years well, old. Well, for example, it says the rent rates on the apartments go for till 2022. Right. That's the end of the existing lease. The rent rates on the apartments stay the same, and then they go up to market in what two about, steps. Uh, I'm, I'm just not quite understanding your answer as to how long will they pay 121000 a year for the hotel. Until a new buyer comes in and is able to take down the new lease. And they cannot take down the new lease until they have permits for construction, financing for construction, $9 million reserved in an account. And that's when you're going to now renegotiate what that amount of money then the should new, be? Then the new rent is, is set. Not the percentage rent. The percentage rent is in the lease and is out there. But the base rent would be set based on their projections of income. Which is a figure we don't know. Until you have a buyer. And then the questions about the hotel, uh, the new hotel. The way I'm used to it is you go out, if this were owned by the county, you go out to bid, you get some great proposals from different hotel chains that want to come in, they bring it to you, and you sit and say, okay, which would I like? It sounds like what we have here is uh, the uh, leaseholder is going to pick a hotel, it's going to meet the criteria, and it, therefore it gets approved. So I, I feel like we're not getting as much opportunity um, to, to take a look at what we could get. Is, is that a fair representation of, that is of a how fair the process is? That is a fair representation. They would be putting the hotel for sale. Uh, the county would control putting Fisherman's Wharf up to bid. Because they have control of the hotel, like I said before, they could have just run out the end of the lease and left the hotel the way it is rather than give the county more control. So it's how much you can get. And, and one thing you could get is saying bring in a, a couple or instead of just one if we wanted to. The, the $2 million that's going to be spent in renovating the apartments, and that's the kicker for you can go up to 50 years for this lease, um, doesn't seem like that from the condition of the apartments that that isn't going to be sufficient to bring them up to uh, the level that 
one would anticipate you'd need? It's the combination of the sale of the hotel and renovation of the hotel and the investment in the apartments. Um, what may not be real clear in this is by requiring an investor to come in and immediately commit $9 million, what that does is to the price of the hotel is drive, drive what Westbrook's price is going to be down to a very low number that's done intentionally. So in exchange for them allowing us to drive that price down and the $2 million investment uh, in the apartments is, is the uh, term exchange, the lease do, term. Do you have some kind of um, analysis of uh, with the proposed leases of where we'll be in, say, 10 years, what kind of income will be brought in, what kind of, you know, have you taken a look at that? Uh, on the apartments, in very rough terms, we have because the rent is fairly predictable. On the hotel not having a buyer, it's very difficult to predict what their income or the county's income is going to be. We could do those numbers. We've had other requests for those, but they, I have to tell you they'd be, you know, kind of educated guesses maybe, but guesses is the, is the operative yeah. term. Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I really don't feel like I have sufficient information to make a decision at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm probably just going to abstain from the vote. I don't, I don't know until I take a look at it and okay. what we have. Um, yes, do you have a question? Because we're uh, not ready for comments. I no, have I know. a card. I've got a question. Um, what, Liz, what is the timeline? What do you see happening, let's say, in the next five years? What are we going to see at the end of a five-year period or three-year period? What is your timeline? Okay. On Fisherman's Wharf, um, the timeline should move relatively quickly. We will take that back, assess what repairs need to be done, and then start preparing to get it out for bid probably, I would say at this point, probably next year, maybe early next year, maybe spring of next year. Uh, and then a developer will come in, and that's, that's not as difficult a property to process. You know, it's, it's a retail center that probably will be replaced with a retail center. On the hotel, they have up to five years to deliver the entire package. Uh, so, but my guess is that they want the term on that apartment, the lessee does, and is going to be moving relatively quickly. But within that five years, a buyer has to be identified, their plan has to be identified, the permits have to be gotten, the cash has to be sequestered. So all of those things will be happening in the next three to four years in preparation for construction. That's what we're going to be telling the taxpayers in this county. Right. Right. And so at the end of this period of time, the taxpayers can expect to see certain things right. established. Right? Right. I mean, it's kind of like a promise to the taxpayers. Yes. You know, when you look at it, 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 it the, the, uh, the side of it for Westbrook is rather clear. You've got number of years extended on a lease. That's pretty clear stuff. Two million dollars, that's pretty clear stuff. But the part for us, for the county, for the ta it's the taxpayer's harbor, not right. anyone else's. It, there's a lot of vagueness, and I can understand it being somewhat vague. It's kind of a trade-off between uh, what we have now with Westbrook and what's happened there which Westbrook controlled an awful, still controls an awful lot of 30 or 40, 35 percent of the total harbor. That's correct. And has not really produced anything. And that's the reason for the change. So the change is going to cost us some money, and the cost is, is kind of in the vagueness, I hear. Well, it's going to cost us some time but hopefully not money. I mean, there's $150,000 being given for the upgrade of Fisherman's Wharf. We'll, we will spend every penny of that, I'm sure. But it will be up to a developer coming into Fisherman's Wharf to spend the money for the permits and the reconstruction, not the county. What we suffer is a continuing loss of what the rent should be uh, for a few years. Same thing on the hotel. It will be a developer coming in who spends the 9 or 10 or 12 whatever million dollars. Um, for the county's ultimate benefit, but in the meantime, we have the loss of what we think our income stream should be. Mm -hmm. Just a, I'm sorry, a follow-up. Uh, as I understand that, um, that during construction, we're not going to charge them rent? I think it's a proportionate 
rent. You mean on the hotel or? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, and then I'm wondering how long of a period of time you're saying it could be five years? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm listening two places. I'm one. sorry for talking. To We've somebody. got so many leases going that we you have we ch always check. Check the document. Make sure we're. Uh, there's two things going on. One is right. uh, the question was, well, uh, hotel apartments, they get free rent during that period of time during construction uh, or a percentage off. And then the second question is, how long of a period of time t will, could that extend to? You said something like the hotel could go to five years or something. Right. On the apartments, there is no deferment of rent during the construction. Right. There's no, no rent deferral, no rent credit, no rent anything. They just spend the money, and if it costs them something to relocate tenants or whatever, that's theirs. It has nothing to do with us. On the hotel, there is some deferment, not credit, but deferment of rent during the construction period. We're hoping that at least a portion of the hotel is a teardown. And so um, there is some room for deferment of rent during that period when they're investing a lot and have absolutely no income. Uh, but the rent is only deferred for pay later payment. It's not forgiven. Yeah, it would be nice to see a breakdown of the financials. So we know what's coming in through the years. Yeah. And Dennis corrected himself on the on the uh, hotel lease. The rent is reset the first time at year six after the hotel construction is complete, and then reset every ten years thereafter. So it's 121 for six years. Uh, no, it's whatever is negotiated. <coughs> right. Until the new lease is taken down. How, it could be one year, could be three years, could be four years. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. No questions at the moment. Uh, Lee Quaintance. Thank you very much. I'm Lee Quaintance, and uh, my comments on this uh, matter are as an individual and taxpayer in the county. Um, I think it's a misnomer to regard this as a mere uh, continuation of something that you did last June. Uh, these, are, these are new lease transactions you're entering here, and very important ones uh, at that. But just going back to June for a moment, uh, the same problem arose then as has arisen now about the public having any opportunity to look at the documents. Just as here, uh, the item appeared on your agenda, and that was the very first opportunity for anyone to look at the, at the documents. Apparently, complaining about that at that time did not result in a different approach this time. Uh, and we heard in the comments that have just been made that for some period of time these documents have been completed. Why then were they not made available? Why should the uh, public get only a glimpse at what you are doing rather than an opportunity to look at the documents themselves? I think that should be just unacceptable as a matter of process. Turning to uh, the transaction itself or to the earlier transaction for a moment, I would like to, to note that there were a number of uh, board directions given, things that were to occur before this matter came back with a full package. Among them was to do due diligence uh, on Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, th this was uh, something the board wanted, wanted to know what you were getting, uh, since you're getting that and a little bit of money. Didn't hear anything about the results of due diligence uh, on this property this morning, or this afternoon, I guess it's still this morning. Another thing that, as a taxpayer, concerns me a great deal is the lack of any financial analysis. There has been some comment from various of you about that uh, just now. But let's take the side of the property, the, the pleasant, present leaseholder. What you are giving them has an immediate and calculable economic value. A 50-year term on these Casa Serena properties I'm sure Steve Walton could do this in his head, but he would uh, probably not even need a calculator to see how many millions that extension is worth and, and on sale of the property is part of its value. So you are conferring an immediate economic value in this transaction. In return, you're getting a little bit of money 
uh, you're, you're hoping you're going to get free of uh, an unsuccessful relationship, uh, but you don't have the figures to work with. I don't see how you can look to the taxpayers here to have confidence in what you're doing when there is no analysis of the financial consequences of this transaction, the value to you, the value uh, to, the, to the other party. I would also like um, to say, and we heard more here about teardowns and renovations, there's a comment in the staff report that says that this is categorically exempt from CEQA. It doesn't say who reached that decision. I wonder if it's your counsel or is it outside counsel? Was that decision made with knowledge that we may be talking about changing the footprint of this hotel or other types of transactions as that of that type? A similar concern is that it seems that whenever anything comes before this body involving the harbor, the odd man out is the existing 1986 public works plan it was approved by this board and approved by the Coastal Commission. There's not a single word in this document about whether these contemplated changes, Fisherman's Wharf, Casa Serena, et cetera, would require amendment to the public works plan. It's completely silent on that subject. No fitting with the plan, no economic analysis, no report on due diligence, availability of documents but not making them public. Uh, I'm not speaking for or against this transaction. I know that you have a, a lot of legitimate concerns about how the present leaseholder has handled these properties. But I think that you owe it to yourselves and certainly to the public uh, to allow due consideration of these transactions. And that would be partially done by continuing this matter to your next meeting or to whenever convenient. But I also think you should be requiring from your staff an economic analysis of this transaction and answers to these questions regarding CEQA, uh, regarding um, the public works plan, and the other matters that, that have been raised here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I have no further cards. Uh, would the board like, do you have any questions of Mr. Walton of Westbrook? Okay. Then I will close the public portion and confine the comments to the board. Um, Mr. Bennett. Um, th thank you very much, um, uh, Chair Michaels. Uh, I have five points um, that I'd like to make. One, um, I, I very much appreciate uh, that we can't have everything um, with these leases, that we are in a bad situation because the old lease, because we have prior leases were, were, were poorly written. We're trying to sort of we're not starting from scratch. We're trying to do the best we can given the circumstances. So I, I very much appreciate that there are some things we'd say, oh, I'd like to have this, but we very much know we could just stay with the status quo, which would be, be even worse. Uh, I also um, uh, appreciate uh, this fairly complex issue, and we have been trying to give staff direction for some time about this. Uh, and so I appreciate this successful effort to get to this point where staff has some leases that they've come in and said, hey, we think this accomplishes the direction that um, that uh, the board has given us. And um, uh, so I, I appreciate this, this because it is an improvement. I also appreciate the speaker talking about uh, his interest in trying to get moving and, and the time sensitivity um, that is out there with this project. At the same time, um, I, I that desire to move forward, uh, particularly by the person that was uh, by uh, by Westbrook uh, Properties, I think in particular, um, we have to weigh that with um, with this desire to have enough time to do the due diligence with the documents. Um, and so, I'd like to remind our CEO, I think, uh, as much as anybody, um, that I've consistently. Uh, taken the position that if we have a complex document coming, it is fine if it comes to us on Thursday asking for a decision on Tuesday. That's fine. A lot of complex documents come. But if a complex document is coming and it must be handled by a certain time, that, that, if, that, that staff needs to know that if they want a complex document handled by a certain period of time, that we have to have enough time to be able to analyze those documents. We may not ask for that time, and then that's fine. It can be handled. So um, I've always said that at least 
two meetings, be, if, if you have a drop dead date, then at least two meetings before that, get the complex document to us. Because getting a document to us, uh, you know, finding out on your, with your agenda on Thursday just doesn't give enough time uh, for the board or for the public to, to do that review. Um, this is a, a long-term lease, a 50-year lease uh, kind of arrangement that we're talking about. It is complex. And um, uh, when those two when those two issues come into competition, unless this is compelling and it's like it's going to be economic disaster for the county, uh, when those two things come into 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 competition, my experience coming from my almost very first meeting on the city council, I asked for more time on a lease. I was told no. I was new. I didn't know what I was talking about. And Six months later, there was a problem with that lease. I'm not sure I would have found it either, but that it's always made me cautious with regard to that. So I would err on the side of uh, having a supervisor who's asking more time um, get that time. We have this this long break, which is unfortunate because it doesn't. You know, I'm sure if, if I'm sure the applicants say, "Hey, a week, ten days, that would be fine." You know, well, that would give the supervisor time and give the public time. But we have this longer break. But we've all known this longer break was coming. And if, if with this longer break coming, it was, I think, incumbent upon us uh, to get this to us the week before this so that we didn't end up in this situation. It um, be good for the public and good for uh, the board to have um, more time. And so I would um, uh, err on that side uh, knowing that there are competing, um, competing issues here and would respect, um, regardless of what side people come down on, respect that people are trying to get it right uh, regardless of this, but that's what I think is the right position for us to take uh, on this one. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Supervisor Long? Well, I, I certainly agree with um, comments made as to the, the staff um, doing what I, I feel they were directed to do by this board, um, that we really did set forth a business plan in June of 2002 that we were the ones who set after months of, of um, uh, litigation issues uh, set forth parameters that called for uh, a nine million dollar investment that called for um, separation of, of waterside landside that called for um, uh, some basic agreements that we wanted to have uh, for the deal points and and I agree we we still are struggling with what we inherited in the way of, of, of uh, very old and um, uh, outdated leases that that uh, we're we're trying to work our way out of and it has been very complex but I think that uh, it's, it, the unfortunate side of it is that um, uh, the action that was taken in 2002 that we we do have uh, request of, of the new supervisor to take a review on this and um, uh, although I feel that there, we have given direction on this, and I, I would want, not want to impugn that the staff has not been doing their job because I think they've been doing yeoman's job with uh, uh, county council with all the respective reviews that we require of every lease that comes to this board. I think they have done that. Um, I, I find as a, a business person limited experience, but some experience in the business world that, that it, it, de delays like this are very frustrating. Um, and I, I expect we could sit here and discuss uh, who's to fault for delays. Um, I'm, I'm finding it frustrating that we're going to delay this in the sense that if, in fact, there is someone out there who potentially would be that um, four or five star candidate for that property, that um, I'm surprised we get the rent we do from it, frankly. I'm, it's the condition of it is, in, is not something I would pay to spend time in. But um, I... I'll, I will appreciate the, the board members' request and, and the concerns that um, uh, there be uh, time to vet this a little further uh, and um, respectfully <coughs> say that if, if the delay is requested, then we 
will support the delay, uh, asking that we move this as quickly as possible onto a September calendar, because I think we have said for years, as long as I've sat here, that we have not invested in this harbor. We have not, and, and now we've pushed staff to invest in this harbor, and now we're taking some more time and, and delay of that. Um, that's my comments for now. Supervisor Flynn. You know, the public has been very critical of the county, critical of what's, what is not happening at Channel Islands Harbor. And the criticism has gone on for a long, long, long time. If we were to identify one major project that we've been waiting for, and it's not been going very well, and that is to bring the Channel Islands Harbor up to the standards that it once had, what, up to the attraction of people that it once had. Now, many things have, have caused it to kind of bogged down. One would be the 101 development along the freeway, restaurants and so forth and so on, which has, which turned the public away from the harbor onto the freeway. And that's where the people spend their time eating and so forth. But the public, it's very close to the public down there. True, it's, it's not the whole county, but there are a number of people, and there's two of them sitting out here now, who are very sensitive about what happens, and we have to pay attention to that sensitivity. But if we don't do the right thing, this lack of doing the right thing with that harbor is going to bring the total harbor down. It's been an anchor. It's held us back. The development hasn't been good. Uh, immediately after Westbrook took over, people just left Fisherman's Wharf. Sub-lessees just left the wharf. The hotel looks horrible. We've talked about that. We've not kept up with this, with what should be done. I'm going to uh, vote today to uh, move ahead, but I have some I have some requirements. One requirement is that I want to see the uh, CEO become more involved in the harbor. Today we should have a uh, detailed review by the CEO on what he thinks of these changes as stacked up over there going from Westbrook to someone else. That's number one. Number two, I want to see a management plan created by the CEO and the manager of the harbor that manages these changes. We can't go on like we're going now with a pretty limited staff in number. We don't have a big enough staff down there to do the work that needs to be done. I would like to see one person at least be the project director for all these changes. And still, that wouldn't be enough. But we need to have a person that knows what he or she is doing on managing these changes that you see stacked up over here. If we're not going to have that, then we're, it's going to all be a failure. We've got to have the staff organization to push this thing forward. Presently, we have a staff is that is divided between Channel Islands Marina, other changes taking place, riprap repair, uh, master plan that uh, is, ha is shaky, uh, dealing with public works plan and dealing with the city of Oxnard. There's a lot of issues for one person to be handling. That person is primarily Lynn. She has some help, but not enough help. You need help to do what is being asked here in these documents. You need help to do that. I see you winking, 
but I'm serious. If, if you want my vote, I can change it all of a sudden, but I've got to see some changes at Channel Islands Harbor as far as how it is managed. Westbrook was a mistake, serious mistake, and that's not Lynn's fault. That was done before Lynn came, but that's been a long time now. We, during that time that we've we spent with this harbor and talking about it, a whole university was started. The Esplanade was all built in that time. And so I've got to be able to go out and tell the public, tell all those people that live around the harbor what we're going to do, what we're going to produce. And I've got to have faith in staff to be able to do that. And my faith right now is shaky. You've got to build that staff up. Instead of spending a million dollars to put into an administration building, we better be spending some money to put into staff. I, I, I'm not going to finish yet. Um, now. The things that I've outlined, I would ask to be implemented and to repeat. We've got to have more CEO involvement, and we've got to have staff, additional staff people dedicated to perform. Supervisor Parks? I do appreciate the, uh, the effort. And from what I've read in the staff reports, it sounds like some really creative ways of trying to get this area renovated. Uh, I look back at a June 2002 staff report uh, before I came on that shows that negotiations have been ongoing for over a year, and that was in June. So this has been going on since 2001, but this is the first time that I've had a chance to look at it but I understand that the rest of the board has had that opportunity. Um, I, as I mentioned, if, we, if you do want to move forward, you know, I'm just going to have to abstain for lack of knowledge. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, you know, there's absolute merit and the goal is there. It's been going on for a couple of years. We're talking about six weeks here. That I don't know if that's going to be the fly in the ointment going for six weeks after a, a few years of, of working on this. But um, that, that's just, you know, I, I can't feel comfortable with my vote unless I have a look just to see what, what is, uh, what's in the record. So I, I do apologize for that. I, I, had, I really didn't have a, a chance to, um, to read it. I did send 20 questions to Lynn Krieger yesterday. She managed to answer a lot of those questions, uh, and then I still have more questions because it is. It's very complicated, and I don't know if any of us up here can really explain exactly what's going on here, but I, I, I would like to be able to have the opportunity to, to look at it. Okay. Um, so many things have been said. I don't know. I want to try and keep this clean and, and to the point. Um, certainly this has been a long time coming. Um, there have been lots of ups and downs. There's been lots of terse meetings um, amongst all sorts of parties that are involved, you know, board members and everybody else. Uh, and quite frankly, the board is as probably as much to blame for some of the slowdown issues um, as anybody else if, in, if we were trying to place blame, and we're not. Um, this is very, very complex. The negotiations um, were very, very difficult. There were times where, quite frankly, if, if we were ascribing reasons for slowdown, that it was on the other side of the negotiating table. Uh, there were several um, issues with out-of-town corporate uh, leadership, et cetera, that, that took a lot of time. Um, and so I, I think my frustration is certain, well, I know my frustration is certainly not pointed at Supervisor Parks. I don't blame her. This is um, 
it's extremely complicated. It's very difficult. And perhaps in a way it was um, our fault, and, and I will say myself, for raising expectations of being able to get this moving, get it on the agenda before we go on break. Because, you know, once the, the board approves this, then the harbor can move forward, the lessee can move forward, and we can start, you know, performing to this. And to me, um, and my admittedly limited um, business experience, uh, Time is devastating, and you can take as long as you want while you're negotiating, and it's either and it's either side of the table's fault, depending on which side you're sitting on. Uh, but once the agreements are there, then everybody's in a hurry, you know, and everybody forgets that how long it's taken to get here. Um, I I personally have a lot of confidence in what has been uh, negotiated through the years uh, and what's before us today. Uh, given that, that we've seen this more than once. However, given the fact that no one could stand in front of me and say, we're going to lose a potential customer, uh, staff, you know, would love, at least if I was staff, I would love to have this puppy put to bed before the board goes dark just so I could tick off another thing and throw it out and, and go back and work with other issues for the, the weeks that we're off. However, um, you know, it, it doesn't sound to me like the board is all that ready to move forward. Supervisor Flynn has concerns that certainly I wouldn't approve a motion that included that direction without some further discussion, you know. Um, and you may be right, maybe we do need more staff out there, but how do we get it, who pays for it? Some of our issues are being put to bed now, so we can refocus some of the energies of staff that have been kind of sidelined with some of the excitement over the last few months out there. Um, and so as much as, like I said, I'm ready to move forward, I think it's a good deal, I think it's as clean as is humanly possible and nothing's perfect. Um, however, since people are reluctant, I think we might be better off to wait the six weeks, let Supervisor Parks look at the leases, um, let us talk about at the next meeting when it comes back um, some of the issues um, that uh, Supervisor Flynn is concerned about, at the very least, let Supervisor Flynn talk to the CEO about some of those issues, um, re-look at, re-estimate staff's time, uh, and have a good discussion. The only reason I wanted to hold the discussion today was to see if the board was ready to move forward. If after staff report and all of that, everybody could be comfortable and we could move it forward, and I would like to do that, but I don't feel that we should, and given um, the magnitude of what we're doing and the long-term effect on the county, um, I'm not willing to push this board into making a decision um, that they don't appear to be ready to make. So, you know, unless there's opposition from the board, I would say that we would move this to the first meeting in this, in, uh, when we're back in session in September. Um, right now it doesn't look to be a big deal. Um, as far as this part of the agenda um, proposed. And I, I think the only problem is Supervisor Long. Nope, that's on the 13th. So I would propose we move this to September 9th, um, try and get it on the regular agenda. <laughs> uh, and probably best to do a time certain since everybody's had to be here once already. Uh, uh, how about 10 o'clock? Let me work with Roberta. We'll make it time certain at, at one of those time certain times, whichever one would be the easiest to deal with. I doubt that we'll have a very long uh, discussion on it because by that time everybody's questions will have been answered, um, and I think people will be uh, ready to move or not move. Um, but I would, I would like to... Um, 
quit yammering on by saying I do appreciate the work that's been done um, on the leases. It has not been easy. We have at times, I believe, been obstructionist, as has everybody else involved in the, in the process. Uh, and so I think that that staff and the public can be proud and confident of what, what has been done so far and just give the board a little more time to be confident in their vote. Yes, Mr. CEO. Uh, I don't, I think there may be a misunderstanding here. There was uh, the, I thought the question was asked, is there some reason or time concern uh, to go forward. I, I, let me say this. I think it's fine if you wish to carry this forward to September or October. I mean, that it was put on the agenda for at the request of my office and your board to move the process forward, not necessarily to make a decision today. There were no specific commitments or deadlines. I would like to make say one thing to our staff in the harbor. One, thank you. And two, you have more staff than you're paying for in terms of the efforts that are being put forth. And you can't afford any more staff right now unless you wish to take it from your general fund, public safety, or some other place. So these folks are working really hard under very difficult circumstances. There's no place to put more staff if you could afford more staff, because I believe we have people out there who are working in converted carports. So the remodel uh, in, out at the administration building was not a luxury. Uh, people need to understand the circumstances that these folks are working in. I think that what has been proposed is good and will move us forward. I don't think uh, there's a bit of problem with having uh, the newest supervisor, Supervisor Parks, talked with our office last week, expressed the concern. We told her if she would like to have that or more time. Fortunately, you're going to have now like six weeks maybe or whatever time to, to read all that. That all works out. Uh, <laughs> to improve the process, uh, the uh, the show uh, the demonstration of progress that Supervisor Flint has been asking for is one of the reasons why we wanted this on an agenda so everybody would realize that we need to go to the next step. Now that we have everybody's undivided attention, apparently, uh, let's take our uh, six-week break and uh, see what we can do in September. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I just hearing the discussion, I'd like to compliment the the, the board or the. the board members that are willing to to uh, take more time in spite of the fact that I, I hear the frustration uh, uh, that when in the business world delay is is, is a cost uh, uh, and so I, I appreciate that I'm going to compliment that it it's an interesting thing the negotiations may have been a long time in coming and but that's not a justification for a short um, due diligence review process, I guess I would say. And so um, I really appreciate you saying time, you know, the, the, the delay is very frustrating to business, but when business deals with public entity, they have to realize that we have to be very conscious of process. We have to be very conscious of the public's perception. And that, that's where we get beat up more than anything else. And our number one goal when we hired our CEO was, confidence, public's trust in this in this entity, and I could just see somebody going, this Board of Supervisors approved a 50-year lease, millions and millions of dollars, and the public had between Thursday and Tuesday to review that pile of paper. Unless there is a really compelling reason, I think I, I compliment the Board. I think we are making the right decision. So I'd move that. I'd move the... Um, with a statement that uh, Supervisor Michaels made, which was to let her determine it at time certain for our next September meeting. Second. I have a motion and second. Any other? I, I would like to commend the uh, chair for uh, her cogent and prudent comments. I think that, that's you, you just gave us an example of leadership with that. Well, thank you very much. Any more compliments? I mean, any more comments? <laughs> Seeing none, the... Uh, Motion carries, and we will revisit this at a time certain, September 9th, to be announced as soon as it is determined. With that, the board will go back into closed session. We will return at 1.30 for our 1.30 hearing. We will continue to slug our way through this agenda till we get to the end. We will see you all at 1.30.
Okay, I'd like to call the board meeting back to order. We are now at our 1.30 time certain. And as soon as I find my agenda, I'll tell you what it is. It is, to be precise and read the correct title, item 60, public hearing regarding amendments to the Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Drew Madrigal. I'm with the Ventura County Planning Division. I'm here to present for your consideration 11 amendments proposed to the Ventura Non-County Coastal Ordinance. Amendment 1 clarifies the use of, term, uh, of the terms uses and structures, and the term maintained is inserted to cover existing uses, structures, and permits. Amendment 2 clarifies building height. Amendment 3 establishes the minimum lot size or production area required for different sized nurseries. Amendment 4 uh, requires a conditional use permit when more than one acre of vegetation is to be removed from a single lot in the SRP zone. Amendment 5 adds new language needed to identify the responsible parties for payment of code enforcement fees for processing confirmed violations. And then Amendments 6 through 11 are, here, are inserted for corrections to previous amendments. Errors were crept in during the uh, previous amendments that were adopted. The recommendations of the Planning Commission are as follows. One, find that amendments 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 have no possibility of significant effect on the environment and are therefore exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act under Section 15061B3 of the state CEQA guidelines and amendments 4 and 5 are categorically exempt from CEQA. Class 1, Section 15301, Class 27, 15327. Two, find that based on the evidence presented in the staff report and at the hearing that the zoning ordinance amendment standards are met and that the amendments are cons consistent with the general plan. And three, approve the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance as depicted in Exhibits 1 and 3 and adopt the attached final ordinance, Exhibit 5. And four, specify the clerk of the Board of Supervisors and the clerk of the Planning Commission at 800 South Victoria Avenue, Ventura, as the custodians and location of the record of the proceedings upon which this decision is based. This concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Did you read that or memorize it? Oh, no, I read it. <laughs> and yes, my lips move when I read. <laughs> okay, are there any questions of staff? Good job. Uh, do we have any cards? Okay, this is a public hearing. We have no cards, so I will close the public testimony portion and confine the comments to the board. Are there comments? I have one comment. I support this um, this change and support it moving forward. Um, at the same time, um, I have um, we've had some conversations with uh, staff um, about this uh, same issue with the SRP zones. Uh, for the benefit of the board, was staff able to get a a map that you could put up of the SRP zones? If you could project that up, it'd be helpful for me. The, um, I don't know if you can just squeeze it in there a little bit more. If you can see, well, I'll, there, there, well, you should get, there you go. Good. All right. Um, the the what this what this refers to this refers to the SRP zones. That's the green areas that that you see there, uh, and you can see that, um, that the Ojai Valley has significant uh, portions of it up above Fillmore, Lockwood Valley, and then a little bit down there in Thousand Oaks. Um, talked with staff. We, we've had a number of constituents contacting us about ridge lines being built, and we may be we may have uh, an unintended consequence going on with our current ordinance that requires a CUP for a building that removes a certain amount that grades a certain amount of material um, and uh, on the ridge line because what they're trying to do is pr protect the ridge lines and so what's happening is people are going to the ridge line and they're just they're not removing the material they're just plop the building up even higher above the ridge line. And we may actually, in an unintentional way, be doing more damage to the ridge line with that uh, than we would uh, the other way. So we've we'll talked with uh, uh, Mr. Stevens, and for these three areas, um, what I would um, 
uh, like to do, and I know you just had a recent conversation in terms of the best way to do this cost effectively, et cetera. I'd like to, at the same time that we adopt this with the SRPs, um, we adopt a, an additional motion that directs the planning staff to include in the next zoning uh, ordinance amendment, in other words, when they do it, not, not new work that we're creating right now, a revision to the standards of the SRP zone to require a conditional use permit for buildings with a maximum height of over 15 uh, feet above natural grade or other such requirements to, to ensure that structures over one story are subject to the CUP because we are, we're getting a, a number of people comment about these structures stick, sticking up on the ridge line, and they may very easily be with a different arrangement. They may be able to to grade it in and have the thing actually look better and not not do uh, not have as much of an impact on the ridge line. So. Um, uh, conversations, Mr. Stevens indicated that with that approach, the cost impact would be minimal because it would be rolled in with the other things. And the public and the planning commission would still have the opportunity to comment on the amendment before it comes to the board. Uh, and then and when it comes to the board, the board can still accept or reject it. And I would, of course, expect staff to come with uh, a, a list of the advantages and disadvantages or staff's recommendation of this amendment before it comes to us. So anyway, um, this, there, there are three, three districts where this seems to be most um, pertinent, and that's uh, uh, District 1, District 3, and District 2, I think. Right. Uh, in terms of that, so anyway, that would be uh, a an amendment to to uh, this motion. So I'd li I'd like to move the four recommended actions and uh, the amendment as I read. And if you'd like me to, I'd read it again. But um, I think you've got That's it. That's fine. Mr. Stevens has it. Right. Okay. I have so. a motion. Second. Do, is there any comment? The motion includes the requested changes next time. Okay, is there any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we move on to item 61 is uh, receive and file the report to the board re regarding tree protection ordinance regulations, et cetera. Okay, and I, I'll, I'll start off with this one. Uh, okay. I'm chair members of the board. Uh, when you were considering the amendments to the zoning ordinance for second dwelling units, uh, Supervisor Parks raised the issue of our tree preservation regulations and, and ordinances and ha what changes might be required uh, as a result of our change uh, to the ordinance for second dwelling units. And uh, this is a report back. Uh, staff took a look at that issue. And uh, just to refresh your memory, the primary change, I think, uh, with the second dwelling unit ordinance revisions was the movement of second dwelling units from a discretionary permit to a ministerial permit and what that meant with respect to our tree regulations. Um, we've taken a look at it and, and on uh, page two of the staff report I think is, um, I think covers the, the meat of the issue. Um, the tree protection regulations are also, uh, as you might have expected, broken into both ministerial and discretionary permits. The primary uh, difference between the two is the number of trees and where you have on a lot uh, the removal of more than uh, five trees, it jumps you into a discretionary uh, permit. Uh, the ordinance also has some language in there that uh, says that where the tree removal is in association with a discretionary permit, they can also be made a discretionary tree permit. Um, Could you say that again? Okay, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of hard to explain. Where, where the tree removal, let's say we're only a single tree that we're being removed but that removal was in association with a discretionary permit. Uh, we could treat that tree permit as also discretionary. Uh, what typically happens in the way that the staff has been handling this for you know, a number of years is that the review of that tree is done under the discretionary permit uh, activities, but it is not treated as a discretionary tree permit. They then get a ministerial tree permit. Um, and, and, and I think one of the key reasons for doing that is highlighted in the middle of page two is that, uh, or, or on, the, on the top of page two, excuse me, it talks about the standards uh, that relate to both discretionary and ministerial tree permits. And uh, the uh, key one being that uh, in section 8107-25.6, we talk about the tree in its present form and or location denies reasonable access to the subject property 
and or the construction, maintenance, or use of the property in a manner permitted by zoning on the said property. That actually is a standard that applies to both our ministerial and our discretionary tree permits. And so when a project comes in, regardless of whether or not it's ministerial or discretionary, it's reviewed by planning staff. And I have Terry Newman of our staff here. He is our, our resident uh, tree expert and uh, would definitely refer technical questions and, and process questions to Terry. Uh, but uh, the point being that when a project comes through, that standard is applied as to whether or not it's the first tree on the property or the sixth tree on the property. The difference between the ministerial and discretionary is the application of what we call our tree offset standards. In other words, the, the sixth tree triggers a requirement that there be an offset standard or replacement, uh, uh, a, or a um, fee associated that goes into an account for future tree preservation. That's really the primary difference. How we treat it, how we review the site plan, no substantial difference. And so uh, the, different, the change on a second dwelling unit, taking it from a discretionary to a ministerial, uh, in our opinion, has not changed how we review a tree removal in association with that second dwelling unit. Uh, and I know that's probably a somewhat convoluted explanation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and as I said, Terry Newman is here from our staff who can give you some of the details, maybe the day-to-day -day implementation of this, uh, this ordinance. So. Yes, Supervisor Bennett. I, I appreciate you saying it hasn't changed how you review it. Does it change um, whether the permit goes through or not? Because the, it's ministerial, so. No, no. It, no. It, I mean, when you say it doesn't change how it's reviewed, it also doesn't change the outcome. In other words, we're going to get the same outcome. That, yes, that's correct. We review the site plan, whether uh, the, dwelling, the second dwelling unit that came in two months ago and the one that came in t today, right. we would review the site and see whether there was an opportunity, and they wanted to remove a tree, right. whether that site plan can be adjusted to avoid that tree. Would have been done two months ago for that second dwelling unit, and it will be done today. Great. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Supervisor Parks? Yeah, I wanted to um, look at the protected tree ordinance um, and it came to light with the second dwelling units. Uh, as Chris pointed out that uh, this, the um, oak tree permit or the, um, I think of oak tree permits because I'm from Thousand Oaks and that's what we have, but the uh, tree, tree uh, preservation guidelines require that it would go into the uh, admin to a, um, administrative hearing if you had the uh, second dwelling unit associated with it. In other words, it wouldn't be ministerial. And it allowed for um, appealing to the planning commission at that point. Is that right? If, well, let me, let me ask Terry, do you want to get up and speak to that? I, well, if, I guess it, it would become discretionary instead of ministerial. It would be taken along with the discretionary permit. Could you repeat your... The, the tree, the request for a tree permit would be taken along with the discretionary permit, which is what the second dwelling unit used to be. So you'd get them both at the same time and instead of ministerial, it would be handled with a discretionary permit of the second dwelling unit. Evaluation of the project, let's assume for a moment, uh, for example, there's a principal residence uh, requiring a discretionary permit and in association with that a request for a second dwelling unit. Um, <clears throat> The, the issues of the trees are evaluated sort of up front from the, uh, from the, um, the submittal of the project. And uh, at that, on that level, it's determined whether um, the overall alteration of the protected resource is going to be handled as a condition of the permit or can be handled separately. And that, uh, that's hammered out, you're right, over time and oftentimes would wind up in front of the commission as part of the, the project. So the whole package would go to the commission and they'd have an opportunity to look at the tree permits as well as the parent project as you refer to it. Correct. And staff along the way uh, uh, attempts to um, coordinate and minimize that impact. Um, as a function of the of the discretionary process. Thank you. Looking at also the, I guess we have the the regulations in our packet, and I have looked at a few of them that I think that if the board was interested in 
strengthening uh, the protections of the trees, we have a, a few options which I, I'd like to look at. And if you'd like, I have a copy for you too. Maybe Chris. Can yeah. But right now we allow for the tree application to accompany the parent project. It may or it may not. And, uh, and I would look at if you have the tree permit going on with a discretionary project, you're going to get a better view of the whole project. If you, if you change it from a, a may, it may accompany it to a shall accompany it. So that's, that would be my first suggestion. And uh, to me, that, that allows for the option to look at other designs and such, which you don't really have if you separate them. So I'm glad that we are allowing it on some occasions. Uh, my suggestion would be just requiring it as a matter of course. Well, Another that would be uh, certainly, a, you know, I appreciate that thought. It, the, I, 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 I uh, applaud anything that would strengthen the process. Um, we certainly do have the initial uh, ministerial level uh, that is basically you're, you're asking for a, a zone clearance over the counter at the public counter. And uh, they're, uh, they're charged with the initial evaluation, which is a public service and does not require a fund from the applicant. Uh, we don't want the, the ordinance to become so burdensome that it, is, uh, it tends to be uh, repelled, if you will. Uh, we do everything we can to make people understand why we need to evaluate it further before we actually require that. What I like about this, and this is the way the City of Thousand Oaks does it too, is that it allows you to look at the whole project with the tree permit. And then mm -hmm. if, for example, if they have them separated, the Planning Commission may be making some changes that could have prevented the trees from removal, but since they don't have it all at once, they're, they're lacking that opportunity. So that, that would be one suggestion. Also, the trees uh, right now are considered, uh, there's not one that's like more special than another in terms of the list that you have. For example, a pine tree has the same weight as an oak tree. Um, Excuse, may I? Yes. Uh, well, the ordinance has a, if you'll note, uh, and I don't know which page it is, um, the principal tree that's um, protected throughout the county is the oak and the sycamore and any um, historic or heritage tree, and that heritage tree is 90 inches in circumference or greater, which is about 28 inches in diameter, and that's measured approximately four and a half feet above grade. Um, that, uh, that excludes the overlay zones. In the overlay zones, you're correct, other species are protected. So, um, but for the majority of, of our jurisdiction, um, Principally, you're going to be dealing with the oak and the sycamore tree. Right. Looking at page 125 in the packet, you list all the other trees from ashes to pines to oaks. Those are all in the, in lumped together of equal value. And because we're um, having an actual loss of the, particularly the Quercus levata, the, the valley oak from the whole Southern California region, Indeed. Uh, that we have... Um, and in Thousand Oaks, for example, we have strengthened that uh, the protection measures for those trees. And so what uh, the other suggestion I have is to um, specify regarding oak trees. If you're going to remove more than three oak trees, you, or three or more oak trees, it kicks it up to um, the discretionary permit. You'd go to a planning commission at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what the two suggestions I have regarding oak trees are. So if four or more oak trees are requested to be filled or removed, that it go to the Planning Commission. And that certainly will put more um, oversight into the, the removal. People may not want to bother with having to go to the, through the Planning Commission, and so they'll re redesign on their own so it doesn't have to remove that. So. Yeah, that's true. Oftentimes uh, what results is it, it's an issue of finances. Uh, I mean, we if, if there is an issue of a protected tree in proximity to a building, um, a lo proposed building location, and we can avoid the removal of that tree, although the applicant wishes to have it removed, then we, we can require that they, um, they construct optional uh, um, um, methods to avoid that, uh, retaining walls and things of that nature, to avoid a severe impact to the tree, and the tree stays. 
And so to, to avoid, maybe they won't cut down as many because then it kicks into the Planning Commission or they'd have to do more expensive uh, changes to the project that the de instead they will go ahead and, and go forward with keeping the oaks there. And that's, that's to me, is the goal where you mm -hmm. can have it. And certainly if it's reasonable, the Planning Commission will find it to be reasonable and allow for their removal. And then just finally, the, the last suggestion is presently the codes have no appeal from the uh, Planning Commission to the Board of Supervisors. I don't know if that goes throughout the code book or the ordinances of the county, but I find that very unusual. I feel like if you're not happy with the Planning Commission decision, you should always have a right to go to the Board of Supervisors. And I'll ask Chris, or, you know, is, 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 do we find that other places that you can't appeal to the Board of Supervisors? Yeah, Supervisor Parks, I am not familiar with that being located elsewhere in the code, and, 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 and I don't know whether uh, County Council could comment on the genesis of that and why that appears here in this particular section or not, or perhaps Terry does, but uh, uh, that is not something we customarily see within our code. Okay. Well, the, these are the, the suggestions. Um, it strengthens the protection of oak trees um, and I think also allows for a, 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 ho a more holistic approach, if you will, when we're removing, we're allowing for permits to remove trees, have it accompany the parent project through the discretionary permit and allowing the appeal to the Board of Supervisors. And that's, that's what I would like to do. And, and I know that, you know, the, the we really need to have staff review these suggestions. Um, it was my intent to work with staff, so I was kind of surprised to see this on the agenda before we had completed, but now we have completed the full review. Thank you for, for motivating us. Uh, but I would like to move that we uh, direct staff to prepare time and cost estimates um, and any associated budgetary implications of making these changes. I'm sure it has to go through an amend, amendment to the ordinance. Uh, but I think in the long run, it's, you know, it's certainly not, it's going to be something that the county will not be paying for. It's something the applicant will, and it will serve to protect the oak trees, uh, particularly, and then other protected trees a little better than what we have now. Certainly, certainly. That other comments? Okay, for discussion, um, before we do that, send them off to do that, um, I would request that we get an opportunity to review these and see what kind of impacts um, there would be on the process, um, et cetera, because some of, um, some of the things that staff has already done has, um, there's a flexibility there to affect uh, a change in the plans, and, and in particular homeowners, et cetera. Anything else is going to be handled through the Planning Commission. You know, if you've got a developer that has a project, um, but to add the expense of having to um, go to a Planning Commission and the timing if someone's building a home or, you know, the, the granny flat, the second dwelling unit, the state laws were all made to you know, enable that to go through in a more discretionary way. So before we spend a lot of time on this, I would like time to review what kind of impacts they have on the process and the applicant um, before we make any decision that will go forward with writing the changes, which would be a code amendment and would be uh, a lengthy process and probably an, an expensive process on top of all of the other things we've got going. So um, I can't say that I'm opposed or not opposed because I don't understand the impact these changes would have and it would take me a while um, and we could do it one of two ways. Either we could look at it separately, bring it back as an agenda item sometime in September, or we could ask staff to first come back with what would these changes mean to the process and then at that time decide whether we want to move forward with actual direction to amend the codes and get the cost and all of that of amending the codes. I, I would be more comfortable doing it that way, um, just so I have a clearer sense of what it does. And, and I do expect to have staff's review of what are the implications, but I, I think that it will all get flushed out anyway. It goes to the Planning Commission when you change an ordinance, doesn't it? So it would go to the Planning Commission Absolutely. anyway and get their input with staff's report of the implications before it comes back to us. So, Well, the problem is this is a policy discussion and a policy decision. It doesn't belong with the Planning Commission. It belongs with us. How are we going to impact 
the process um, because this is this isn't implementing state law. This is this is a policy for the board to set. So before it gets out there and gets legs of its own, uh, and before we send it you know, through the planning commission process, I would like to have the policy discussion, and I can't do that until I know the impact to um, what is generally speaking in these cases small projects um, because all of the other, the big stuff is all covered already. So would you like me to amend the motion to have it come back to st from staff in September so you, we can get some look at the implications before moving forward with the ordinance? Yeah, change? that would be okay. great. That's, yeah. that's fine with me. I'll also move. Okay. Does the second accept that? Okay. Is, and everybody. I was just going to. I was just going to say this is similar to our our earlier discussion about the police. Is if we have a supervisor that's saying, just wants some time to make sure they understand what this is before we send staff off and, and so spend money. I think, we would, yeah, <laughs> we, I think we, that, that will be consistent if we do that. Okay. Great. Any opposition? Okay. Seeing none, the motion carries. So, um, I will. Leave it up to staff as to which meeting in September you can get the information together. I don't want to say the 9th if you have another project you're working on to bring to, to us, but it, but September, one of the September meetings. Madam, okay. Madam Is Chair. that doable? It would probably be later in September. Uh, well, that. But we will we will do our best. Can to you make accept that, that, Linda? Okay. And Madam Chair, I just want to be clear. So when this comes back, you'll take each one of these suggestions and offer what you what your analysis is of the impacts of this suggestion. Is that correct? We we will Great. try to do that. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Then I need a motion on the item, which is a receive and file. I'm sorry. I had one other. Oh, I'm sorry. One 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 other question. Uh, in looking at the chart on page 125. Staff had indicated this in Supervisor Park. You said they're all the same. I read the chart on 125 as saying all trees are not the same. Is that, did I did I mishear something there? Um, in this category, I guess it's in the um, in the overlay zones or not in the over, in the overlay zones. The oak tree and the pine tree and the ash tree are all considered protected trees. And oh. what I was doing was pulling out oak trees and, and giving them instead of removing six. Can we move forward? <laughs> okay, I see. In the overlay zones. Okay. Is that yeah. You're, you're yeah. talking about in the overlay zone. Mm -hmm. Because in the most of the time, our second dwelling unit permits are not going to be in overlay zones. Is that correct? Uh, the overlay zones are, are a minority of the property. So, yes, Great. I would guess right. I would. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, now you're ready? <laughs> okay, I need a motion to receive and file. I have a motion and a second. Any opposition? Seeing none. Uh, and then we'll get that back. Um, Supervisor Parks' suggestions back in whenever in September you can do it comfortably. Okay. Quit giving me things to sign. My hand hurts already. Okay. That brings us to item 62, which is a request of the Ventura County Fire Protection District for a conceptual approval to relocate Fire Station 43. Um, good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Johnston. Bob Roper, Fire Chief, Ventura County Fire Protection District. Today I'd like to bring forth a recommendation for the conceptual approval to relocate the fire station number 43 in the Santa Susana Knolls and Simi Valley. The basis for the recommendation is based on in 2001 we did a service distribution study upon which we studied where the fire stations are, where growth is going to happen, and we reviewed this with your board in January of this year at the board study session. It was based on the future growth projections, need to address aging facilities, to how to appropriate, get the appropriate response times to our service areas, and how to really maximize our tax dollar revenues to the growth projections that we're seeing. The study included census data, demographics data, the SOAR boundaries, uh, we'll get caught up here in a minute. Well, the SOAR boundaries, which are the uh, city limits of Simi Valley, 
And also we looked at the city and the county growth estimates. What we did is this is a picture of Simi Valley. Okay. Okay. This is the, the SOAR boundaries, how it reflects to the city. Next one. And these are the proposed developments that we know of and that are on the general plan uh, in Simi Valley. You can see that most of the growth that's happening in Simi Valley is in the northwest area of the valley. This is fire station number 43 where it currently sits in the Santa Susana Knolls. Rocket 9 sits back over in this area and the LA County border sits over here. We also looked at street speeds and designs, our call load activities. The brown bar uh, graph represents the number of calls that the station in Simi Valley at the Knolls um, represents is 900 calls and it goes up to 1,800 calls for the fire station over off of Church Street and LA Avenue. So we can see that we have a varying degree of uh, calls in their prime sectors. We also looked at uh, the response times in the area and how to our maximum we're trying to achieve is a five minute response time from any fire station that we have in the county. We explored options about relocating the fire station, rebuilding on site, adding another fire station, changing some of our staffing uh, options and looking at alternative service levels or partnerships. The findings indicated that the fire station was built in 1950 and at that time the Santa Susana Knowles area was the community within Simi Valley. The floor of the valley was really large ranches and was not developed. So the decision that was made in 1950 to build the fire station there was appropriate and as you can see now as we look at where the fire station is and what happened with growth. That was what's brought together this formula and this proposal. The proposal, as we looked at response times, you'll see that the current fire station is in this area. What we're looking, proposing to do is relocate it in the area of LA and Yosemite Avenue down on the valley floor. And what we did is we took our computer-aided uh, data and we ran response times. The, in the yellow, what you have is the response times of five minutes that the current fire station reaches. In the red or the orange is response times that the fire station over here can get to. And then in the blue, the other fire station in the area represents that. In the shaded green area is an area that represents about 6,000 residents that is currently outside of the five minute response time area. And this is the area that we're calling is underserved and that's part of the basis for our proposal in front of you today. One thing of accomplishing this proposal will be able to deal with facility issues, seismic uh, issues, equipment size, um, travel times and the population that's better served. I'd like to go over briefly with you some of the issues that came up at our community meetings. Back in December of 2002, we held a community meeting at the fire station where we had about 70 residents come to the meeting. And then again on February of this year, we had another meeting over at uh, the Knoll School where we had 21 people attend that. At that meeting, we took their input, we presented our ideas, and that's what's contained within your board letter and what I'm going to cover quickly with you. The fiscal impact, the question became, and for that we explained that to relocate the fire station either um, off the site or on the site, the construction cost is about $1.7 million. The difference being if we relocate it, we have to buy a piece of property. And, but we looked at the risk versus gain as far as how that will um, add to the service area and that's why the proposal is here. Next question was what is the process and when would the actual relocation take place? We explained to them that the process is holding the community meetings, raising what the questions are, coming back to your board and asking for conceptual approval. If your board was to grant that today, then we would look for real estate to serve the area that we need. If that is done, 
if we can identify funding, we would identify that, get your board to approve all the plans, but the earliest we would relocate the fire station would probably be 2006. Next question is, the fire district qualified to perform such an operational analysis regarding fire station locations? And I believe that we truly are. We could spend money on consultants, but I think the data will speak for itself from what you see in front of you. The site location was made 53 years ago was correct, and I believe that what we're proposing today is correct, basing that on growth issues, the geography of the area, the zoning issues, and so forth. I believe it is time 50 years later to really look at what growth has done and where it's going and why the decision is here. The next slide is, answers, addresses the question, would insurance rates change by this relocation? Insurance rates are based on water access, the type of construction, and the age of construction by the insurance companies. The last component of that is how far are you away from the nearest fire station, okay? And that is generally based on a five-mile rule. What we did by this map is we took and tried to study where would, are there any areas that would not be served within the five mile radius of the new location. So this map was based on the, the fire station being relocated here and you can see all the green areas by the other two fire stations and so forth. Also, this is the LA County Fire Station number 75 that also responds with us. Every area of Ventura County is served with the exception of the end of Santa Susana Fire Road and Rocketdyne, which has its own fire department. We were tried to get a representative from the insurance company here today, but we're unable to because they didn't want to make any statements in public that would reflect back on their insurance company. We were also unable to get a representative from the insurance commissioner's office due to travel restrictions with the state budget. They cited why they could not be here. The California Fair Plan does is required to write fire insurance to anybody in the state of California. Would the rates change by the relocation of this uh, fire station? And the answer we got from the uh, insurance commissioner's office is as long as it's within the five miles and we did not do anything else to affect those other factors, they could not see why. But I do not have an independent third party source here to, to verify that. The next item is, uh, which is critical in this area, are the railroad tracks. Simi Valley is the one area, if I get this work, is the one area the railroad tracks run this way and then it stops here, not that the train stop, but it goes into a tunnel. So we didn't show it go any further. On this, what we have is the current station. Do we have that other point? Okay. Where the current station is located, there is concern is if a train comes through here, would it block access getting into one side or the other? And that's a current concern whether we have whether the station's there today or whether it moves. Our call load indicators are that 84% of our calls right now are happening north of the railroad tracks. 16% of the calls are happening on the south side of the railroad tracks. There is an alternative route if the trains are blocked. Response equipment from the new station could go down LA Avenue and up Cuner around the backside of Catherine. The one thing that we found that uh, is a new technology is by the EVA Signal Corporation where they have hardware now that they can mount on the railroad cross arms on the tracks that monitor trains. Every day about 30 trains go through this area. Uh, six of them, four to six of them are freight trains. The rest are either Amtrak or Metrolink, which are short term, many second uh, blocking of the tracks. Our concern is the, the freight trains that go through there. With this new technology that's available now, we can take and have that mounted at our expense, which is about $100,000 have it mounted on the railroad cross arms and that will send the signal directly to either our dispatch center or responding equipment that there's a freight, it can identify between freight train and passenger train and then we know which crossings are blocked. If that's the case, 
instead of this station coming up and going up Christine and finding it blocked, they would initially go straight down to Cuner, around to Catherine, and around. Also, we would know which direction the train is going and so forth. So new technology addresses the, the train crossing issue now. The train crossing issue, we have not had uh, a history that we can document where we've had emergencies having an adverse impact because of the blocked railroad tracks. And so this is a legitimate concern that I also share with the residents in the area. Like I say, it's, whether the station is here or here, the residents up here should be concerned and also the residents here. Okay. What's the basis for the five-minute response time? And the five-minute response time is actually uh, technically six minutes, but what we add is one minute from the time we receive the call to the time we get dressed, get on the equipment to get going down the road. So we add that minute to the five minute. So all of our maps that we show, we deal with only actual five minute driving time. And that is based on the National Fire Protection Association, their criteria, and also the American Heart Association for emergency medical service calls. The Knowles area also has inherent problems with substandard roads and a fire station not located within this community may not be a bit, uh, familiar with the special access needs. The Knowles community is an older area of the county that probably did not have as um, modern planning conditions set forth when it was originally subdivided and uh, built on and so forth. So there are narrow roads there and access issues. But wherever the fire station is, is whether it's on the other side or south, they are responsible to be familiar with the response sector. The next question is, can't another fire station be built in the proposed area and leave the current fire station alone? It is possible, but there again, we only have so much money in our revenues coming in, and for us to build another fire station in there, we do not have that money available to us now or projected to be in the near future. For us to leave this fire station alone and say, would we need to, could we build another fire station up here? Well, if we did this, then we would also have to move this station somewhere else and then the next station over. So it causes a, a domino effect. So what we looked at is Real, due to geography, there is really no projected growth in this area other than legally existing lots. We have the Santa Monica Mountains uh, Conservancy, which this is all open space over here. We, there is no general plan proposals or anything for large-scale developments over in this area. So that's what's dictated why this is the only fire station why, for the relocation. What will happen to the existing site if the relocation is approved? And this is something that the fire district would come back to your board, propose that we would sell it on the open market, or it would be left at your discretion of your board for other general use purposes. Can you buy a house in the proposed area and work with a modified staffing plan? And that is something that we explored, is could we take something like this and just buy a residential house? And could we uh, work with the ambulance company or put a two-person rescue squad there instead? And I'll show you on the, the next slide. What we looked at here was uh, what type of calls are we having in the area? And generally, we're having in the fire, the yellow areas are the areas north of the railroad tracks. The red areas are the areas south of the railroad tracks. So what we're seeing is that we're having an adequate number of fires uh, on the north side of the railroad tracks to dictate that we need a fire response in that area. Also, we are seeing that we have a large number of EMS calls that also dictate it. So that's why we worked with AMR Ambulance to see if there would be any proposal that we could do a joint venture and something there, but it would be a duplicate of resources. So that was not uh, something that came through. Next slide is the question is, can we really show to your board and uh, uh, residents here who would get hurt and who would benefit from this area? What we looked at is now this uh, purple area is the five-minute driving time from the new proposed fire station here. 
When we do that on the computer maps, the area now in the yellow circle are the areas that are outside the five minute line. And so those are the areas that we're seeing that will have longer response time in. Yeah, but you can also see in the area that we showed in the prior slides of the, as the underserved area, now this area now connects with the other fire stations. So you're getting a vast improvement to that population base. Let's go to the next one. In meetings Chief, with some... Could you, <coughs> excuse me, Supervisor Could you go back a slide? Question. Okay. okay. So, I mean, if somebody wanted to now analyze this from, from benefits and, and uh, cost, uh, the disadvantages would be the areas in the circle and circled in the yellow. Yes. And the gains would be all of the area in the lime green. Correct. Thank you. The next slide, when I visited with several of the board members, um, I promised that I'd try to develop through our GIS. My staff went back in and I asked them how many parcels would be uh, affected on this. So what we did is we went back through and, and by the accessory records we can identify developed parcels. Now we don't know if they're houses or just a barn, but they're being taxed as the developed parcel. In the areas that were the circles that on the prior slide, we've identified 75 developed parcels that would now become outside of the five minute uh, response time area. On the flip side in the green area, we have 2,171 developed parcels in that area now that uh, would receive a better response criteria. So that is kind of the, pardon me? Response to the 75 um, developed by where the purple ends and the yellow begins here, so it would be five plus minutes. So for most of these areas, they'd be running as a six, probably, I'm estimating probably a six minute response six minutes. time from the new fire station. What are, um, what are the direct benefits of the fire district by such a move? I showed you an earlier bar chart with the one fire station that was lower on the scale of emergency activity. That's what it was before. They had 900 calls and, and this was 2000, 2001, 2002. We took the data by the new served area and we pulled those calls out and put them to where the new proposed station was. You can see that the call load for the new station would go up dramatically. And what it is is basically a better use of the resources for the reserve capacity of time that they have available. Next question is, didn't the park or ranch development recently that was recently approved require the existing fire station? And no, it was not. There was fire protection measures put into that development, but nothing specifically said that the fire station had to stay there. <coughs> The last question is, is the Knowles area is prone to wildland fires and the existing fire station is, is advantageous to its control. We went back and did a three year study of where the uh, fires have happened. This lavender color is the 2002, we only had one. The yellow was the 2001 calls and 2000 was the two blue. You can see just over three years, we had very few calls. And this, I have to also quantify this by saying in the last three years, also our brush fire response has not, we have not had an extremely high fire season. So this is only a measure of a point in time. The people of the Knowles area do live in a, a high fire hazard area and uh, everything south of the railroad tracks is prone to that hazard. In summary, the approval of this relocation proposal maximizes the efficiency and resources and tax dollars for the existing and projected growth of the Simi Valley area. This proposal capitalizes on the opportunity to provide better services at no net cost to a larger population by using the synergy created by uh, the relocation, the facility and the facility upgrade. 6,000 residents will now receive emergency response services within five minutes but I still have to identify there were those 75 developed parcels that would be outside that five minutes. While you heard from those who live near the current fire station, or you will, that they're losing services, which is possibly true for, for depending on where they live, a much larger silent population that may not be here today will benefit from the proposal. 
No one area uh, neighborhood funds a fire station. The fire district is based on a geographical response, and that's the recommendation I bring forth to you today. The issues raised here, I believe, can be mitigated via technology and operational policies, and I believe that it's the right recommendation that I bring forward to your board today. You have a letter that I uh, had the clerk distribute to you that the C city of Simi Valley, their city council, supports the proposal, and I request your board's approval, and I'm available for any questions. I do have additional maps. If you have some questions, I can go back to. But Questions? One. Yes, sir. Just um, on, on the railroad um, track issue, if the train stalls, on whichever side we're on, the other side's you know, going to have some, he's going to suffer some consequence from that. So is is uh, the analysis that since most of the calls are on the other side of the station, we would increase the increase the likelihood that the train would cause a problem if we have the equipment on the south side of the fire tracks rather than the north side of the fire tracks? Well, where the current station is located on the south side, if the train's blocking the track, they do, like I showed you, they have a back way to get around. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the type of call, we can dispatch one of the other engines. With the new uh, relocation proposal, there is no other fire station on the south side of the track other than the L.A. County Fire Station, which is kind of a long way out. So there would be only one engine that would take Using the alternative route, route which adds uh, two to th two and a half minutes to the response, depending upon where you live. Thank you. I'm sure yes, you start off, I think, by saying the fire insurance uh, companies uh, did not want to talk about the impact that this may have on fire rates. Right. Fire insurance rates. Yeah. I would think that it would have a good impact for the people where it's most con concentrated. Yeah. Well, the I believe but by the move, in other words, has a an impact should anyway on reducing fire rates. By the data they gave us is the move will not help the fire insurance rates for those people down on the valley floor mm -hmm. because they're already being served within the five miles and the infrastructure, the other components are already there. Hmm. Okay. One other quick question on the, on the train trips. Uh, how many of those train trips are freight trains that are going to be long and likely to block? How many of them are... Uh, smaller commuter trains that are less likely to. We have, this is the train schedule for the Amtrak and Metrolink, but we have roughly four to six freight trains a day. It changes a little bit, and really you have about uh, 25 or so uh, Metrolink or Amtrak, the short duration a okay. day. Thank you. Okay, further questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I will open the public comment portion and then we'll. Go back to the board in a moment. Marie Mason. My name is Marie Mason, and I'm the vice president of the Suzanne and Olds Homeowners Association, and I'm here. Marie, you can pull that down so you're more comfortable. Don't. There you go. <laughs> I'm here speaking in that capacity. I also have one more comment that's just my own. I did call the insurance broker who handles our liability insurance for our homeowners association, and she said it's definitely taken into consideration if the fire station moved. A person that knows our community and knows the fire danger in which we live, she said it would be something that they would look at. So I don't know about the commissioner, but the local person who's doing our policies, they would look at that. The position of our board is that the fire station should remodel Station 43, keeping the station in the Knowles. The fire department's position is that the majority of their calls are received from the higher density area in the Yosemite LA Avenue area. While this may be true, these are not all fire-related calls. Since the newspaper reports very few fire calls in this area, most of these calls must be for emergency situations. The Knowles, which includes Box Canyon and Lilac Lane, is located in a brush area which is a high risk for fire. A house fire in our community is usually a call for great concern. Since many of our homes are older and have hillside around them and the fire can spread quickly from home to home if not attended to very quickly. 
The fire department wants a new fire station. We do not wish to deny them one. However, we strongly believe this can be accomplished by remodeling the existing station. The issue of all calls to the Yosemite LA area can perhaps be better served by a smaller facility housing an EMT unit. The Knowles community is relying on your board to do the right thing. All homeowners deserve the protection of our fire department. However, relocating a fire station from a high-risk area to accommodate all the newly developed areas in Simi Valley sends a message that some residents are more deserving than others. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Virginia Seaton. Hi, I live on the Pass Road. And just last Thursday, the 118 freeway was closed because of a brush fire that could have crept over the hill and caused loss of homes. And less than a few weeks before, another had started in Chatsworth, but thankfully was put out before the news could air the taping of it. We need Station 43's quick response to any brush fires to prevent them from getting out of control and costing more in damages and lives than remodeling a fire station would cost. Because of brush, I have no choice but the California Fair Plan for my fire insurance. And then I must look to other companies for liability and other things like damage to the house and stuff. People in track developments can get all their house insurance needs from one company at competitive rates, so the move will not benefit more people than not moving. I would like, you to, I would like to see you keep Station 43 where it is and remodel it. I know of other stations where the firefighters lived on site in trailers during upgrades. Station 41 near the adult school was torn down and rebuilt within a block of its previous location. How was that handled? When Wood Ranch developed, you didn't tear down Station 45 at Pacific Avenue. You built number 44. And as Cam Camarillo has grown, you've added a fire station. So with all the growth that has occurred off of Yosemite, and the growth that is planned north of the freeway, maybe we should build another station and have the developers help out. That would also help out Station 46 on Tapo when growth north of ta Township occurs. We lost the station that used to be in Box Canyon in the 70s, and I hope we don't lose this one. But if you must relocate it, could you put it near LA and Cuner to address the high risk of fire in our brush-covered hills and reach people as far as Lilac Lane in an emergency. What happened to the idea of remodeling number 43 and building a smaller facility housing an EMT unit? Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, oh, Sybil Scottford. I'm sorry, Sybil. Uh, First of all, thank you for supplying some help to the road department to help take the brush off the side of our roads. Uh, our community has decided to, instead of having it sprayed, to do it by hand, but we've been limited. All of us have different projects going on, so we're still ongoing with that, but we thank you for your help. I live up in Box Canyon. I'd be one of those people in the six-mile radius, and I, God love the fire department, I mean, for you know, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have a house because we had a huge fire through there before 2000. And um, they were down in the valley uh, in Box Canyon with their hoses ready to go. And that's a very, you know, powerful image to remember. And uh, I think that Station 43 should remain where it is, obviously. And we do live in a high fire hazard area. That's why we have to use the fair plan. And so our rates would go up. The city of Simi has allowed development, so naturally they want a fire station to cover that. But the people in Box Canyon and Lilac Lane need you more because we are in the high fire hazard area. So that's an important issue. And I had heard that possibly the EMT you know, people could be moved and not the fire station because I, if I, I didn't see it addressed here that that's who most of the calls are for rather than for fires itself. Um, so I don't know if I'm accurate on that. That's just something that I'd heard. So if you can, you know, take the fire department emergency team out of this fire station, I don't know if that's possible, instead of going to another emergency uh, group, 
you know, maybe that could be done. And I know you've discussed that. So um, I just wanted to add my two cents, but it's very important that we keep the fire department in the fire hazard area. And uh, the other one on, in Chatsworth has to also service the whole Lake Manor Drive area. So they do come up in Box Canyon, but we need the Knowles Fire Station to stay where it is because they're closer to us. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one more card, Judy Corbett, but it's a statement card, not a speaker card. Did you intend to speak? Oh, that's why she did that. Okay, well, I will pass this to the board. I have no further cards, um, so I will close the public testimony portion and confine the comments to the board. Um, Chief, could I ask you to go back through your slides and, and readdress the EMT issue? This was one that I had um, requested for you to to study at length to see if we could uh, just move the emergency service to a house or a small storefront and rebuild the station. And the chief's response was. <laughs> okay. When we started running the data, like I said, the yellow represents the calls above the tracks and the red area is the calls south of the tracks. What we did is we looked at there and we have roughly 181 uh, requests for a structure fire response, fire only type of calls north of the tracks. Versus when we go over to the fire and EMS calls, these can be traffic accidents, injuries, something where the ambulance company and the fire department are both co-responded. There you can see the high preponderance of the EMS calls in the yellow north of the area. So what we were trying to find is if we had a low number of calls north of the tracks, could that dictate, and a high number of EMS calls, could that dictate just a uh, EMS response, either from the ambulance company or from the fire? And what we found was is we had enough reported type of calls uh, of the 181 north of the tracks that dictates the, re the need for a true fire response there, not just EMS. Okay. Um, one of the issues that we spoke at length about was the difficulty, not impossibility, but the difficulty of doing a teardown and a rebuild on the current property and what that would mean. Um, would you expand on that just a little further for the rest of the board members? Okay. For us to, because of the, I don't have a picture of the current okay. fire station, but it really fills up the entire it's a good lot. Thing. It's not a pretty picture. What we would have to do <laughs> to tear down the existing fire station is we would have to find another lot somewhere in the in a service area there to put mobile trailers and a temporary uh, shelter for the fire engine to relocate. We could not really rebuild on the current site and occupy it at the same time. It would require a complete raising of the facility. So uh, the cost of construction for us for the temporary relocation um, is n not that expensive, but it does disrupt our operations. Okay. Are there any other questions for the chief? Yes. One suggestion that was made that if it had to move to, if it could move closer to LA and Cuner, can you respond to that? Yeah, our our biggest problem with LA and Cuner is it's really all built and they're all residential. It's a T type of intersection, and there's block walls sheltering the residential neighborhoods and so forth. So for us to do that, uh, we would have to go in. There isn't anything really available there. We would have to go through an eminent domain into a neighborhood to try to carve out some property. There is, um, go to, let's see, no, go to number six. Um, back over at Cuner and the 118, there is some par property here. And when we ran our, our, our stats and stuff, it puts the fire station at the dead end of the area. And really what we're not going to do is get future growth over here. 
So to maximize our effectiveness and to have a response uh, time equal, it's better to put the fire station in a center of your service area. That way you can respond 360 degrees to serve a larger populace. So the LA and CUNER, um, it's possible, but it would re involve the eminent domain because there isn't any property available there. What kind of a, uh, I know there's a name for it, a response cooperative, cooperative agreement do you have with LA? County on that end for box and because the residents do have a, a valid concern in that the area the roads are extremely substandard they're small they're some of them you play havoc even getting the engine in there um, so should we should the board decide to do this conceptually we've got to feel good that there's coverage both ways if it's necessary or when it's necessary we do we do have a very good agreement with LA County Fire uh, responding out of their fire station for um, mutual aid we call down to their dispatch center whenever we get a call and they'll respond into structure fires traffic accidents emergency medical service calls for us likewise there's times that their station is unavailable we respond into their area so that and then the other backup for that end of Box Canyon is also we have agreements with LA City so that we can request them. The one thing I did hear the residents speak to is their concern being the uh, high fire uh, hazard of their area. Usually what the fire district does is when we have certain what we call burn index days which takes in factors of heat, humidity, wind conditions, and fuel moisture when we have those type of conditions we do additional staffing on specialized resources and we have not had to do it today in the current fire station area of Box Canyon and so forth because we have the fire station there but one thing I could assure them is that during fire season if we hit those burn index uh, qualifiers is that we could put a two-person brush truck up in that area where we can do augmented staffing and that would at least, it wouldn't be every day, but it would be on those hot peak fire activity days. Well, you, you currently do that in other areas, don't you? Correct. We the do. Ojai area yeah, and some of those. Yeah, we have them in different areas with arson watch programs and so forth. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Madam Chair. Yes. Could you address the, the one comment made as to um, uh, stations being built um, based on developer fees, based on develop, new developments coming online, okay. uh, and the difference with this one. Okay. Mel, go to number three. The difference being is in our service distribution study, the current fire station is in an area where there is not large development that's happened or happening. And the way the, we anticipate our growth is if there's a large development like over in this blue area is that we will be putting a new fire station right about there. And that was, we showed you in the board study session. We associate the new growth with new ad valorem tax dollars coming into the fire district. So the thought process being is developers through facility fees pays for the facility to be built the new increase in ad valorem tax dollars pays for the staffing or the services. Okay, And in this situation is we don't have those large tax dollars coming is why we, we can't see spending additional dollars to just add another station. Like I said, this station when it was built in 1950 was appropriately built there because this was the enclave of homes that they were addressing. The rest of the valley floor was the ranches. As I said, we wouldn't want to put a station at the dead end of an area, and today I would never put a station here. I'd put it somewhere it can really respond 360 degrees to maximize the, the effectiveness of that resource. Okay. Um, okay. This has been a really um, tough one for me and for the chief and for everyone else 
but I would like to uh, for the board to know and to understand the the time and the effort that the the chief and the fire district put in on this with community meetings and notifying the citizens well ahead of time, listening to the concerns, answering the concerns, um, and then notifying um, when this item was scheduled for the board. If I had uh, my 100% druthers, uh, I would have two new stations uh, because certainly the, the fire crews cannot continue for any length of time um, to work out of the current station 43. It's just not good working conditions for them and this, the station wasn't built for um, two gender teams for you know and there's a lot of equipment that wouldn't even fit in there now it's that old um, and we did we we addressed the EMS relocation and keeping the fire station but that you know that really increases the cost without increasing the service because we have um, the cost of teardown and construction plus the cost of maintaining the service while this is all happening, land lease and equipment lease and all of that. Um, and we don't gain anything in service. So I agonized over this for quite some time. Um, as the chief knows, he kept calling me and saying, well, have you made up your mind yet? <laughs> no, I have to study some more stuff. Uh, but if I put on my hat that I wear consistently, I have to say that I have come finally to the agreement with the chief that um, for overall service and still protecting the area, although they don't have the emotional comfort of looking out their back door and seeing the fire station, um, he has convinced me that, you know, service techniques, new technology, and all of the things available will keep um, the Knolls as safe as possible, response will be good, uh, and it will also increase the service to a greater number of citizens. And, and I, str I struggled with that thinking, well, the Knolls is a high fire area and it's a, you know, a different area as some of them like to refer to themselves a quirky little neighborhood. Uh, but it is a special area. However, I can't bring myself to the justification faced with what I, you know, what I have been told by the professional fire team that they can and will provide the same service to the Knowles, but also greater service to more citizens down on the valley floor. So I told the chief that, that you know, conceptually we could look at this. I don't know what's going to happen as far as trying to find property large enough. Uh, and certainly the, on Cooner, it, it just couldn't happen. There's no place. Even if it was a smart thing to do, we still couldn't do it. <laughs> Uh, and I, I remain convinced after talking to the planning department in Simi Valley and the city council members and the city managers, manager that um, there's not going to be great numbers of development um, in that area ever. And if you knew the topography, you would know why. There won't be. Uh, and their general plan build-out is almost achieved with the last two major projects in the community. So as tough as this is, um, you know, I, I have to say that I've got a great number of people to deal with and to protect, and I have to do the best by all of them that I can. I believe that the railroad uh, crossing technology, by the time all this happens, which is several years out, um, that technology should be well proven and will have come down in cost by the time we need to do it. Um, so far, the, the trains have never been a problem, uh, in, to the best of my knowledge, and I've been in Simi 20 years. Um, and so 
I would suggest that we go along with this conceptually, and I would also request that the board allow the chief and myself to work with the community in terms of um, the existing facility, land, et cetera, and is there some way that we could um, make that benefit the community. I don't know that there is. I don't know if they're willing to do a, uh, an assessment district like Ojai did uh, or um, Oakview, excuse me. Uh, but if the board would go along with our at least exploring that without an out and out, no, forget it, we're just going to go on the open market, um, I would like the ability to do that. So my motion would be to support the chief. Um, reluctantly as it is, uh, and also to allow us to um, work with possibilities for disposal of the current location. I'll yes, make sir. a comment, though. Um, it, it seems like it might. Do you have fire watch patrols? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps something like that would help out with the area that uh, where the station is now. I agree. Yeah, the, we've we've long had on and off relationships. Well, before the chief took over, um, some of the relationships with County Fire and the City of Sumi and some of the outlying areas was not real good and not real stable. But um, he's done a good job uh, keeping the community advised and appeased and making sure that at times when it's critical, we have we have the resources that we need to protect that end of the, of the county and of the valley. So um, it's never easy, and fire stations are extremely personal and very emotional. Um, but I, I firmly believe that the citizens will still be very, very well protected, and we're just going to add to the number of that. Supervisor Long? Madam Chair, just to, um, if I might, so, uh, certainly in supporting, uh, the motion, um, it's difficult because this is one of those times we have to wear a hat for the greater good, the, the regional value of making a decision and also rely on our professionals who are out there on a daily basis doing the highest level of public safety um, for the, all the citizens possible. And I, and I fully believe that the the men and women of the fire department and the, and the chief will continue to do that, that above and beyond duty to, uh, to address the needs in this community and certainly support also your desire to see what could be a reuse of the site, if anything. Um, it's one of those tough ones when, it, yes, it's in your district, but we sit as the fire board on this action, and we have to wear that, that larger hat for the entire region. So support your motion. Okay. Uh, any further comments? Supervisor Bennett. Uh, yes. Um, I'd just like to compliment um, you. Um, it is, um, I admire, um, I, ad I admire uh, leaders when they are willing to speak for the silent people that don't know what the impact is of their decision, but you uh, are representing all of those people that currently are not within the five minute limit uh, by your action today, and they're not here. They don't know about it, and you have some people here who are unhappy with your decision. You're willing to uh, still do what you think is is uh, right there. Um, you know, it reminds me of the maximum. There is never any uh, policy that is so good that there aren't some people that are hurt by it. And they just like there's, it's, it's never so bad that there aren't some people that benefit by it. And this is one of those ones where, yes, there are some people that uh, that uh, you know would would like a different result. They can still have their their fire needs certainly more than adequately met. But but that there are many many people that were outside of the five minute zone that are are going to benefit. And so but, uh, my compliments. That's uh, well, thank well you. Done. My share thank of those. But my my comment would be that the chief is going to work with you and try to mitigate some of those dis exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think so we'll be okay. Are yeah, and they and they will be um, very watched after. Um, and and like I say, this is not anything that's going to happen like tomorrow. And we have lots of opportunities to address the issues and for new technology to come along. Um, so at the end of the day, I finally had to say no. The, this is the right way to go. So if there's no, yes, ma'am? Uh, 
just that uh, the discussion obviously has brought to bear the fact that the fire district has to pay more attention to that area now um, in terms of if, if you're moving the station. And I can understand the frustration on the residents' part that, that live up there. You know, and you think that the new developments that were uh, approved down farther that are now going to be in the new service area, you know, you wonder if those developers had to put in funds to help uh, for the loss or, the, or even considered a, a, an impact, the loss of this fire station because it has to be moved. But that, that, that's just something that, you know, as, as planners, we need to look at, too, those impacts. I know up in Yerba Buena in, in Malibu, uh, residents there have gotten together and formed a fire council. Is, is that the correct term? Fire safe council. And that helps to bring in funds and um, provide for brush clearance and equipment and things. So maybe that might be something to be considered, too, as well as the fire watch. But we do need to, to put uh, greater attention to serving the needs in that area now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and as the, the chief said, you know, the, the developers pay for the buildings when they go in, and then the ad valorem tax is what supports the service. So, um, you know, if you look at it that way, as the chief said earlier, and I had to be convinced of this one, um, no one pays in an in unproportionate share of the entire service of the county. We all pay taxes. It all goes, a portion of it goes to the the, um, the fire district, and it's none of it is dedicated funds. It's to run the entire service. So um, the new residents, quite frankly, are paying their way because they're paying taxes that weren't there before. So with that said, um, it was difficult. I'm sorry I drug my feet on that one, but it wasn't easy. So with that, the motion carries. You have conceptual approval, and then you and I will work together on a couple of those fire safe council and disposal of the assets. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we have to go back to board comments, <laughs> which we never got to this morning. I think that's the last of the dedicated um, so with that, we will move back to the first part of our agenda uh, and go to board comments. Who would like to start? Okay, Supervisor Bennett. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I, um, uh, first, in case I forget, like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of um, the six people on this list. Although the signatures were more than that, it was because of a bunch of other certificates for the library thing. The, um, <laughs> Uh, and um, I would also um, point out to the board that I had a wonderful PowerPoint presentation for my board comments, but my staff person's come down three times and missed in terms of doing it. So I'll, I'll, just, get this, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll just get this said. But actually, it's, it, it, is, it is very brief. But no, I, he, he asked. Yeah, I and actually I um, told him yes. I, and, 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 and I wouldn't and, even make it. Supervisor any. Michael said, I won't even make a snide, I mean, a <laughs> remark about that, right? Uh, what, I, what I mentioned. I but, did say that. Um, I. Um, uh, but I do want the board to know uh, before we break for the six weeks, um, uh, I have put together um, what in my mind is a summary of the advantages and disadvantages of the west side and the east side site uh, for the boating center. And I will be releasing that to the public because what I'm looking for is the most complete analysis possible. I'm also going to be giving it to our staff because there are a number of questions in there that I want to have answered. Uh, I will be filing that with the clerk of the board, and it will be then in our information agenda item when you come back. Um, but uh, I think that's the most appropriate way to do it in terms of Brown Act violations. As I had some conversations with the county council, I see him nodding his head. He prefers it be that way, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, but. Uh, uh, just a few things, the, the things I was going to say on the PowerPoint. One, I have not made my mind up. Two, this is an attempt to try to comprehensively summarize all the all the um, uh, credible arguments that I've heard up to this point in time. There are some people that have made points that have not had a response made to them. I in specifically invite responses. I want, I want to have the most complete analysis possible of this uh, as it goes forward. And so I'll be asking people, I'll be asking, uh, I know we've had, I, it was very interesting while we were up here meeting and hearing mostly from opponents to the West Side site, the Harbor Commission was meeting and hearing mostly from proponents of the West Side site. 
and there's a disconnect there. I mean, both sides aren't, aren't we we're, we're didn't hear their arguments, they didn't hear the other people's arguments, and it just seems to, this is such a big decision, we need to get it out there. Uh, so I will ask particularly for the responses to be in writing, and there is one question that I'm asking everybody to answer first uh, before you answer the other questions, and that is, if for some reason we find out that the site that you support falls out, and maybe we find out it's illegal for us to put it there or whatever, it can't be done, do you support having the boating center at the site you oppose, or would you prefer to not have the boating center? In other words, if, if having the boating center at that site is so bad that you'd say we, you don't want to have it, or um, would you say, hey, having the boating center overrides whatever concerns I have about that? Uh, I think that's the, one of the fundamental questions that we are going to be addressed with as a board. So that's a, that's a question. It's a series of questions. I will be getting a report back from staff, and somehow this will all, and it'll be filed with the clerk, and I wanted to make board aware of that. Thank you very much. Okay. Supervisor Flynn? Uh, yes. Same subject. Um, I, uh, with uh, Jim Estomo, and one of the people who gave testimony here last week or the week before about the boating center in the east side versus the west side, we went out in a boat, and at the same time there were some children doing some sailing lessons and we were able to watch them and we were able to look at the west side and the wind direction and look at the east side in the wind direction so i'm going to give a report to the board on uh, what we found what the experience was and give some asking some people who have um, if you will <coughs> expert testimony to give on the issue so i'm preparing that now the other thing, if you would adjourn in memory of the list of people I have, I would appreciate it. Supervisor Park? And my two boys are, as I speak, sailing. And they're not so much uh, impacted by wind than gravity, <laughs> I think, when they <laughs> fall over. Um, this is, uh, it's nice that we have heard some good news in the harbor in terms of the fact that the evictions are no longer occurring, so I think that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, also, that the sheriff is now proposing uh, other options for keeping the East Valley Sheriff Station open, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and I also uh, thank Supervisor Bennett for providing some information on the, uh, you know, his uh, looking at all the, the considerations for the boating center. I think that will be helpful in getting that information out to as many people as possible, and maybe even with a form where they can return, it, you know, their comments. I think that will be very helpful. Um, and then finally, I would. <clears throat> ask that the board close in memory of the four people on this list. Um, one individual is Colonel Fred Sheridan. I don't know if you know of him. He's from Thousand Oaks, and he was born in uh, Dresden, Germany, and, and participated in the invasion of Normandy, Omaha Beach, the liberation of Paris, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, he served as General Omar Bradley's personal assistant. Um, he has many awards and decorations, including the Combat Infantry Badge, the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, and many more. He was a member of the Thousand Oaks Kiwanis Club, the Caneo Valley Masonic Lodge, Military Order of the World Wars, very other, various other community-oriented groups. was a big player in the um, Red, White, and Blue Balls. Wonderful um, uh, disposition, wonderfully friendly individual, and um, our whole community uh, as, uh, will miss him terribly. So close in honor of him, too. Okay. Thank you. And I will submit uh, and, and adjourn in memory to the clerk of the board, um, longtime resident of Simi Valley and a veteran of World War II. And we're kind of getting down in numbers and so they're they're pretty precious to get all of their information and their memories before before we lose them uh, and I have no further comments at this time so we will go uh, boy, back to the regular agenda we're through with everything in the first <coughs> book <laughs> yes uh-huh well we say the the best most of the time. Uh, we are now back at the Fire Protection District, item 63, contract changes. 
Task Men, Chair Members of the Board, Mr. Johnson, Bob Roper, Fire Chief. I have before you uh, a request to approve the change orders number two, three, four, and five for the contract for Century Contractors. This was the project for our administrative offices over on the Camera Airport. This project ended up getting quite involved for three, well, for two basic reasons. Number one, the architect uh, of record ended up with a partnership uh, problem where he dissolved his partnership. And then the staff was, he didn't have adequate staff. And so we had problems getting change orders, current drawings, and everything to meet a lot of the requirements of building and safety. And then also because it was an old uh, military design building, and we did not have any as-builts of the building. We ended up like any remodel project, as remodel projects cost more to do than a new project. And my, we were remiss in probably not having a larger contingency on the project because of the fact that uh, it was a remodel. When we dug into the foundation, we found that the military, it, the building had a basement in it before when they, in an incinerator, where they burned the documents from the airport, uh, Air Force. And when we dug down, we found that they did not compact any of the sand in the basement, and a lot of hidden things cropped up. The basic budget on our project was, that your, that your board approved in our budget, was $1.9 million. When we put this project out to bid, it came in at $1.324. The second closest uh, bid was $1.7 million. With the change orders that you have be that we've done already, with number one plus two through five, the price on this project comes out to 1.794, just slightly less than the second lowest bid on the project. We're still 12% under budget, and we pr the project did get done on time. And the rest of the things, I have a long list of all the complicating factors of why we had to have change orders. And I wish that I, I could have brought all of these to you in a more timely fashion. But it was quite involved working with the architect and the contractor trying to pull the project together to keep our business operations intact. Is this, yes, sir? Is this the project where the architect changed? Yes. Well. Actually, the architect stayed. The other project over in Oxnard on Latigo, that project, that project changed architects. But this one, we kept the same architect, and we just had to hand walk them through the process to bring this through. In the, as you approve the change orders, we are now that these are being approved, we are going back to the architect to seek some relief on damages for some of the uh, omissions and errors caused in the project. Okay. I'll move the recommended action. I have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Any objections? Is, is this, this the oh, last? Uh, I was just wondering, is this the last of the change orders? Yes. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Five. Thank you very much. Uh, item 64 was pulled this morning. Item 65, acceptance and approval of a grant award for from the Ventura County Children and Families First Commission. Good yes. afternoon, Madam Good Chair, afternoon. members of the board. This should be really quick for you. Um, this is for an acceptance and approval of a grant award from First Five for the Foster Parent Latin American Recruitment and Support Services, which includes um, kids and families together, support therapy training for foster parents, and actually in that, in that case, in that piece, the First Five has funded additional um, support for relative caretakers. So that kids and families serves about 400 families in a year. Um, this is a renewal of a grant that you approved last year. First five um, has this funding available for three years, but the agency needs to apply every year. The first cycle that you approved was for 15 months, and now they've awarded us the um, next year proposal. They said that They've approved it, and we ask that you accept it. The good news is that there's no cost to the county, and there's a child welfare system, mat, a very extensive match to this money, which allows us to provide more services. Okay, questions? Move the recommended action. Second, with a comment. Um, the, 
this grant is just absolutely vital to continue the efforts to try to recruit uh, foster homes. Uh, I'm, what I'm concerned is, what are we going to do if this grant ever goes away with our with our current budget crisis? Uh, but I really want to compliment staff. Uh, they're doing a great job with this recruitment, getting these kind of grants in and, and all of that. I do want to point out we still have a major hole, and that is we, we still need homes for teenagers. It's an uh, issue that's, that's becoming even more critical uh, that we don't have homes we don't have it's difficult recruiting people to become foster parents for teenagers so if anybody out in your communities can help with that problem it's a major issue for us thank you very much okay i have a motion and a second any comments i just wanted to comment that um it well the supervisor bennett has been working um, diligently on this and we are now seeing some um, numbers going up for the number of homes and i just want to give my kudos to staff and to all those that are involved because we are starting to see a, a change i think in a trend so good, yeah. that's good news <laughs> thank you we really couldn't do it without this funding and the agency is looking at how we can possibly take care of this in the future um, we're working with Casey Family Foundation on some restructuring of child welfare services and how actually we're going to provide services for children. They're one of the largest foundations that provide funding for um, the welfare department and we're hoping maybe there'll be something we can access when this cycle does end. The other interesting thing that I've heard recently is that there's a possibility maybe Supervisor Long knows but that actually First Five is looking at funding beyond the three years to five for um, some of the people they're funding for. So that would be great. But no, we can't really provide the work and services that we've done without this money. Um, as you know, we've um, stopped the crisis of a loss of 20 homes a year, which was what we were losing over the last 10 years. And in the last two years, we are gaining 18 every um, year so that's a huge shift we've really stopped the crisis but as Supervisor Bennett says there's a lot more work to do um, every home shifts the, the way children are cared for in our system so every single family makes a, makes a huge impact but our goal is that every child's in the perfect home for them and so we have a lot more work to do but thank you for your support and for accepting this Okay, thank you very much. I see no opposition. The motion carries. Item 66 is a recommendation to appoint and reappoint members with terms expired to the Ventura County In-Home Supportive Services Public Authority Advisory Committee. Move the recommended action. I have a motion and a second. Any opposition? Seeing none, the motion He's carries. Um, item 67, thank you. Uh, update from the CEO on potentially costly pending California state legislation. Ms. Sue Hughes will give the presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Michaels. Board members, Mr. Johnson, for the record, my name is Sue Hughes. I'm a legislative analyst for the County of Ventura. And before we get to this, just as an aside, someone just asked me if I'd heard anything new from the Assembly. At 6 o'clock this morning, we were nine votes short of having a budget. At noon, we're eight shorts vote of having a budget. So that's <laughs> the last news I've heard on the budget, anyway. Um, before you is a letter explaining two pieces of legislation that are moving through the legislature quite quickly that have the potential for costing the county an awful lot of money. Um, SB 440 is the piece of legislation that would overturn the Riverside decision. And that piece, it is likely that piece of legislation will be to the governor by the end of this week. Um, AB 1470 is the, that's SB 440. That's the binding arbitration okay. um, legislation. And AB 1470 is the Vargas bill that would put the wages of in-home support services employees, their wages would be decided by a voter initiative. That is another one that is swiftly moved through the legislature. And at this point right now is in the Senate Appropriations Committee. So just an idea of two bills that have moved through swiftly when the budget seems to be the item that's in the newspaper these days. And a lot of people are missing the boat on what's happening with the legislative process through the legislation that's gone through this, this first year. 
So I'm here to answer any questions. There have been letters of opposition <coughs> sent to the governor's office, to the committees, to the entire Senate floor on both of these pieces of legislation to CSAC, UCC, and our lobbyists in Sacramento. Okay. Um, are there any questions on this? Okay. Did you and SB 440 is just uh, gone, isn't it? It likely will go to the governor this week, and, and if you talk to the folks in Sacramento, they will pretty much say it's a wash in Sacramento. They expect that the governor will sign SB 440 because there will be nothing for him to lose by signing that because the anticipation is the minute the ink dries, there will be a lawsuit filed, much like there was for SB 402, the original bill that happened in 2000. So that's the expectation, and I see Mr. C shaking his head yes. Two, two leading Democrats. <laughs> okay. Um, and on the IHSS, um, whose brilliant idea was it to um, take that as a voter initiative? And, and how can they do that? I mean, isn't that still a budget issue for the, for the county board? And so here we're back doing this again. That's another one that the question has been raised whether it's constitutional to do that. So that's another one that likely has the potential to likely end up in the courts. But it's moved through rather quickly. Well, of course. The, they don't seem to pay attention in the legislature to anything that would bother us <laughs> or be expensive to us. Okay, further comments on that item? This Move is, directly. Yeah. Right okay. I have a motion. Second. Second. Yes, ma'am. Doesn't it seem like we're very ineffective at lobbying? I mean, counties in general. I guess cities must feel that way too. I just welcome. Is there something we can do about that? <laughs> oh, sorry. It's sheer Have numbers. Have this conversation before? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's sheer numbers. You know, there's 58 counties with five supervisors each, and there's 400 and some odd cities with anywhere from three to 15 council persons, and so it's. Supervisor Parks, if I could, I, I asked that same question about six months after I was here. <laughs> I, I, I did. I, 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 you I, did. I went, this is nuts. We're getting nowhere with this stuff. So we'll the, the answer is really no answer, and that is make big contributions to political Today, figures yeah. in Sacramento. Well, and most of both of these are direct county hits. They're, you know, they don't flow over at any point to the cities. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, Motion carries with no opposition. The next item is um, authorize issuance, sale, and delivery of certificates of participation by Ventura County. Good, Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Dursey. Paul Dursey from the County Executive Office. We're here today to try to uh, get your board to uh, authorize the issuance of uh, amount of about $32 million in certificates of participation and authorize the expenditures of certain monies for the bond council, underwriters, and various other uh, issuance costs. Uh, the idea of this issue is really to refinance our commercial paper. We have our commercial paper we've, we've done a couple items with. We'd like to refinance it and make it a fixed. Commercial paper is a variable rate financing. We think the rates are really good right now or we should go long-term fixed rates, so we're going to re kind of a refinance issue on uh, a couple projects, including uh, one that will be before your board in a little bit, and also the juvenile justice courthouse facility. Any move questions? The move the recommended action. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Opposition seeing none, the motion carries. Well, by the way, I'll be back in, at the, in September with the formal legal documents. That, so you'll see me again as far as the formality of the legal documents in a month or so. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Item 69, approval to accept U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration Rural Tourism Technical Assistance Planning Grant. Well, that says it all. Move the recommended action. Second. I have a so motion and a second. <laughs> Is there any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. Item 70 is authorization to apply for spousal abuser prosecution program grant funds. And I assume that at the same time, after we've voted on 70, we'll discuss 71. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Mel Chambers with the DA's office. Catherine Dugan Catherine also. Dugan. Uh, the spousal abuser is a uh, grant that we've applied for in the past, and this is just requesting the board's approval to 
go forward with it at this point. Move the recommended action. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. Item 71. First, uh, if I might confirm that all members of the board received this morning a revised letter Correct. on this. Um, let me apologize for the need to submit a revised letter, but I don't think you'll be surprised when I tell you that anything connected with funding in the state of California tends to change from day to day. And that prompted us to, uh, for the need to submit a revised letter. Uh, the special emphasis program is one that's very important to us because it is targeted at minority populations within the county. It supports two victim advocates to work with that population, make sure that they know crime victim assistance is available and how to access that service. Okay. Thank you very much. Move the recommended action. I have a motion and a second. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. Um, and just a word to send back with you in looking at these grants, um, and I haven't had an opportunity to, to speak to um, the department, but the MDIC in Simi Valley is getting ready to open, and I understand there's a discussion about the DA's office not supporting except during business hours. Uh, if you could get back to me on that and see whether we're going to have to go find grant funding or something, because yes. this is right along the line with all of the other good work we're doing. I, I'm familiar with the issue, and, and I'll make sure that you get uh, a response. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, general Services Item 72 is approval of a purchase of property on Gonzales Road. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Ruffin from the General Services Agency. Today's letter is recommending that your board approve the notice and resolution of intention to purchase the property at 2240 Gonzales Road. That will set a public hearing for September 9th, at which time your board will be asked to actually approve the purchase itself. This item goes back to a lease that was approved in December of 2002. It included an option to purchase. Staff has done an analysis about the savings that would result from purchasing it and is before you today recommending that we do so. Okay. Any questions? Move the, move, move the item. Second. I have a motion and a second. Just for discussion, um, that facility is incredible, and um, I think this is an awesome move to um, hopefully we can do the same thing in the east end, uh, but that facility and the developer on that facility, currently the landlord, soon to be the seller, uh, has really, really worked with the agency and done some special things um, because he supports the mission as well as the business interest. So um, awesome. Any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. And item 73, approval of the transfer of real property management programs and related staffing. Yes, staff is recommending that that transfer occur because it will generate some significant savings to the county. Uh, if it's approved on an annual basis, the savings are in the nature of $200,000, and approximately 139000 of that would be real realized by general fund departments. There's, an there's a number of recommendations in the letter. I won't walk you through them unless there's questions. Okay. Are there any questions on the letter, Supervisor Bennett? Not a question, just a compliment. I, I think this is this was I think this was a mistake when this was done earlier. I think this is very good. I really commend um, commend uh, you and the CEO for uh, making this change. Thank you. Yes, Supervisor Park. I, I also do commend you. It's nice to know that there aren't little fiefdoms of <laughs> I got to keep this program. The question I have is um, uh, number four under recommendations is to authorize that the rental revenues do the county general fund be transferred to the public works. Um, I don't know what kind of revenues we're talking about. I didn't see there, it in the report. I should have covered that. My mistake. There are certain properties that are owned by the general fund. Some examples would be some of the areas around uh, the railroad in Sadakoi and Piru. So the revenue from those operations, those businesses that are along those stretches, provide dollars to the county general fund. So we're thinking that those dollars should also be transferred to the general service, to, excuse me, to the public <laughs> works agency. Freudian slip. Yes. <laughs> so that they can pay for the, the general fund departments that are realizing some services from PWA. They're approximately $124,000, and we're thinking that looks like it will be enough to take care of the staff time. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. And if I might, I wanted to make sure I thank the Public Works Agency for agreeing to assume this responsibility, Ron Coons, Lane Holt, and Steve Williams. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, motion and a second. Opposition? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much.
Item 74 is <laughs> Item 74 is recommendation of Supervisor Bennett uh, to oppose SB 430 and AB 1531. Supervisor Bennett. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'll be just very brief. Uh, this, with the recall election out there, we're going to have to find $800,000 in the county's general fund somehow to pay for the recall election. If um, AB um, uh, 1531 and SB 430 go go forward. We will also have another election in the springtime that we will have to fund at another tune of $800,000. Because what they're going to do is separate the presidential election from the June from from the primary election. Uh, I think it's unconscionable that uh, while we're having this kind of severe crisis out there, while we're going to get hit with a $12 million hit alone just on VLF, that they turn around and say, oh, and spend $1.6 million in extra election costs this year. Um, I mean, we're already going to get hit for 800000 Why add another 800000 I think it's a good idea in the long run to go back to the June primary. It's not a good idea to do it in the middle of this fiscal year. We've already adopted our budget when people don't have time to move that way. It, if, if instead they've made this happen in 2008, it would make much more sense to give everybody time to budget for it, plan for it, uh, et cetera. So I would um, like to ask that we uh, direct the CEO to craft a letter that specifically highlights the cost of the county and contrast that with the crisis being visited upon the county by the state's action and ask them not to make that even more severe uh, by passing this legislation. I think this one is one that we might be able to get some legs on because it's 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 a direct, it's it's embarrassing for the, the state legislature to, to, to dump this extra cost. Talked to somebody yesterday about it. $60 million will be the cost of the state if they pass this, you know, uh, between the recall election and, and this. This doesn't make any sense at all. So I'd move that uh, we direct CEO to craft a letter for um, uh, the chair's signature or... I'll second the motion. Okay, motion. But with a comment. If you look okay. at the authors of the uh, legislation, mm -hmm. it, it appears to be a very partisan piece of legislation. The additional reason I would give for uh, not moving the presidential election is that uh, with the presidential election following on March the 2nd, it's better for me if we just keep it all there. <laughs> good so reason. That's, that's the real reason. And, okay, know, good, good reason. Just yes, early on, too, in, in when we started all this budget debacle, there was uh, discussion and, and agreement and nodding heads by the leadership up there to not, to not bring in legislative pieces that were unfunded mandates. And this is ridiculous. Exactly. It's absurd. Right. Okay. Well, motion carries, uh, mm -hmm. and we will get... Uh, Sue Hughes to deal with that one. The next item is a recommendation by Supervisor Parks, to which I have a couple of comments, but I'll let her introduce her item. Thank you. Um, this is an item to appoint the City of Thousand Oaks Council Member Claudia Bill de la Pena to the Advisory Committee of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Uh, in January, I had appointed an individual named Elise Lazar to the advisory committee. She was thrilled with the appointment, but um, because uh, the, uh, the Amundsen litigation, uh, she, because of the Amundsen litigation, she is considered to have a remote potential conflict of interest um, because she supports the Sierra Club uh, against uh, Washington Mutual and the county for the preservation of Amundsen Ranch. So she was asked to resign. Uh, she, it's an interesting um, law, but apparently if she, if, she is, if she remains on the potential agreement to purchase Amundsen Ranch, which the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy will be involved in, could be voided. <laughs> Um, it, was, it was very disappointing to her, very upsetting to uh, several people because she has a lot of supporters. She's an expert um, environmental attorney. It was very disappointing to her. Um, but she did tender her resignation with the hope that once the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy purchases Amundsen Ranch that she could be reinstated. Um, for that period of time, then, her term is a four-year term. Um, for that period of time, I am requesting that uh, Council Member Claudia Bill de la Pena be appointed. 
Claudia will join other members on the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy Advisory Committee who are also council members from their cities, including um, uh, Roseanne Micas from Moore Park, uh, Ed Corridori from Agoura Hills, uh, Leslie Devine from Calabasas, so she will be in um, good stead there. I know that um, when I uh, asked to be appointed actually to the committee, not the advisory committee, um, the previous uh, individual for that spot was uh, Mr. Berger. And Mr. Berger uh, uh, was supported, I know, by a couple of supervisors here to remain in that position. I'm, I'm glad that I have been allowed to uh, take that spot. But it's kind of the best of both worlds because uh, Mr. Berger is also um, on the Mountain and Recreation Authority. And we all meet together. We all have the same agenda, so we all can give that input. So he was basically filling two seats with one body. So I think it's the best of both worlds. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping in fairness to Elise Lazar um, that this having to tender her resignation um, that we can see in October uh, her being reinstated, Amundsen Ranch being purchased, and all being right with the world. So with that, I would move that she be, that Claudia Bilde La Pena be appointed in her stead. Second. Okay, I have um, great concern with this, and I spoke to Supervisor Parks yesterday. When we had the discussion uh, appointing Supervisor Parks to the Conservancy um, Board, at that time, I talked about how much of the new conservancy projects and land were in the 4th District, specifically in and around Simi Valley. Uh, we went back when we saw this letter and looked at the legislation, and Thousand Oaks already has an appointment to the advisory committee. Um, and uh, Moore Park is called out on the committee, but Simi Valley has no representation. The appointment, this appointment is the board's appointment. It is not the second district appointment. And so um, while I, I greatly respect, you know, the other lady who was appointed, I think we have uh, a fairness issue here. Uh, we did have a rather lengthy discussion at the time of um, the board assignments, and this board chose to um, appoint Supervisor Parks not only for this year, but for the full four years of her first term. And at that time, I made the comment that I felt it was um, unfair that uh, with all of the new projects and most of the new property in the 4th District, specifically Simi Valley area, that there wasn't representation. And we had a discussion about, well, there, you know, the the advisory committee could fulfill part of that. Uh, so what I would ask the board to do today, in all fairness, uh, is to um, not let this go through and let, um, let me look further into, because quite frankly, I didn't have time to find out if somewhere along the line the board assigned the board's appointment to the second district supervisor. And I, I can't answer that question. And so that bothers me to make a blanket statement that it's the board's assignment, but in the le legislation. Interestingly enough, when we went back, we also found that the advisory commission was supposed to expire 10 years after the formation of the conservancy. And 10 years after that, it's still going. Typical government. Typical government. Um, and I have no issue with the advisory commission. I, Committee, I, I don't have an issue with that. Um, they do good work, but I, I am, I do have great concern with the fact that um, Roseanne Mikos is the only person from the fourth district, considering how many are from, you know, the Thousand Oaks, Los Angeles area, and no one from the newest acquisition and projects area. So, you know, it is my request. I know it's uncomfortable for the board. Uh, but this is a board assignment not or a board nomination, uh, not a district supervisor's nomination. So I would request that at the very least, if we could hold this item until um, the 9th of September and give me more time to research it, 
speak with um, Supervisor Parks and with the Conservancy. Roy, Rory Skay, unfortunately, is on vacation all week, so I couldn't get to her to get any background from the Conservancy itself. Um, and so that, that's my request, is that we, at the very least, hold this, because as Supervisor Parks said, if this goes through, then um, it is her intent to return the other person for, a, for the full four years of Supervisor Parks' term, which means then there is no other discussion for, for the SME area. Uh, without going to get legislation and do all of those things. And, and I, I really hate that kind of special legislation when I believe we ought to be able to work it out. So at the very least, my request is to hold the decision for a month and let me do further research. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. uh, I think um, I remember when the issue came up first of this year, I think. Mm -hmm. and, then, and I think in order to make sure we have all the information and we – abide by your request, I think it would be fair to do it that way. Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment. Um, I have the Naval Base in my district. I'm not on the Naval Base Committee. I was told I could be an RDP 21. I'm not on that. And that's okay because some people have more expertise, more of a background in it. I feel that I have a background in environmental planning. I have an ex and, and individuals with an expertise in environmental law, I don't want to see this become controversial because I'm afraid that it might. I mean, I can see this entire audience filling up because it, it is something that is very close to the heart of a lot of individuals to see that we have strong environmentalists um, in that position. And it really is, we're talking about the good of the county. Um, these individuals, for example, are like, like Claudia Bill de la Pena, who's a city council member from Thousand Oaks, is, you know, the whole city of Thousand Oaks has come out in support of the preservation of Amundsen Ranch, and here's an opportunity at our, you know, coming up quite soon to be able to come out in, in support of that. Elise Lazar was appointed to a four-year term, and um, I hate to take something that's kind of heartbreaking to her that she had to step down and use it as an opportunity to remove her completely that, you know, and I, I think that now is not the time to sit here and say, okay, I have an opportunity now. Um, this person has to step down. I'm going to take, take that. Uh, I think it should be coming from my district. We have already made that decision, and I just hate to see that um, we would use this opportunity, and it would, I really think of it as being unjust to the individual. And as far as where it stands in the, uh, the county directory, it does mention the second district is where the, the uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy board member comes from, and it has always been. So um, this is a concern of individuals out, out in my district, certainly. It's, it's something they feel strong about. It's the platform, basically, that I ran on. Um, so I, I would just hope at the last discussion, as Supervisor Flynn had mentioned, um, we had this discussion before, and you had stated, Chair Michaels, that you were going to look at changing legislation, and that's all something we said, great, let's, let's come back and see, and that was the approach we were going to take so we can have two representatives on there. But I hate to take this, this opportunity, you know, take this unfortunate situation to this individual and use it as an opportunity. I, I think that would be very unfair. Uh, from a personal point of view. Well, you know, uh, I need to respond to the to the comments because, first of all, the thing that, that bothers me is that there is an automatic assumption that we have no bona fide, certified, heartfelt environmentalists in the 4th District. And we do have a lot. And we do have some, believe it or not, who are friends of mine and who are interested in serving because of the fact that the Whiteface area and um, Alamos Canyon areas, the Rim of the Valley Trail, all of the things that they're trying to accomplish and have worked on for years are now coming up, you know, finally getting there with these, these last couple of projects. So I think, it's, I think it's an unfair assumption to say that only the people in Thousand Oaks are certified environmentalists and they are the only ones who care about the conservancy and its, its success. Um, 
so I, I think that, that you know, it, it's somewhat of an affront to be told that I couldn't make, if I was given the opportunity, a sound recommendation to the advisory board. Um, and so, you know, it, it is countywide, but it is also conservancy business. Now, may I just mention something? It, it, you made a request. I think we ought to honor that request. The important thing is to try to uh, keep the board, I think, together through these tough times. The, it was simply a request, and we ought to satisfy that. Other comments? Yes, sir. Um, if, if I could, I appreciate the um, but number one. I'm Walked in here today and didn't know there was any controversy at all. So well, um, you can't yeah. talk to other exactly. supervisors. Exactly. Oh, no, I, I know that. So <laughs> there's nothing so, wrong in controversy. Well, yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm not, nobody's nobody's saying that. But um, the um, uh, you know, with the issues that are raised, the, the the question that I have, number one, we have a request for um, a delay. Uh, this is the third one today, right? And um, I and I and I know some, sometimes people like the request for delay, and sometimes they don't like the request for delay. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's in, unless there's a compelling reason, I have to be consistent here in terms of of the request for delay. But I don't want to imply that the request for delay means I agree with one side or the other, even uh, with this. The thing that I uh, as I'm looking at this, this person was appointed in January for better or for worse by by Supervisor Parks with the board's approval, right? Okay, all right. So, so I, I guess I'm I'm, I'm going to need some background in terms of why did that happen and what's changed now mm -hmm. for this new for this new thing. So, um, if it gives time for people to work that stuff out, uh, it gives time for for people to. For, but that's the, I would just offer for um, for both supervisors involved. That's the that's the piece of information. That's one of the significant pieces. Is we sort of we appointed somebody. They've run into a. Uh, my understanding is they've run into a temporary reason why they have to resign. Um, you know, is there is there? So what's the rationale for 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 switching that? But anyway, I'm I'm, I'm open to hearing that. Um, and uh, I would also agree that uh, we have a request for the lay third one today. I've voted for all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the support and I don't want the board to get into a big issue and as I said I don't know whether the conservancy has taken an action somewhere along the line that you know made this um, you know an appointment quite frankly um, I assumed that this was the the Thousand Oaks appointment uh, and not the board's appointment because it wasn't stated as a board appointment and so um, did did I fall asleep at the at the switch? Probably yes. You could state that, and I said that to Supervisor Parks. Shame on me for not recognizing when it came through that it was the board's appointment. Um, but that still doesn't change the fact of um, you know this is an opportunity. Uh, it's, it's no one's fault that the person ended up with a conflict of interest. That happens to all of us. But given the fact that if the appointment goes through, it would be for four years, I would just like the time to check with the Conservancy, make sure we didn't do something that made this not the board's appointment. Uh, and, and then we'll go from there in September and see, you know, what, what we need to do. But again, I say that I care as much about the Conservancy as anybody else does, and I have several very highly qualified people in the county in my end of the county who have worked very hard on several of the conservancy projects and so I think they would represent the board and everyone well and and not be obstructionist but be very very helpful and positive so okay with that I I will go ahead and ask that this agenda item be brought back for the September 9th meeting the vote uh, the next board of for the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy is September, I think, 22nd or something. So we will have time to have uh, Claudia, if she's appointed, be there in time for that meeting. Um, so I'll go ahead and put it on that. Okay, thank the you. Second of, I'll, I'll, as a second of the original motion, I agree to that. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I did want to mention, okay. we do have someone from CME, uh, from the Rancho CME uh, district there. So. 
You that, but that's the, re that's the Rancho Simi District's appointment. So, right. Okay, next item is Supervisor Long. Uh, appointment Move the recommended action. to Commission for Women. Motion second. Discussion, opposition, seeing none, motion carries. Fiscal year budget adoption for redevelopment agency of the County of Ventura, area of Piru. Move the recommended action. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any questions? Discussion, seeing none, the motion carries. Uh, item 78 is the information agenda. Move to receive and file with a change to bring item one back to uh, the board's agenda as noted this morning. Okay. Good, good memory. <laughs> wow. At the end of the day, you Second. can do that. All right. Okay. You get some uh, good government award for one. the day. <laughs> Any opposition? Seeing none, the motion carries. The board will go into closed session. In order to finish our day, uh, we will adjourn from closed session. Uh, I do not believe, as I had warned my colleagues, that we will need um, an to extend this meeting to tomorrow. I think we can finish the agenda. And I wish everyone out there, the staff, a marvelous August. And we will see you in September. <laughs>